The following programs were originally aired live, long before the advent of high fidelity. And they were recorded using a variety of means, from direct recording onto early audio tape and glass records, to simply placing the microphone of a wire recorder in front of the speakers of a radio playing the program. I hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to these, some of the all-time favorite shows. He's still after us, Matt. Well then, quick, look, look, look. Let's stuck into this old house, and uh, we'll uh, see if we can lose him in there. Good idea. I'm on the sip. Uh, shut the door. There. Hopefully, he didn't see us go in. It's kind of cold in here. Well, of course, it's an abandoned house. Do you think that they kept? The gas lit. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, let's just do this day in history. I'm stressed out. All right, April 18th. And in 1025, Blo Blossel Cherbury is crowned in Ginzi, no, becoming first king of Poland. In 1506, cornerstone of the current St. Peter's Basilica is laid in the Vatican by Pope Julius II. In 1775, Paul Revere and William Dowles ride from Charleston to Lexington, warning the regulars are coming. Not the British were coming, remember, at the time they were British. What on earth would, would people think of a couple of idiots yelling, the British are coming when they themselves are British. It was the regulars are coming, folk. In 1783... George Washington issues ge general order announcing the end of hostilities with Britain, giving thanks to the Almighty and offering congratulations at authorizing an extra ration of alcohol to the troops in s to celebrate. In 1906, San Francisco earthquake and fire kills nearly 4,000 while destroying 75% of the city. In 1909, Joan of Arc receives Identification by the Roman Catholic Church at St. Peter's Bas Basilica in the Vatican. In 1954, Egyptian Colonel Gabi Ad Ad El Nasser seizes power and appoints himself Prime Minister. In 2018 Black Panther is the first film shown at a commercial cinema in 35 years in Saudi Arabia as cinemas are reopened. In 1985, Wham! becomes the first Western pop act to release an album in China. In 1809, first run of 2000 Guinness Horror race at Newmarket, England. And that was this day in history. Now let's get on with the shows.
Who's on first? Why, it's Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Coming up next. Costello program brought to you by Camel, the cigarette that's first in the service. Camels stay fresh because they're packed to go around the world. Listen to the music of Freddie Rich and his orchestra, the songs of Connie Haynes, tonight's special guest, Bert Gordon, the mad Russian of radio, and starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Costello, <laughs> here it is, the last program of 1943, and you're late again. Now, now, where have you been? Oh, Abbott, the worst thing just happened to me. No. Yeah, Mrs. Niles gave me a dog for Christmas present, and the dog just took a great big bite out of me. Where did he bite you? Well, if I'd have been wearing a license plate, he'd have got the last three numbers. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where did this happen? Well, let me see now, where did this happen? In a crowded streetcar. It's the first time I ever gave my seat to a dog. <laughs> Look, uh, no, never mind that. What kind of a dog uh, did Mrs. Niles give you? Well, do you remember that famous dog, Strongheart? Yes, I remember Strongheart. Well, this was his brother, Weak Stomach. <laughs> Listen, I'm not talking about that. Well, what is the dog's breed? What is his breed? Yes. He breeds to his nose, like you and me. <laughs> no, 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 you dummy. What type of a dog is he? A spitz? No, but he drools a little. <laughs> Look, there are different types of dogs, such as uh, setters and pointers. That's it, Abbott. That's what he is. He's a setter pointer. A setter pointer? Yeah, he sets all day and points at the icebox. <laughs> hey, that's the dog now, Abbott. He's out in the hall. Come on, Rover. Come on, Rover. Come on in the door. I said come in the door, not through the door. <laughs> Why, Costello. Lou, this is a wonderful dog. Yeah. Listen to him. Just my luck to get a dog with asthma. Now, cut that out. I'm going to show you how to handle dogs. Come here, over. Tell me, how much is uh, one and one? Did you hear that, Costello? I, I missed it. I was here. I'll try again. Rover, how much is uh, two and two? <laughs> I told you he was a smart dog. I'm going to see if he's really smart, Abbott. Rover, what time is it? Quarter to four. <laughs> Costello, isn't that the most wonderful thing you ever heard of? A talking dog. Talking dog. Where'll I get the phone? Hello? Yes? What? Oh, you don't think so, eh? <laughs> okay, Smarty, goodbye. How do you like that, Abbott? That was a friend of mine. He doesn't think there's anything wonderful about a talking dog. Who's your friend? Oh, just a horse. <laughs> Come in and make it funny. It's costing camels a lot of money. <laughs> oh, it's Ken Niles. Well... If it isn't the spirit of 76 pounds. <laughs> oh, yeah? Look who's talking. Listen, fat boy, why don't you unbutton your vest and open up a second front? <laughs> Very funny, Skinny. Very funny. Now, Costello, Ken Niles is not skinny. Not skinny, eh? He once worked in an olive factory. He used to crawl through the olive and pull the pimento in after him. <laughs> but pay no attention to Costello, Ken. I I'm ashamed of him. He doesn't even appreciate the wonderful dog your wife gave him for Christmas. Yeah, and what's more, he didn't even thank her for it. Oh, yes, I did. I even kissed your wife on top of her head. Why didn't you kiss her on the lips? Her head is much smoother. <laughs> oh, I heard that remark, Costello. Why, I ought to give you a thrashing, you little shrimp. Me? A shrimp? Yes, you're a shrimp. You only come up to my chin. Which one? <laughs> I look old. Well, uh, don't look now, but your social security slip is showing. Costello, how can you talk like that to Mrs. Niles after the nice present she gave you for Christmas? 
when you gave her nothing. Oh, I don't know why you say nothing. Didn't I give her a picture, pu- get her picture published in the paper? Yes, but look where they put it, in the racing news. Well, ain't that the dope sheet? <laughs> oh, just look at this picture. Read what it says under it. Why don't you that? Oh, look what it says. This nag showed great promise as a three-year-old, but is now running in cheap company. <laughs> Costello, that's an insult. It most certainly is, and I'm leaving. Then take the dog Rover with you. Every time he looks at me, he bites me. Oh, that's silly. Rover hasn't got a tooth in his mouth. I know that. They're all on my leg. <laughs> you can't talk that way about Rover. Why, I love that little dog almost as much as I do Kenneth. Even more. You gave him a longer leash. <laughs> Come on, Rover. I'm taking you home. And don't even look at Mr. Costello. <laughs> Costello, leave that dog alone. He won't leave me. Split my dad. Put that last dog, Costello. Just because you don't like me, you're trying to choke poor Rover. You'll regret this. I'll drag you through every court in the land. I'll even take you to the Supreme Court. And I'll stand before the judge and tell him my story. And when the judge looks into my face, what do you think he'll say? Into a Japanese-held inlet right under enemy guns slides an American PT boat, out again on her daily routine hunt for Jap supply barges. They've got what it takes, these men of the plywood Navy, and so has their cigarettes, camels, first with men in all the services according to actual sales records. Both at home and overseas, more people want camel cigarettes. But remember, if your store is temporarily sold out, camels are worth asking for again. They've always got more flavor, the result of expert blending of costlier tobaccos. And wherever you are, wherever you send camels, they stay fresh, cool smoking and slow burning, because they're packed to go around the world. Camel's tobacco standard is the same for soldier, for civilian, anywhere in the world. C-A-M-E-L-S. Camel cigarettes, they stay fresh because they're packed to go around the world. Freddie Rich and the orchestra play an unusual arrangement of David Rose's lovely composition, Holiday for Strength. for your rest for choking that dog. Abbott, I'm telling you before now, I didn't choke the dog. He bit me! I know that, but you'll need a lawyer. Now, we've got to find a good barrister. A what? Don't you know what a barrister is? Oh, yeah. I used to slide down a barrister when I was a kid. Now, now don't be silly. A barrister is a legal expert. Uh, the greatest barrister of all times was uh, Gladstone. I suppose you never heard of Gladstone? Oh, certainly I heard of Gladstone. My uncle had Gladstones, but he had to have them cut out. Oh, <laughs> 
Uh, how can you talk nonsense when you may have to face the... Listen, will you listen to me, please? Yeah. How can you talk all this nonsense when you may have to face a lawsuit for thousands of dollars? And where do you expect to get the money? Well, what do you say? Where do you expect to get the money? You know where I expect to get the money. What do you mean? You're going to help me out. How can I help you? I'm a pauper. A pauper? Congratulations. What is it, a boy or a girl? Oh. <laughs> Never mind that. I'd still like to know where you're going to get the money. Now, Abbott, you know I got the money coming. Now, this is the end of the year. No more after this. What do you mean? You know, 365 days in a year. Well, I know that. I'm working for you, and you owe me a whole year's salary. Wait 365 a days and Wait 365 dollars. Wait a minute. You Wait a owe minute. me a dollar a day or something Just like that. Just a minute. Let's straighten this out. Pay you... me out. Pay Just me. a minute. On, you say you worked 365 days for me, and you want to be reimbursed. Look, I don't want to burst anything. <laughs> Just give me my money, 365 bucks. I'll get out. Hand over some of those Morgenthau mash notes. All right, look. <laughs> Now, don't get excited. Take it easy. Now, listen. How many hours a day did you work? Eight hours a day. And how many hours are there in a day? Look, now, Abbott, don't try to put anything over on me. There's 24 hours in a day, all but February, which has 28. You're absolutely right. There are 24 hours in a day. Uh, but by working eight hours a day, you really only work one-third of each day. Is that right? Well, uh, that's according to the way you figure it. Well, one-third of 365 is about uh, $121. So you actually only have $121 coming to you. That's the way I reckon it. You sure are reckon it. <laughs> Come on, get it up. Give me the dough. Well, you did have $121 coming to you, but... I knew there was a button it. But you didn't work Sundays, did you? No. I had to take a day off to wash my lingerie. No. Uh... <laughs> All right, there are 52 Sundays in a year. Deduct 52 from $121, which leaves $69 coming to you. You're sure of that? Positive. You see, I don't want you to cheat yourself. <laughs> now, that's mighty nice of you to look out for my interests. I might as well look out for yours. You already wrecked mine. <laughs> Come on, Abbott. Give me the money. Get up something, will you? All right, I'd be glad to give you the $69, but... Oh, hold on to your hats. Here we go again. Look, Abbott. Give me a couple of dollars. How is that? Well, you must admit you only worked a half a day on Saturdays. Isn't that right, partner? Partner. Now that I'm losing money, I'm a partner. <laughs> Look, will you give me a dollar? I'll sell... Give me a half a buck. Now, give wait a dollar. minute. Wait a minute. Just a second. Just a minute. Now, wait a minute. Where was I? You just had a toehold on my $69. Oh, yes, yes. A half a day on Saturdays. Uh, 52 Saturdays in a year. One half of 52 is uh, 26. So you will uh, deduct 26 from 69, leaving the sum of uh, $43. Sum of? Yes, yeah, sum of. If I get some of it, I'll be lucky. <laughs> Look, Abbott, give me a quarter. Will you let me have a quarter? Give me 20 cents. Well, now, wait a minute. I'm still... going out of here with something. Now, wait a minute. Just a minute. There's still a balance of $43. But... Stop button. You're getting my goat. <laughs> But you took a two weeks vacation, didn't you? Oh, that, yeah, yeah. That's 14 days. Take 14 from $43, leaving you the exact sum of uh, $29. Look, Abbott, will you give me a dime? Is that asking too much? Will you give me... Well, give I... Me a, give me anything. Listen, I'd give you the $29, but... Now I know it as good as you do. How much time did you take off for lunch? Oh, this is going to run into money. I took off one hour a day. Very well. 365 hours is equal to 15 days, I take it. You might as well take it. You've taken everything out. Go ahead. So, 15, 15 for 29, 29 leaves 14, 14 but... but... Now I know it's better than you do. Look, Abbott, give me some... Will you give me a nickel? What do you give mean? Give me four pennies. What do you mean, give me a four penny? Look, can you spare a rat biscuit? Now, listen. <laughs> Maybe you've got an odd mothball. A mothball? Look, is it asking... To... Give me a sardine. Go ahead. Mrs. Niles is going to have me in a can anyway. Just a minute. Just a minute. Let's straighten this thing out. There are 13 holidays in a year which you didn't work. And uh, as you only have $14 coming to you, we deduct the 13 from the 14, leaving you the exact sum of $1. Here you are, my dear friend, and good luck to you. Nice work, Abbott. I need money for a lawyer because Mrs. Niles is going to throw me in jail... And you're giving me only a dollar. Let's have no more words about it. One measly dollar after I worked and slave for you for a whole year. I always pay my obligations. Here's your dollar. I wouldn't mind, Abbott. I wouldn't care if it was just for me alone. I need more than a dollar. I got another mouth to feed. Now, listen. Your troubles are not my... Uh, wait a minute. You what? I have another mouth to feed. Another mouth to feed? Yeah. You never told me that. I know it. Why, you've been with me all this time, Costello, and now you tell me you have another mouth to feed? I didn't want Winchiel to hear it. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me that before? 
I was ashamed. Oh, you, you fortunate fellow. That's nothing to be ashamed of. I, I, I was only kidding about the other money. Here. Here's your $365. And to show you that my heart's in the right place, here's $50 of my own. Oh, you should be so happy. What is it? A boy or a girl? A goldfish. Get out of here! <laughs> introduces a new song destined for the top of the list. You've got to talk me into it, baby. you got to talk me into it, talk me into it, baby. A little conversation might change my no to a maybe. you got to spread it on thick like butter on bread. Results will be quick if you just use your head. I'm a baby lamb. And I love to be led by you. You got a baby, talk me to talk me into it, baby. For if it's Mendelssohn you hear, I might lend an ear, maybe. For I'm a cinch for a clinch, a blaze for a praise of love words. Now that I've told you how, talk me into it now. You got a baby talk me to talk me into it, baby. A little conversation might change my law to a maybe. You got to spread it on thick like butter on bread. Results will be quick if you just use your head. I'm a baby lamb, and I love to be led by you. You got a baby talk me to talk me into it, baby. For if it's Mendelssohn you hear, I might lend an ear, maybe. For I'm a cinch for a clinch, a blaze for a phrase. I want your love, that's all that I crave. For I've told you how, yes, I've told you how. You've got to talk me into it. Costello, Costello, where are you? Here I am, Abbott! Uh, listen, Mrs. Niles will be here any minute the place you want to arrest. But don't worry. I hired a lawyer to defend you. I got my own personal mouthpiece. You mean your wife? No, no. <laughs> when I say mouthpiece, I mean someone who argues, shoots off his mouth, and lays down the law. That's still your wife. <laughs> There's the man who took my dog, that little fat one. This is Oliver Store Cheese of the Animal Aid Society. Mr. Store Cheese, arrest that man. Very well, Mr. Costello, you're under arrest. What's that? Come with me. I won't. Oh, darn it, nobody ever wants to come along. <laughs> now, leave us face it. You either come with me or pay the usual fine of one dollar. Oh, just a dollar. Did you hear that, Abbott? I can get out of the whole thing for a dollar. Here you are, Mr. Store Cheese. I'd be glad to get a... Just a minute, minute, Costello. Paying that money would be an admission of your guilt. Shut up, Abbott. Now, wait a minute. Just a minute. I hired a lawyer for you, after I all. I can get out of this for a dollar. Just a minute. I've hired your lawyer. He's an outstanding member of the bar, a learned counselor, and an expert at jurisprudence. His very voice has been known to spellbind in a jury. I can hear him now say... How do you do? Costello? This is your attorney, Bert Gordon, the mad Russian. Gentlemen, my card. Let me read that. Bert Gordon, attorney at law, DBTC. What does a DBTC mean? Don't bend the card. <laughs> Listen, Costello. The Russian's going to give you some advice. Now, that is correct. Mr. Castoria, there are... <laughs> there are two courses in giving legal advice. Of course and because. Of course, you don't have to take my advice. And because if you do, you'll have to pay for it. Hey, yeah, but this guy ain't no lawyer. Don't say that. Duh, don't say. When I went to college, they gave me a five beta kappa key. Does it fit the hole in your head? Please, Costello. He's no college man. Mine, dear you. I'll have you understand. I went to Vassar. That's a, that's a school for girls, a girls' school. Uh, I found that out uh, one day when I was uh, uh, supporting the laundry. <laughs> now, 
I'll see you, Mr. Costello. <laughs> Get me another lawyer. That's uh, for one. Mr. Costello, I'm waiting. Are you going to pay the fine of one dollar or not? Okay, here's your dollar store, Chief. Just a minute, Mr. Gensmello. <laughs> I forbid you to pay that particular dollar. Well, he's very fortunate to get off with just a dollar after the way he insulted me. Why, when he choked my little dog, a tear ran down my cheek. Yes, ma'am, but it took one look at your face and ran right back up again. <laughs> Costello, why don't you listen to the Russian? Yes, why not? You see... From the legal point of view, if you, if you should pay this dollar, it would be absolutely perpendicular. Perpendicular? What does that mean? How dare you! <laughs> oh, this is ridiculous. Come, Mr. Store Cheese. We're taking this case to court. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Mrs. Niles. I'm going to pay the dollar. It's too late. <laughs> now, look what you did, Abbott. You and your phony lawyer. Don't be silly. The Russian's one of the greatest lawyers in the world. That is correct. In my first case, I defended Dreyfus. Dreyfus? Alfred Dreyfus of Devil's Island? No, reckless Dreyfus from Coney Island. <laughs> Say, uh, Mr. Castile. <laughs> don't, uh, don't worry about the thing when I'm here. I'm a great intellectual. My stock and trade is brains. You got a funny-looking sample case. <laughs> now, stop those remarks, Costello. Get a load of his ears. What's wrong with him? Looks like the wind is blowing from his back. <laughs> very funny. Very funny? Yes. Yeah. You think it's funny? Yes. Yeah. Didn't I see you flying over Pomona? No, it was Glendale. <laughs> what oh, happened? what happened? Shouldn't happen to our dog. Huh? <laughs> Logan, will you please take this dollar, Russian, go down to the court and settle the case? Over my dead body. Remember the words of that old saying, haste makes. Go ahead. There's more. Well, come on, Costello. Let's go down to the court and fight this case. We'll win in no time. Court of Common Pleas now in session. Case of Niles versus Costello. Mr. Gordon may question the defendant. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Can tell you. Uh, hmm. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I object! <laughs> you object! I didn't say nothing yet! <laughs> Costello, shut up! You keep out of this. Abbott, get me out of here, will you? Will you pay the dollar? Your Honor, you have heard the testimony. How can you call my client guilty? But I didn't call him guilty. Then why are you wasting my time? The court finds the defendant, Lou Costello, guilty, and the fine is one dollar or thirty days. We won't pay the fine, Costello. No, we'll appeal the case to a higher court. I got plenty of time. You just got some for me, too. Abbott, will you please give the man a dollar? Please give him a dollar. Supreme Court's now in session. First case, Niles versus Costello. The prisoner will step to the bar. <laughs> Costello, are the chains heavy? No. But would you mind holding this hundred-pound ball? <laughs> Abbott, get me out of this. Please pay that one measly dollar. Order in the court. Remember, I am justice. And I'm justice, too. Justice who? Just as good as you are. <laughs> you can't speak that way to me, young man. I've been sitting on this bench for 20 years. Oh, just naturally lazy, eh? Wait! Wait! Let me handle this case. Mr. Cantaloupe? <laughs> Please tell the judge and jury the story of your life. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. That's enough. <laughs> what a short life. Your Honor, my client would never hurt a dog. Mr. Corniello, <laughs> tell the judge about your own little dog. Okay. I once had a little dog. Did he have long, wavy hair? Uh-huh. And did he have a cold nose? Uh-huh. And did he have very big ears? Oh, yes. Papa! That is... <laughs> 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 
Your Honor, I would like... Your Honor, I would like to ask my client just one question. Request granted. Thank you. Mr. Castellanos. <laughs> Tell me something. Where were you on the night of December 23rd, 1943? I was home. You should have been with me. I had a wonderful time. <laughs> the defense rests. Alcatraz, here I come. The court has considered the new evidence in this case. Prisoner Costello, when you placed your foot in the dog's mouth, you gave him hydrophobia. After which he bit two people who died immediately. Therefore, Lou Costello, you are found guilty of murder in the second degree, and it is the sentence of this court that you shall spend the rest of your natural life on the rock pile. Abbott, please pay the dollar. <laughs> Right this way, gentlemen. Only five minutes with a prisoner. Hey, Abbott, get me out of here. Yes. Costello, Please. listen. We've got some news for you. Absolutely. I just came from the Capitol. I saw the governor. What did he say? Pay the dollar. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to tell you. Oh, now, now, don't get excited, Costello. M Mrs. Niles, what are you doing here? Well, Mrs. Storchies and I went to the governor, paid the dollar, and now everything's all straightened out. Costello, you're a free man. Gee, the only friend I got... Thanks, Mrs. Niles. Yes, Costello, we're sorry it all happened. So as a surprise, we brought a friend of yours to see you. Say hello to Mr. Costello, Rover. Rover? Ah, 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 ah. Costello! Costello, you... He bit me again! Costello, you... He bit me! Costello, you... ah. you've got your foot in the dog's mouth. You're choking, Rover, again! Costello, you're under arrest. That'll cost you a dollar. Don't pay the fine. We'll take it to the highest court. Here we go again! Let me out of here! Costello will be back in just a moment. Thanks to the Yanks of the Week. Tonight we salute First Lieutenant Thomas H. Regan of Chicago, an ordnance officer at an American air base in England. When the flying fortress exploded above his field, it scattered 16 live bombs over the countryside. When each was located, Lieutenant Regan went from one to the other, and though each might have blown him to bits, he removed the fuse from all 16 bombs, rendering them all harmless. In your honor, Lieutenant Thomas H. Regan, the makers of camels are sending to our soldiers overseas 300,000 camel cigarettes. Each of the four camel shows honors a Yank of the Week, sends 300,000 camel cigarettes overseas, a total of more than a million camels sent free each week. In this country, the traveling camel caravans have thanked audiences of more than three and a half million Yanks with free shows and free camels. Camel broadcasts go out to the United States four times a week, a short wave to our men overseas and to South America. Listen tomorrow to Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore. Saturday to Bob Hawk in Thanks to the Yanks. Monday to Blondie. And next Thursday to Abbott and Costello with their guest, Judy Canova. And now here's Abbott and Costello with a final word. Uh, thanks, Ken. We're a little late. So I'll just say good night and a happy new year to you all. <laughs> the great Abbott and Costello show next week at this same time when our guest will be Judy Canova. And remember, if you're looking for a cigarette that won't go flat no matter how many you smoke, get Camels. More flavor helps Camels hold up pack after pack. And now this is Ken Niles wishing you all a very pleasant holiday from Hollywood. More pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco in the whole world. Prince Albert's no bite treated for cool, tongue-happy smoking comfort. Crimp cut, too, to pack and burn and draw just right. More pipes smoke Prince Albert. It's the National Joy Smoke. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Look what happens when you buy three boxes of Purina Cat Chow. You get one box free. Purina Cat Chow, Chow Chow Chow. Buy three bags of Purina Cat Chow and get a coupon good for one bag free. Purina Cat Chow, Chow Chow Chow. No matter what size you buy, you can mail in proofs of purchase and get a coupon good for one free. Purina Cat Chow, Chow Chow Chow. So, buy any three Purina Cat Chow now and get one free. Chow Chow Chow. I am now.
here is a man who only wishes he could sing as well as I do. It's Bing Crosley. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Bing. Shall we get started here for Fells and Company and the General Electric light bulbs? Who's going to blast off today, you or me? Why don't you blast off? Okay, here we go. You turned the tables on me And now I'm falling for you You turned the tables on me I can't believe that it's true I always thought when you brought the lovely presents you bought Why hadn't you brought me more? But now if you'd come, I'd welcome anything from The five and ten cent store you used to call me the top You put me up on a throne You let me fall with a drop pop And now I'm out on my own But after thinking it over and over I guess I got what was coming to me Just like the sting of a bee You turned the tables on me Call me the top You put me up on a throne You let me fall with a drop Pop Now I'm out on my own But after thinking it over and over I guess I got what was coming to me Just like the sting of a bee you turned the tables on me. Oh, you hustle. Bing, it's about baseball time. Yes, I know. The sandlots are jumping with little moppets throwing <laughs> and yelling and all kinds of activity. Oh, yell that rolling in the dirt mm -hmm. and sliding into first. It's a wonder mothers ever get their children's clothes really clean. Oh, you forget, uh, Rosie. Instant Fells Naphtha. Oh, I never forget Instant Fells Naphtha. You better not. No. <laughs> it's the greatest boon for wash day since water. Instant Fells Naphtha is the saving grace for anybody who washes clothes. It has everything you need all in one package. You're so right. All you need for the cleanest laundry in the whole wide world is water, a washer, and Instant Fells Naphtha. You judge a wash by a simple rule of three. Is it clean? Check. Is it fresh? Check. Is it soft? That kind of clean laundry begins with Instant Fells Naphtha. It's pure and penetrating. Washes out every bit of dirt every single time. No tattletale gray is left to dull your laundry. For everything in your family wash, depend on pure Instant Fells Naphtha. Put Instant Fells Naphtha on your shopping list today. For a spotless reputation, you can't beat the Fells family of fine cleaning products. Instant Fells Naphtha for laundry. And don't forget Gentle Fells for dishes. It's the wrong time and the wrong place. Though your face is charming, it's the wrong face. It's not his face, but such a charming face that it's all right with me. It's the wrong song. the wrong smile it's not his smile but such a lovely smile that it's all Don't you want to forget someone 
the wrong Enjoyed your song immensely, Rosie. Did you, Ken? I'm glad you did. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a rather personal question now? Not at all. My time is yours, Ken. Well, what I want to know is, are you one of the gals who's been dabbing lipstick on parking meters? I barely have time to make up my face, let alone parking meters. <laughs> I just thought you might be one of the guilty parties. What's this all about, anyway? Well, it seems that when gals get parking tickets, that's the way they retaliate locally, I hear. Oh, ho! Revenge with lipstick, huh? Yeah. Well, all I can say is there's nothing more exasperating than a ticket for overtime parking. Well, anyway, you've never done the lipstick bit, huh, Rosemary? Oh, no, but I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Next time I get a ticket, I may lose my head. <laughs> Say, you're not with the FBI or anything now, are <laughs> no, you? Oh, nothing like that. Well, I just got to take a poll on lipstick retaliation. It's a funny thing. Nobody seems to care for parking meters, do they? That's what I'd call the understatement of the year. <laughs> Golly, I, I wonder, what is more unpopular than a parking meter? Well, just offhand, I'd say maybe a jet airport. Yeah, everybody wants to fly jet, but they don't want them to land any place. Mm -hmm. One of the many paradoxes of the jet age. We all want the sweet and none of the bitter. Speaking of bitter, I've got news that's the bitter end. <laughs> I may start carrying lipstick. You gonna decorate a parking meter? Well, I, I may be forced to. I understand that someone has invented a meter that makes everyone pay. How do you mean? Well, this gadget eliminates the free time left by a former parker. You mean they've got a gizmo that flips the parking meter back to zero the minute a car pulls out of a parking place? All ready to go, they say. Oh, gosh, no more free time on parking meters. What next? Oh, man. Well, let's cheer up anyway. It's a wonderful world, just the same. Yes, and the best things in life are free. But try to find them anymore, huh? <laughs> we must be brave. Uh, would you sing now, Rosie? Actually, I'm too dejected to sing, Ken. How about Bing? Yeah, how about Bing? Uh, would you sing, Bing? Well, I... Whew, I certainly will. Here's one that rocks pretty good, I think. Chicago, Chicago, the toddle town. Chicago, Chicago, I'll show you around. I love it, bet your bottom dollar you lose the blues in Chicago. Chicago, the town that Billy Sunday could not shut down. On State Street, that great street, I just want to say, well, they do things that they don't do on Broadway, say. They have the time, the time of their life. I saw a man, he danced with his wife in Chicago, Chicago, my hometown. Your bottom dollar, you lose the blues in Chicago. Chicago, that's the town that Billy Sunday couldn't shut down. Our State Street, such a great street. Well, I just want to say they do things in the loop that they don't do on Broadway. Say 
They have the time, the time of their life. I caught a cat who danced with his wife in Chicago. Chicago, my hometown. Buddy Cole time, instrumental interlude. What's cooking, buddy? Well, Rosie, I thought we'd do a tune that's featured in our Swing Fever long player. It's called The Hour of Parting. Oh, I know it well. Got a nice beat to it. It's not overwrought, but it goes along pretty good. I'm sure of that. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you about the, uh, uh, I want to tell you about, uh, being pleased. What do you got in that paper bag? Your lunch? No, no, it's my latest invention. Oh, golly, Bing, I didn't know you were another Thomas Edison. Well, uh, I'm not really, but I must admit Tom sort of gave me the idea. It's the Bing Crosby General Electric Do-It-Yourself Anti-Bulb Snatching Kit. Anti-Bulb Snatching Kit, huh? Yes, sir, can this little kit. If it gets in the hands of the right people, it can stamp out bulb snatching in homes all across the country. Here, let me see it, Bing. <laughs> it's a package of General Electric light bulbs. Oh, yes. Ken, you've, you've pilfered my patent. It's a four-pack of the new, smaller, brighter General Electric 100-watt bulbs. But you call it an anti-bulb snatching kit. And so it is. You just put this portable, hand-operated, air-cooled GE four-pack on your closet shelf. And then when you need a light bulb and you're tempted to snatch one from your wife's reading lamp, why, well, you just snatch it from this GE four-pack instead. Wonderful, Bing. You just sound like a boon to all mankind. Uh, when will it be on the market? Uh, confidentially, it's available right now. Oh, is that so? Mm -hmm. Where can I get one? Well, you just walk into any store that sells General Electric bulbs. You go right up to their GE bulb counter, bold as brass, and you say... Give me a four-pack of GE bulbs. Then you slip the man a dollar, he'll put them in a plain brown wrapper for you just like this, and you're in business. How am I doing, Ken? Oh, wonderful, Bing. And you might add this. Uh, don't stop at just one GE four-bulb pack. Get some 60s, 75s, and bulbs for three-way lamps, too. But just remember, you can't stamp out bulb snatching unless you buy genuine GE bulbs. It's easy to see the best bulbs are GE. <laughs> Gershwin, too. 
How about you? I love a fireside when a storm is due. I like potato chips, moonlight and motor trips. How about you? I'm mad about good books. Can't get my fill. And Mr. Crosby's looks give me a thrill. Holding hands in a movie show when all the lights are low. May not be new, but I like it. How about you? I like it. How about you? Here now is a happy song for Sunday. It's Church Bells, written by Paul Saunders. The bells rung by that eminent bell ringer from Syria, Mr. Nicholas Fatoul. I love to hear the church bells ring on Sunday. The feeling that I get is heavenly. Hear the church bells ring on Sunday, for it's the day that brings you close to me. We walk hand in hand, proud that we can share. Certain feeling in our hearts that's just beyond compare. I love to hear the church bells ring on Sunday when I'm on my way to church with you. Just beyond compare I love to hear the church bells ring on Sunday When I'm on my way to church with you got it done for today. We hit the road now? right oh, But we'll be back here same time, same station on Monday. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye now. You drive carefully, you hear? Bing Crosby and Rosemary Clooney with Buddy Cole's music were presented from Hollywood. Produced by Bill Morrow and Myrtle McKenzie. Join us again on Monday, won't you? All over the world, the word for great coffee flavor is Nescafe. We're the world's favorite brand of instant coffees. In America, Nescafe's great flavor comes two ways. We're the world's best selling two. Nescafe regular in the red label. If Nescafe can please the whole wide world. And now Nescafe decaffeinated in the green label. We can sure please you. 
Same kind of flavor. Nescafe regular, Nescafe decaffeinated. What's your pleasure? Now let's join a true legend of American comedy who also entertained troops for nearly 60 years, Bob Hope. My script. There's a sparrow in the auditorium. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob broadcasting for future civilians at the Santa Ana Separation Center, California Hope. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, here we are. Here we are at Santa Ana. In just three days, these fellas will have their discharge. A discharge. That's a little piece of paper that changes the lieutenant's name from Sir to Stinky. I'm just kidding. All the old army feuds are forgotten. Sergeants are slapping corporals in the back, and corporals are slapping PFCs in the back, and PFCs are slapping buck privates in the back, and buck privates are patting their dog tags. <laughs> right now, these fellas are interested in good jobs. I know they are. I saw a couple of guys following one down the street in Santa Ana. And one Air Force colonel got out and bought a farm. He had he'd been in action so long, every morning before the chickens started laying eggs, he called him into the chicken coop and briefed him. <laughs> I, knew these boys, I knew these boys would be glad to see me here today. I said, look, fellas, here's the kind of clothes you'll be wearing when you get out. And 50 guys re-enlisted. <laughs> I saw some of these fellas shopping for clothes in Hollywood, and they're so used to getting stuff from a supply sergeant. The clerk had to throw the suits on the floor before these guys would try them on. <laughs> One soldier had been fighting in the jungle for years, and I don't know if it affected him or not, but when the clerk handed him a tweed suit to try on, he spent three hours searching through the fuzz for snipers. <laughs> a lot of these boys went to Hollywood Park. It was a great day for racing. Dorothy Lamour, Ann Sheridan, and Lana Turner were studying their forms. 4,000 soldiers stood around them doing the same thing. <laughs> Hollywood Park, that's another type of separation and redistribution center. I invited... <laughs> I thought you'd grab that, suckers. <laughs> me too. I invited Dottie Lamour. I invited Dottie Lamour and Betty Grable to share my box with me, but they all wanted to go inside. And <laughs> my brother got arrested at the track. Somebody went through the crowd yelling, "Tickpocket, tickpocket, tickpocket!" And he stepped up and said, "What initial?" <laughs> One of the horses there was a French horse. I know he was French. Instead of lumps of sugar, they kept feeding him chocolate bars. Boys are from the Pacific, huh? <laughs> I put two dollars on one horse's nose, but he kept grabbing it and using it for Kleenex. <laughs> the horse I bet on was head and shoulders above the others, and why shouldn't he have been? The jockey was carrying him. <laughs> I, want, I won't say how old my horse was, but when the jockey climbed down, the horse said, are we going through Lexington or Concord? <laughs> Yes, sir. What a horse. He was so sway back, the jockey had to use a periscope to see where he was going. <laughs> I didn't mind when he came out of the starting gate on his knees, and I didn't mind when he looked at the judges and said, which way do they go? But when the jockey got halfway around the track and started milking him, that was too much. <laughs> it's been a long, long time, but tomorrow I'll be out of this separation center. And I just found out my girl Francie is waiting for me at the front gate. Boy, it sure is foggy out here. Oh, there she is. I'll sneak up behind her and give her a big kiss. Margie, is that you? Whoops, I thought she needed to shave. Here I am, Robert. Oh, hello, baby. Have you been sitting under the apple tree with anyone else but me? Of course not, Robert. But we had to move. The apples kept falling on our heads. <laughs> Oh, we? Oh, yes, of course, you and your sister, yes. But just think. Francie, I'll walk out of these gates tomorrow a free man. That's wonderful, Robert. Will your mother be here to meet you? No, she doesn't get out till next week. <laughs> I told her not to go to OTS. Gee, let me... 
let me look at you, Robert. You put on weight. No, I haven't. I just haven't turned in my parachute yet. <laughs> Say, Francie, close your eyes and stick your hand out. I want to put something on your finger. Okay. Oh, Robert, this is wonderful. Hmm? My dreams finally came true. Gee, I thought you'd never return my high school ring. Oh, I just wanted back this morning. <laughs> Gee, Francis, I can hardly wait till I leave this separation center and we're married. Yes, Robert, and in two or three years from now, we'll stick our heads to the bedroom door and hear soft cooing. Yes. Yeah. Then more cooing. Won't that make you happy, Robert? Yeah, I always said there's good money in pigeon raising. <laughs> Kiss me twice and kiss me once again. It's been a long... Hello, Francie. Gee, Robert, you sure have been at this separation base a long time. <laughs> yeah, if I'm here much longer, I won't have to be separated. <laughs> you won't? No, pretty soon it'll just fall apart. Robert, I've been waiting for you a long time. Well, how do you think I feel? I've been in the Army so long, my dice are round. <laughs> how about a kiss, Francie? Okay, Robert. <laughs> Gee, Robert, you are getting old, aren't you? <laughs> what makes you think I'm getting old, Francie? Well, when you kissed me 30 years ago, you didn't have to use that drift meter. <laughs> yeah, but now I gotta find out which way the wind is blowing. <laughs> Last breeze pulled my pucker inside out. <laughs> Guys, Robert. I don't see why you just don't walk out of this here separation base. Oh, can't do that. You know I'm essential. <laughs> You're essential? Yep, the commanding general likes to boil his eggs in my hot water bottle. <laughs> Besides, I can't walk out. This front gate is locked. Well, why don't you just go through that fence? And all gone. That's a good idea. There's a board out of that fence over there. I'll go through that. You said there was a board out of that fence. What happened? Doggone, it turned out to be a crack in my glasses. Gentlemen, ranking with the chaplains and the medics in the list of slightly unsung heroes of our late fracas with a correspondent who braved dangers daily to serve up names, places, and dates of the bravery of others for you along with your morning toast. And the photographers who faced death to give you pictures of the toughest action that you could look over at your leisure from the comfort of an armchair. Yes, sir? And a lot of those guys didn't make the trip back because they were more interested in facts and photos for you than they were in their own safety. With us tonight... We have a member of the 5th Air Force, a fellow we met in the Pacific two summers ago, a combat photographer, Lieutenant Ben Rays, right here. All right, fellas, and thanks, Bob. Well, Ben, it's nice to have you with us tonight. Well, I'm certainly proud to be here, Bob, on the top comedy show of the year with the world's greatest comedian. Oh, let's skip that, Ben. Why? After we rehearsed it so much? <laughs> That clears up one thing for the audience. We really do have rehearsals. <laughs> say, Ben, the last time I saw you was down in the South Pacific. We really covered those islands with that plane, didn't we, Ben? I'll say. And it was quite an experience flying with you, Bob. What do you mean? Well, not everyone flies in a plane with their parachute open. <laughs> well, it wasn't my fault. I didn't know the pilot was being personal when he yelled jerk. Wait. <laughs> you played most of the islands. Please. <laughs> When they come, pause, Ben. I'll wait, I'll wait. Ben, we 
when you get a belly, pamper it. You hear me? Don't. <laughs> Not your type. Go ahead. It's all right. <laughs> belly laugh, you know. Belly laugh, old man. You come play... in, come in. You Thank look you. great. Thank you. You played most of the islands what in the time South they Pacific pump you up today. You know. All right, I'm sorry. You played most of the islands in the South Pacific, didn't you, Bob? Uh, yes, I, uh, yeah, we played the Marianas, Carolinas, Guadalcanal, New Guinea, Mindanao, Saipan, and the George Marshall. The George Marshall? I thought they were the Marshall. Well, that's the name of my director at Paramount, Ben. I get an extra close-up if I mention him this week. <laughs> if I can get through. Well, but Ben, I've... <laughs> hey, Ben. I've talked. I've talked about myself long enough. Let's talk about you for a second. You know, I'm very... <laughs> I'm very interested in photography. In fact, recently I started collecting pictures. Yes, Bob? They told me you've been to Paris. <laughs> yes, and I did very well over there. I sold French soldiers, American postcards. <laughs> I sold French soldiers, American postcards. <laughs> That's the last chance I'll give that joke right there. <laughs> there we are. Hey, but really, I am an amateur photographer, Ben. I've taken plenty of pictures. What's your best shot? For the hard way. No, I look. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I've got some great equipment. In fact, I've got an amazing projector. Yes, I see it. But I thought you were sensitive about it. <laughs> well, it comes in handy for getting olives, olives out of martini glasses anyway. <laughs> Tell me, Ben, have you ever photographed any famous celebrities? Yes. I have a picture of Lana Turner, Hedy Lamarr, and Bing Crosby. And how about male stars? No, no kidding, Bob. <laughs> no, no kidding, Bob. I once took a photograph of Bing in a bathing suit. Crosby in a bathing suit? Yeah, what's so surprising about that? I didn't know you went in for group pictures. Ben, I hear that you'll soon be a civilian again. Is that right? That's right, Bob. Well, I'm pretty happy about getting fa out. In fact, <laughs> you're just the guy I want to talk to. I am. Yeah. Say, where do you get those cheap suits? <laughs> Are you kidding? You're kidding, of course. This outfit costs twenty-two fifty second hand. <laughs> Say, Ben, how about you and I having dinner tonight? We can hash over past experiences. That would be great, Bob. But I left my wallet at home, and I'm broke. Well, good night, Ben. It was nice talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lieutenant Van Ray. Thank you. Here comes the Lieutenant. Here at Santa Ana, the boys are being released as fast as possible. And, of course, there's an excellent employment advisor here in the camp to help them find jobs. However, a lot of phony agencies are making a racket of finding jobs for servicemen. Tonight, we show you what happens when a couple of ex-servicemen fall in the hands of a phony job broker. Hey, soldier. Hmm? Soldier, you want hmm? a job? Oh, I... I'm loaded. I know. But... I know, but do you want a job? Colonel, are you a job broker now? That's right, Hope. Just what kind of a job did you have in mind? Well, I'd like something soft. Yes, and how tall? <laughs> Just a second, Kelowna. I want you to meet my buddy. Hey, Ennis. Kelowna, this is skin. I beg pardon? I said, this is skin. Yeah, and why don't you put somebody in it? <laughs> Kelowna, your IQ keeps dropping more every day. Well, I'll get a tighter belt. <laughs> well, come on, Kelowna. We want jobs. Look in your file and see what you got. Okay, uh, here's something. 5320 Sunset Boulevard. Husband comes home early. Oops. <laughs> Wrong file. <laughs> well, I want a legitimate job, Cologne. I don't care how easy it is, but it has to be honest. Oh, well, then uh, I have just the job for you, Hope. It's a pushover. Well, that sounds better. What do I do? Well, every day at 2 o'clock, yeah. you get shot out of a cannon with a, with a mail bag between your teeth. And if you pass over Pomona, you hand it to the pilot of the plane on its way to Albuquerque. <laughs> Colonna, what happened to the last guy that had the job? They fired him, Hope, for breaking a company rule. What did he do? On the second trip, he got bored and started reading the letters. <laughs> Look, Maltese Mush, I don't think you can get me and Skinny a job at all. Come on, Skinny, I'll buy a newspaper. Yeah, let's look in the war ads, Bob. Okay. <laughs> that itchy got away again, didn't he? <laughs> Say, 
Okay, here's something. Listen to this. Young men wanted to travel. Good pay, room, and board. Let's go. Where is it? U.S. Army Reenlistment Center. What is it? <laughs> hey, the phone's over there in the booth, Bob. Okay. Hello? You're not very original, are you? <laughs> All right, hello. Whom is this speaking place? No, Colonna, you mean who? Again? Who, 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 who? Yeah, this happens every time I phone from an owl drugstore. <laughs> Good news, Hope. Good news. I got a job for you. Do you know anything about parking cars? Of course, Colonna. Well, park yours in front of the First National Bank right away and keep the motor running. <laughs> Colonna, you're not breaking into the bank, are you? Oh, of course not, Hope. I'm just sitting here having a cup of tea with a night watchman. <laughs> Too much lemon. Colonna, when you're looking for jobs, you're not supposed to pound the pavement with your head. I know, but listen, listen, Hope, I've got a job for you and Ennis. Go over to a little hotel on 99th Street. A couple of our city's loveliest girls are taking it over. Oh, boy, pretty girls. Let's go, Skin. I wonder what they look like. Brand Bob, what is it, Copina? <laughs> Imagine running a hotel. What are our rates? Five dollars a day for those years. Gosh, only five dollars a day? Well, that's all we can afford. <laughs> oh, I just love running this hotel for servicemen. It's so romantic with all these generals and colonels around. Oh, I just love to snuggle up and rest my cheek on their shoulders. Who are you kidding, Colvina? The closest you ever got to brass was the time you got your head hot in the cuspid door. <laughs> Now, what should I do? I just offered one soldier a small room, but he's afraid of claustrophobia. Well, promise you won't bite him. <laughs> oh, dear, it lucky got this hotel, Brenda. How would you like to be still living in the park? Oh, don't mention it. I think those squirrels were beginning to get a little jealous of us. <laughs> oh, they're so silly. We're bigger than they are, so naturally we could store more nuts in our cheeks. <laughs> Brenda, I hope we don't get overworked here. I'm a little worried about my health. Every time my head gets below my waist, I get dizzy. Well, Kabina, I told you time and again, you ought to stop walking that way. <laughs> hey, by the way, I'm getting hungry, ain't you? Let's put on the feed bag. Okay, Brenda, it's hanging on that nail there. <laughs> oh, 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 look, here's a customer. Oh, hello, girls. I'll have a room. Oh, here's a pen. Just sign the register. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Now let me blot it for you. Kavina, that ain't dignified. Put your hair back on your head. <laughs> Say, doesn't that bear skin rug look grand in the lobby? Yeah, that's the one I got the time we went on our hunting trip. I don't remember you shooting a bear. I didn't shoot him. Remember, I hugged him to death. <laughs> Baby, you should be ashamed of yourself hugging a poor bear to death. Oh, you should talk, Brenda. You know, that moose head on the wall didn't walk in here. <laughs> well, Skin, this looks like the place. Oh, how do you do? What can we do for you? Well, Brenda and Cabina, I knew they'd close the track, but I didn't think they'd close the stables, too. <laughs> well, how's old Hubba Blubber? Uh <laughs> Are you looking for a job, Bobsy? Well, what's the salary? We let you keep half of what you steal. <laughs> say, say, Hope, did you get the job? Oh, come in, Colonna. I want you to meet a couple of friends of mine, Brenda and Kavina. Uh -huh. Hello, Professor. Dad, we must never use the atom bomb again. <laughs> say, what do you want, Colonna? I came over to collect my commission for getting you the job, Hope. Reach for the ceiling. This is a stick-up. A stick-up? So this is how you play your hand, huh? Yes, this is how I play my hand, Hope. Now open the cash register and start dealing. Fine. Now, nobody move for six hours. Why do you want anyone to move for six hours, Colonna? I'm making my getaway on the Santa Ana bus. Oh, Bobby! Bobby, follow him. Don't let him I'll take our money. I'll He's going up the stairs to the roof. Okay. All right, Colonna, we got the trap. You can't get off this roof. That's what you think, Hope. I'm going to jump over to the roof of that building across the street. You'll get killed, Colonna. It's a wide street. You can't jump that far. Oh, no. Here I go. 
That telephone wire was there. <laughs> Thanks. The memory of veterans of the air who made freedom their affair, who proved to all our creed can't fall when placed within your care. And we thank you so much. And thank the memory to each and every guy. Who helped our planes to fly Each one of you a victory crew That kept our flag on high And thank you so much A thanks to General A. Easterbrook Major Morris Abram Major Merrill Fiat And all you men for a swell time here tonight We're in a hurry so good night Thanks very much You've discovered electricity. No, something really shocking. Look, carefree sugarless gum here. Trident here. Both cost the same, yet carefree gives you 32% more gum by weight than Trident. And carefree's taste electrifying. Then the electricity. I'll think about it in Washington, A.C. That's Washington, D.C. Get more gum with carefree. Now in bubble gum, too. More gum. Carefree sugarless gum. True Crime Stories of the 1940s and 1950s are up next with Jack Webb's Dragnet. The story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> Detective Sergeant, you're assigned to missing persons detail. A 10-year-old boy disappears from his home in a remote section of the city. Two nights and two days pass. There's not a trace of the boy. Your job, find him. Friends, compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. You'll find a world of difference. Yes, in Fatima... The difference is quality. Quality of tobaccos. The finest domestic and Turkish varieties. Extra mild. Superbly blended. To give you a much different, much better flavor and aroma. Quality of manufacture. Smooth, round, perfect cigarettes. Rolled in the finest paper money can buy. Manufactured in the newest and most modern of all cigarette factories. Quality. Even to the appearance of the bright, clean, gold and yellow package. Carefully wrapped and sealed to bring you Fatima's rich, fresh, extra mild flavor. So compare Fatima yourself today. You'll find Fatima's now cost the same as other long cigarettes. But your first puff will tell you... Ah, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. By Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. Wednesday, August 4th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Inspector Bowling. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 2.25 p.m. when we got to Bowers Avenue, number 1218. Yes. Police officers, ma'am, we'd like to see Mr. Sherman. Oh, certainly. Officers, won't you come in? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Mrs. Keller from next door. I saw you around here yesterday. Yes, ma'am. Came over this morning to look after poor Mr. Sherman. Yes, ma'am. Well, how's he feeling today? Not too well. Fixed him some nice chicken broth for lunch, and then I helped him in his wheelchair and took him out in the backyard out in the sun. Good hot sun. It's wonderful for his legs. He has arthritis, you know. Yes, so we understand. wonder if we could talk to him, Miss Keller. Well, yes, I guess you have to. He's still out in the back sleeping in his chair last time I looked. 
seems a shame to disturb him. Well, he called us at the office, said he wanted to see us as soon as we could make it out here. Was it about his grandson, Jimmy? They found him yet? No, ma'am. Searching parties calming the area. There's still no trace of the boy. Did any of the other officers who were out here covering the neighborhood talk to you, Miss Keller? Oh, yes. There was uh, Mr. Lorman, Detective Lorman. Yes, ma'am. I told him everything I knew about Jimmy's disappearance. It was right after dinner hour on Monday, about 6.30, last time I saw Jimmy. I see. I came out the side door to empty the garbage, and I saw Jimmy hiking up the side of the hill there. Just in back of the house, all by himself. Nice boy. As far as you know, Mrs. Keller, Jimmy is Mr. Sherman's only living relative. That's right. His only relative, his only grandchild. Mm -hmm. Jimmy's mother and father were killed in an auto wreck. That was three or four years ago. Sherman's had a terrible lot of tragedy. Jimmy and his grandfather, they're the only ones left. You can't think of any reason why the boy would want to leave his grandfather, can you? None at all. Mr. Sherman's a wonderful man. Jimmy loved him. I knew that. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Keller! Mrs. Keller! Oh, that's Mr. Sherman. He's awake. We can go through the house out the back. Here. All right, ma'am. This way. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Visitors for you, Mr. Sherman. How are you feeling? All right, I suppose. Hello, Sergeant. How are you, Mr. Sherman? What about the boy? Have you found him yet? Well, nothing yet, Mr. Sherman. We've added more men to the searching party. We're doing everything we can. Gone two nights and two days. Tell me the truth, Sergeant. What's happened to the boy? Well, right now, we don't know any more about it than you do, sir, but that's no reason to give up hope. You told us yourself yesterday that Jimmy's been missing once before. It turned out all right that time. He wasn't gone for two nights and two days. Maybe you'll just say I'm old and I've got funny ideas, but I got a feeling, Sergeant, something's happened to Jimmy. Something's happened, and I can't do anything about it. You just put those thoughts out of your head, Mr. Chairman. They're going to find Jimmy, and it's going to be all right. Why don't you pull up those lawn chairs there, Sergeant? All right. I'm going to go in the house and fix some cold lemonade for you, man. Well, thank you, ma'am. We got your phone message at the office, Mr. Sherman. Anything special you wanted to talk to us about? Yes, there was something. When you were talking to me yesterday... Yes, sir. I told you that Jimmy had on a brown jacket when he disappeared Monday night. Yeah. I was wrong, Sergeant. We found the jacket in his room. All he was wearing was a pair of blue jeans and this white sweatshirt. Do you think that might help any? Yes, sir, it might. We'll send out a supplementary description of his clothes. We'll see that everybody's notified. Just wish I could be out there with the searching party. Arthritis is pretty bad today. Caught me at a terrible time. Don't know what I'd do if anything happened to the boy. I know we've asked you this before, Mr. Sherman, but can you think of any reason at all why your grandson would want to leave home? No, sir, no reason at all. Those two collie pups over there in the pen. Jimmy just bought them last week with his own money. Saved up to get them. I see. The boy's crazy about dogs. That's why I say he just wouldn't pick up and leave everything. The boy and me got along fine. No reason for it, Sergeant. Something's happened to the boy. I just got a feeling. Officer? Yes, ma'am? Uh, telephone call for either one of you. I get it, Ben. I'll be right back. You're yeah, right. The man said it was your office calling. Thank you, Miss Keller. Where's the uh, phone? Telephone's straight back there in the hall. Thank you very much. Friday talking. Oh, did they find something? Yeah, in the Elysian Park area by the upper reservoir. Uh huh. Found a pair of kids' trousers right by the edge of the water. What kind of trousers? Blue jeans, nothing in the pockets. They'll start dragging for a body as soon as they get the equipment. Check it out with a grandfather, huh? See if the boy was in the habit of hiking up there around the reservoir. Right. We'll call in just before we leave here. Right, Joe. Right, bye. Sergeant, just caught it for you. Nice and cold. Thank you, ma'am. What was it, Sergeant? Something about the boy? Well, nothing definite, no, sir. Just a report on the search party. They're still up in the Elysian Park area. Oh, I see. Did your grandson, Jimmy, do much hiking in that neighborhood up there, Mr. Sherman? Yes, I think he did. Likes to hike up there around the reservoir. Why? The name on the 316 report, Missing Juvenile, read... 
James Philip Sherman, WMA, 10 years old. He lived with his 68-year-old grandfather, Oscar Sherman, in a small cottage in a sparsely populated section of the city. Shortly after 6 p.m. on Monday, the boy went outside to play. When darkness fell and he failed to return home, his crippled grandfather went out to look for him. Half an hour later, the neighbors joined in in the search. No sign of the boy. At 10 p.m., Juvenile Bureau was notified, and throughout the night, squads of men on foot and cruiser cars canvassed the area. A local broadcast and an all-points bulletin was gotten out on the boy. Neither the grandfather or the neighbors could find any reason for his disappearance. After almost 48 hours of continuous searching, the only lead we had was the pair of trousers found on the edge of the upper reservoir in Elysian Park. They were shown to the grandfather, but he failed to give positive identification. Dragging operations at the reservoir began immediately. Meantime, Ben and I, together with Lorman and Lopez from Homicide, checked out every possible lead on the missing youngster. One of the tips came from a Frank Grady, an unemployed carpenter who lived five blocks from the Sherman home. I don't know how much this may be worth to you, Sergeant. I don't want to get anybody into trouble, but I figured this is a pretty important thing. Well, what is it you want to tell us, Mr. Grady? Well, as I say, I don't want to get anybody in any trouble, but... Have you checked over everybody in this neighborhood? I think we've talked just about everybody in the area, don't you, Joe? Well, either us or the man from Homicide. Why do you ask, Grady? Well, there's a guy who's down the street there, right down the corner from this house. Old guy by the name of Gilby. Well, what about him? As I say, I don't want to cause any trouble, but maybe you ought to double-check him. One thing, he's an ex-convict, I know that. Another thing, he hates everybody in the neighborhood. Hates the kids, too. Wouldn't be surprised if he was your man. What do you say there, Grady? Does he have any special reason for disliking the Sherman boy? Oh, man, Gilby wouldn't need a reason. A real queer one. Say, I got a couple cans of cold beer in the icebox, and I fix you fellas up. No, well, well, thank you. Thank you. Just the same. What makes you think this Gilby had anything to do with the boy's disappearance, Mr. Grady? Well, number one, I saw old man Gilby out walking Monday night when the Sherman kid disappeared. Yeah? So I'm walking along the road up there. The same one that goes up by the reservoir. And I watched him. It was dark by the time he got back to his house. I'd check on him again if I were you. As far as you know, has Gilby ever been in trouble for bothering the kids in the neighborhood? Well, oh, Sergeant, he bothers everybody in the neighborhood. Real queer, lives by himself, always complaining about something. Frankly, I think he's your man. I think he took that kid and he did something to him. Well, do you have anything at all to back up your opinion? You dig around, you'll find something on him. There's no good and I'll bet on it. I've had a couple of run-ins with him myself. He just isn't any good, that's all. Well, all right, Grady. Thanks for the tip. We'll be sure and double-check on the man. You won't tell him where you got the tip, though, huh? Like I say, I've had run-ins with him before. It might cause trouble. No, he won't know where we got it. Thanks again. Okay, Sergeant. It's a pretty important thing. I didn't want to make anybody look bad, but the old man's just no good. Now, you understand that, don't you? Sure, Grady. We understand. <laughs> As a matter of routine, we double-checked on Grady's neighbor, uh, Mr. Harold Gilby. We found out that he had no jail record and that he had been at work on Monday from 3 to 11 p.m. He could have had no direct connection with the Sherman boy's disappearance, no more than Grady himself could have had. The so-called tip he'd offered us was like a hundred other phony leads in a hundred other cases. Spiteful, small-minded neighbors trying to use a tragic situation to work out their jealousies and prejudice on somebody that they didn't get along with in the neighborhood. The search continued. So did the hot weather. Friday, August 6th, no sign of the missing boy. The temperature climbed into the mid-90s. Dragging operations at the reservoir went on. Saturday, August 7th, more legwork, more hot weather. By noontime, Ben and I had run down the last lead we had on 10-year-old Jimmy Sherman. Went nowhere. 1 p.m., we headed back for the office to check with Inspector Bowling. These are the days when I wish I had a little swimming pool in my backyard. It would be nice to go home to. Yeah, well, save your money. No, it doesn't cost some money. No, I read in a magazine where a fella built his own pool for $95.37. It can't be much of a pool, can it? Oh, yeah, it's good size. Of course, he did all his own labor. Had all his friends in to help out. Well, he must have had a lot of friends, didn't he? Yeah, he did after he finished the pool. Friday, Ben. Hi. Oh, hi, Skipper. How'd you two make out? Anything? No, no luck at all. It makes it unanimous. Did you hear about the old man, the boy's grandfather? No, what happened? I guess the strain got too much for him. He collapsed. They're moving him to a hospital. Oh, that's too bad. Right. 
Our men still up there dragging that reservoir? Finished this morning. Nothing. Well, how about the search party? Nothing there either, I suppose. No, not a trace of the boy. It's a blind alley all the way around. How about the APB, the radiogram? Had three replies so far. None of them panned out. Mm -hmm. You want to grab it? Juvenile Bureau of Bowling. Yeah, Fred. Mm-hmm. No good, huh? Yeah, all right. Check you later. I heard it once. I heard it 50 times. No trace of the boy. You got me, Skipper. Something real weird about the whole thing. Well, now, look. We know he didn't just disappear into thin air. Kid's gone. There's a good reason for it. There's got to be an answer somewhere. That's right. You'll find it. Another week passed, and then a month, two months. We were no farther along than the day we started on the case. In November, we had a teletype from Chief Earl Eau Claire of the Phoenix, Arizona Police Department. Reportedly, the Sherman boy had been seen in Phoenix. It was another false alarm. The Christmas holidays wore on into a new year. February came and went, then March and April. Tuesday, May 3rd, 1.40 p.m., Ben and I got a call to check in with Inspector Bowling. This telegram just came in from Dayton, Ohio. Have a look. Thank you. Let's see, Joe. What is it? Jimmy Sherman. They found him. Nine months had gone by, almost to the day, since the Sherman boy had disappeared. The grandfather was contacted immediately. When he was told his grandson had been found and that he was safe, the old man was unable to answer. He broke down and wept. In our communications with the Dayton, Ohio police, they told us that the boy had been found wandering along a highway just outside that city and that he'd appeared to be in a kind of a dazed condition. The boy told the Dayton officers that he'd been kidnapped a short distance from his home in Los Angeles by a man in a blue sedan. He gave them detailed descriptions of both the man and the car. He told them that for the past nine months, the man had held him prisoner, driving from state to state, never letting the boy out of his sight. He said the kidnapper told him on several occasions that he was holding him for ransom and that he was waiting to get money from his grandfather. On May 8th, the youngster was returned to Los Angeles and reunited with his grandfather. On May 10th, we got a call from the grandfather that he wanted to talk to us. Ben and I drove out to see him. Come right in, officers. Glad to see you. How are you, sir? Hi, Mr. Sherman. Sorry to cause you all this trouble chasing you out here like this. Not at all, sir. What is it that you want to see us about? Well... I'm not really sure about it, Sergeant. That's the whole thing of it. I don't know if it's me or what it is. Well, what's bothering you, Mr. Sherman? It's the boy, Jimmy. I don't know what to think. Well, how do you mean, sir? He's all right, isn't he? We saw him as we drove up playing out in the backyard, and the doctor checked him over. No, it's, it's not that. The boy's healthy enough. Nothing wrong with him. Well, then what is it, sir? Maybe it sounds a little weird to you, but I'm just not sure. You're not sure of what? That boy out there, Sergeant. I'm not sure he's really my grandson. You are in the communications division of a Metropolitan Police Department, the teletype room. Forty-three LOS five twenty-nine fifty-one, twelve o three p.m. APB WMA one fifty five foot six dark hair dark eyes, wearing gray suit no hat. Suspect is wearing glasses. Heavy build twenty-two years. Suspect is armed with blue steel revolver. Any information forward. You have just heard a teletype description of a suspect. This information will apply to many, but careful screening will eliminate all but one. You'll find the same is true when you examine king-size cigarettes. Careful screening will eliminate all but Fatima. Compare Fatima. Fatimas are the same length as any other king-size cigarettes, 85 millimeters. Fatima has the same circumference, one and one sixty-fourth inches around. And Fatima filters the smoke exactly the same long distance as other king-size cigarettes. But in Fatima, the difference is quality. Fatima gives you extra mildness. A much different, much better flavor and aroma. You get all the advantages of extra length, plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. So compare Fatima yourself. Your first puff will tell you... Ah, oh, that's different. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. 
Best of all, long cigarettes. Tuesday, May 10th, 2 p.m., when the aging grandfather, Oscar Sherman, told us that he wasn't sure whether the recovered boy was really his grandson, Ben and I didn't know what to think. Our first reaction was that the shock of recovering the boy after he'd almost been given up for lost had been too much for the old man. Mr. Sherman admitted that there was no physical difference in the boy as far as he could see, but he still insisted that there was something wrong, that the boy seemed different somehow. To satisfy the grandfather, Ben and I talked to the boy, but he failed to give us any reason to believe that he was not Jimmy Sherman. We checked with the boy's friends, all the people in the neighborhood who'd known Jimmy over a period of years. They confirmed our opinion. A few thought that the youngster had changed a little, but no one had any serious doubts about it. The boy was really Jimmy Sherman. So the matter was dropped. Thursday, May 12th, Ben and I had lunch, and then we checked back in at the office. Joe, want to grab that? Yeah, I'll get it. Juvenile Bureau, Friday. Sergeant, this is Mr. Sherman talking. Yes, sir. Mr. Sherman? Yes, sir, how are you? I want you to come out and take this boy, Sergeant. He's not my grandson. I'm sure of it. Well, how do you mean, sir? This boy's got a scar on his side. He's had his appendix on. Yes, sir? My grandson never had an operation in his life. Before we left the office, Ben and I briefed Inspector Bowling on the phone call from the grandfather, then we drove back to the Sherman house. While Oscar Sherman didn't claim that he knew his grandson's complete medical history, he was certain that the boy had not had his appendix out and that he had not had an operation. He told us that his neighbor, Mrs. Keller, could substantiate that, that she had known Jimmy since he was a baby. We put in a call to the Sherman's family doctor. He wasn't in. We left a message, and then we went next door to see Mrs. Keller. We found her in the kitchen washing dishes. I just got a couple more to rent. Can you wait a minute? Yes, go right Of course you can. No, to tell you the truth, Sergeant, I just don't know what to think about Mr. Sherman. Maybe the whole thing was too much for him. His mind's going back on Well, to your knowledge, Mrs. Keller, was the boy ever operated on? No, not as far as I know. But it's possible he did have an operation. I didn't hear about it. And Sergeant, as far as I'm concerned, that boy's Jimmy Sherman. I don't know what his grandfather's up to with all that silly talk. Well, if it's not really the boy, we won't have too much trouble finding the truth. There's no question in my mind. Of course it's Jimmy. Why... When he was over here the other day, he talked about the party I gave for him one Halloween. He even remembered the children who were there. Mm -hmm. Are the other neighbors as sure about the boy as you are? Just about. Miss Foster down the street, Jimmy was in to see her yesterday. He talked about some changes she'd made in her living room, asked her about some relatives she has living out of town. Mm -hmm. Come to think about it, Jimmy even remarked on that new trailer rose I planted out in front. Besides, it's the boys' dogs. Why, they knew that youngster the minute he set foot in the yard. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Keller. If we have any more questions, we'll contact Zetter. All, right? all right, Sergeant. Couldn't fix you a cup of coffee, could I? Oh, oh no, you. thank you, Mr. Take the time now. Poor old Mr. Sherman. I don't know what to make of it. He's so mixed up. Yes, ma'am. So are we. We left the neighbor, Mrs. Keller, and went back next door to the Sherman house. The grandfather told us that the family doctor hadn't returned our call yet. At 3.30 p.m., the boy came home from school, changed his clothes, and went out into the backyard to play. We figured we had nothing to lose in talking to the boy again. We found him in the small workshop at the rear of the garage where he was sawing on a piece of plywood with a hacksaw. We talked to him for about 20 minutes. It was no different than the first time we interviewed him. He was relaxed and talkative. <laughs> Say, would you hand me that hammer there, officer? Oh, yeah. Yeah, here you go. Thanks. Well, if I ever get this thing finished, it's going to be the best coaster around here. These are the wheels I'm going to put on it. Pretty good, aren't they? Yeah, they look fine, son. Do you like building things, coasters and things like that? Oh, yeah, I like it all right. It's fun. Your granddad says you've changed quite a bit since you got back, Jim. Says you didn't like working around the shop here before. Well, I guess I don't really. You know, once in a while I like to come out and fool around. Mm hmm. Have you seen Mr. Barlow down the street since you've been back? Mr. Barlow? Um, no, I went down to see him, but he wasn't home. Maybe I'll go down and see him tomorrow. His name isn't Barlow, is it, Ben? I thought it was Robinson. Oh, yeah, that's right, Mr. Robinson. 
Sometimes I forget. How do you and your grandfather get along, Jim? All right? Oh, sure. Every once in a while, it looks kind of funny at me. I don't know. I guess he's still worried about that man taking me away, you know, and all. Uh huh. How you been feeling lately, Jim? Okay? Sure, I feel fine. Hardly ever get sick. That's good. You ever been in the hospital, son? Uh-huh, just once. Had my appendix out. I hate hospitals. Uh, can I have that can of nails there, please? Oh, yeah. Yeah, here you are. Gotta make this good and strong, you know. I'd like to ask you a question, son. Yeah? What's your real name? I'm Jimmy Sherman. You know that. No, I'd like to have the truth, son. Who are you? You must be fooling, officers. You know who I am. Jimmy Sherman. No, Jimmy Sherman never had his appendix out, son, but you did, and you've got a scar to prove it, haven't you? Sure, I had my appendix out. Ask my grandpa, he'll tell you. I'm afraid he won't, son. He says he's not your grandfather. He says you don't belong here. His grandson never had an operation in his life. How about it, son? You want to tell us about it? Oh, Grandpa isn't feeling well. He doesn't know what he's saying. Well, he knows you're not his grandson. Now, come on. What about it, son? All right. I'm not Jimmy Sherman. He told us his real name was Donald Rush. He said he'd run away from his home in Springfield, Ohio, two weeks before. He said that he'd been picked up by the police on a highway just on the outskirts of Dayton, Ohio. On returning the boy to the station, the police officer saw that he fitted the description of the missing California boy perfectly. It was almost as if the two were identical twins. Under the impression that the youngster was suffering from shock or amnesia, the police officers told him all about his home and his friends in California. They gave Donald Rush all the information that they had on the missing Sherman boy. All the newspaper stories, pictures, the dozens of teletypes and circulars which had been sent across the country in an effort to locate the missing youngster. On his way out to California on the train, the Rush boy was given dozens of newspapers to read, which contained thousands of words concerning the disappearance of Jimmy Sherman. So by the time he got to Los Angeles, Donald Rush knew everything he had to know about the boy he was impersonating. We questioned the Ohio youngster further. Besides an exceptionally high IQ, he admitted to having an almost photographic memory. We took him in the house to face the grandfather of the boy that he'd been impersonating, the boy who was still missing. Mr. Sherman. Yes, Sergeant. Sit down, won't you? The boy here has a confession for you. He wants to tell you himself. I think I know. I was right all along, wasn't I, sir? I didn't mean anything by it, mister. I just thought it'd be fun to make out like I was somebody else for a while. You wouldn't know the difference, would you, sir? No, sir, I'm afraid I wouldn't. That picture over there on the mantel and the boy here, they look exactly alike to me. There's only one thing I'd like to know, son. Yeah? Why'd you do it? Why'd you try and fool me? Oh, I don't know, mister. I ran away from home, and the cops picked me up near Dayton. They thought my name was Jimmy Sherman. They said I was a missing kid from California. Well, why didn't you straighten them out right then, son? I was kind of afraid, and if I told them what my real name was, they would have sent me back home. So I'd just let them think I was really Jimmy Sherman. And they seemed to be pretty sure I was. How long did you think you could keep it up, son, pretending you were somebody else? Oh, I don't know. I guess I never thought much about that. I got here, and everybody was nice to me. I just didn't think about anybody finding out. Honest, mister, I didn't mean to do anything wrong. I didn't mean to hurt anybody. And you never saw my grandson? You never saw Jimmy? No, sir. I just got on the train, and they brought me out here. <laughs> you don't know where he is? You don't know how he is? All right, try to take it easy, Mr. Sherman. Why would you do it, boy? You're a stranger. Why would you try to fool me about Jimmy? I'm sorry, mister. I didn't mean it. Honest, I didn't mean it. <laughs> Thought I had him back. Thought I had him back. <laughs> Come on, then. Let's go, son. I didn't want to make him cry like that, Sergeant. Honest, I'm sorry. Couldn't you just let me stay here with him? No, I'm afraid not, son. I don't do anything wrong. Don't you think I could just stay here with him? I'll go right back in there now and tell him I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry too, youngster, but you're not the boy he's looking for.
The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On Wednesday, May 20th, a meeting was held at the Juvenile Bureau, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that meeting. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, I hold in my hand a new pack of Fatimas. All I need to prove that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Now, here on the side, you'll find this statement. Fatima contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos, superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. Fatima gives you all the advantages of extra length, plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. So tomorrow, buy a pack of Fatimas. I know you'll find that in Fatima, the difference is quality. <laughs> Donald Rush, who impersonated missing 10-year-old Jimmy Sherman, was returned to the custody of his parents at their home in Springfield, Ohio. Four months later, the body of Jimmy Sherman was discovered buried on a farm on the outskirts of Riverside, California. The boy had been murdered. His killer, a farmer in the neighborhood, was subsequently apprehended and brought to trial. He was found guilty of murder in the first degree and was executed at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portions transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy, next over most NBC stations. You make this shot, you can have anything you want for dinner. Go, go. Oh, I have Kentucky Fried Chicken, Mom. You got it, superstar. Kids love Kentucky Fried Chicken, just like other folks. And with all those delicious fixins, what a meal. It's finger licking good. Real goodness from Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now it's time to pay a visit to Duffy's Tavern. Hello, Duffy's Tavern. Where do you leave me? Dee, don't you mind you speaking? Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy. You coming down tonight? Are you going to stay home and soak your feet, huh? <laughs> well, I thought you might like to meet Diana Lynn, the movie actress. Huh? Is she the dame with the what? <laughs> no, Duffy, that's Mae West. <laughs> Huh? No, Duffy, that's Betty Grable. <laughs> huh? Uh, what's with Diana Lynn? Uh, uh, she plays the piano. Huh? You're gonna stay home and soak your feet. <laughs> well, Duffy, you should see the dame. Well, uh, picture Mrs. Duffy 30 years and 200 pounds ago. <laughs> yeah. Why is Diana coming down? Oh, well, uh, you see, I'm starting this piano correspondence course, the Archie Simplified Method, or how to play the piano with ten easy fingers. <laughs> and I'm uh, going to get Diana Lynn to endorse the school. Well, Duffy, I'm trying to make some extra cash. I'm always talking about money. Well, that's the difference between you and me, Duffy. I talk about money, and you keep it to yourself. <laughs> Well, look, I'm busy now. I'll call you back. Uh, what, 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 what you doing there, Miss Austin? Well, don't bother me now, Eddie. I got to work on this correspondence course now. Let's see. Uh, lesson number one. In order to become a great piano player, two things is required. A piano and a stool. <laughs> the stool you select is very important as the beginner must practice for hours on end. Lesson number two. Lesson uh, number two, forget lesson number one and buy a kazoo. <laughs> hey, well, what's the idea of starting this correspondence course? 
Well, I have to, Eddie. I still owe so much dough on them correspondence courses that I took, I have to get off the hook. <laughs> well, then, well, why do you keep on buying them courses? Well, to further myself. After all, a man's education don't have to stop just because he finished the eighth grade. <laughs> I didn't know you finished it. <laughs> Certainly I did. I mean, almost. It was only two days before graduation that they expelled me. But I feel I can never be too smart, Eddie. I feel that way, too. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I take these correspondence courses, you see. Each one helps improve me some umbrella. Uh, <laughs> like that Spanish course. Uh, remember how I mastered Spanish? Oh, PC. Well, do you remember it, don't you? <laughs> No, these uh, correspondence courses is a thing, Eddie. Where, where would I be if I hadn't took that course in English? Now, now, now there, now there, you could have saved a lot of money just buying a dictionary. <laughs> Them dictionaries. You read one and. <laughs> yeah, but but the, the, this piano course. Now, what do you know about the piano? What do I know? Would you like to hear me play a little boogie woogie? You play boogie woogie? I certainly. You're talking to a real hubcap. <laughs> I play a terrific boogie woogie. No. Yes. No. Yes. Would you like to hear me? No. <laughs> Eddie, I accept the challenge. Now get a load of this. Oh, strip my gears and call me shiftless. <laughs> You see, the beauty of it is that it's so simple. Uh, oh, Lord. <laughs> well, hiya, Finnegan. Say, how would you like to take a correspondence course? Oh, you mean one of them things where they mail you the dunch cat? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, what kind of a course? Uh, piano. By mail? Yeah. Ah, oh, you're kidding. How are you ever going to get a piano in the mail box? <laughs> Uh, Finnegan, you know, someday I'm going to write a book about us called The Egghead and I. Uh, <laughs> look, it's the instructions that come in the mail. Oh, the instructions? Oh, is it, it, it a hard course? Uh? No, no, any moron can learn it. Now, here. <laughs> you take that piano there. Now, yeah. observe the keyboard, yeah. see? You'll notice that it's got some black keys and also some white ones. Now, on the black keys, one plays songs like Dark Eyes, or... Uh, what about the white keys? Well, the white keys is so that you can tell them apart from the black keys. <laughs> Seems logical. <laughs> yeah. All you gotta remember is that the low keys are down there, like in the basement, uh, and the high keys is up here, like in the attic. So for low notes, you play in the basement, and for high notes, you play in the attic. Oh, do you mean I gotta carry the piano all over the house? <laughs> oh, why do I waste my time? It goes in one hole in his head and out the other. <laughs> I thought, how much you charge for this course? Well, for you, nothing, Finnegan. You mean I have won a scholarship? <laughs> yep. All you have to do is tell Diana Lynn how wonderful a course is. Oh, I... Hello, boys. Oh, hello, Miss Duffy. Uh, say, Archie, did Diana Lynn get here yet? Uh, no, not yet. Why? Well, uh, I just wanted to ask her about her method of attracting men. Oh, well, it ain't so mysterious. It's nothing that Diana accomplishes with the wink of an eye that you can't do with a bear trap. <laughs> Well, you and her are different types. She's gifted with her personality, and 
You're stuck with yours. <laughs> now, look, Miss Duffy, I got to get to work on his correspondence course here. And... Post office? Uh, this is Archie of Duffy's Tavern. Uh, put the postmaster general on, please. <laughs> huh? He's out on his route, huh? <laughs> oh, uh, how about the postmaster colonel? <clears throat> well, look, I want some information. Uh, you see, I'm going to be in a position to throw a lot of business your way. <laughs> Well, uh, what I had in mind was some three-cent stamps. Uh, what's your usual wholesale discount? Hello? Hmm. Hung up. That post office better remember that the Army is demobilizing carrier pigeons. What's the trouble, Miss Archer? Oh, I'm trying to check these postal regulations. You know, if you ain't careful, you get in trouble with every Tom, Dick, and Harry in Washington. What is this stuff you're going to send through the mail? Uh, well, some stuff I wrote on the course. Here, read it. The rules, sort of. Let's see. The Archie Tiana course is open to all persons living within the United States and its outlandish territory. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when applying for the course, please state your age and sex at the time of your last birthday. <laughs> Yes. All, all checks must be accompanied by cash or a reasonable facsimile. <laughs> and must be postmarked not later than. Uh, that's just to protect myself. Uh, you need it. 
continue. Mm. The above applies to any week ending abruptly at the end of a month. <laughs> mm-hmm. You follow it, Eddie? Yeah, but if I ever find my way back, I'll never make the trip again. <laughs> I'll take that remark from Wentz. Boy, <laughs> what a business this is going to be. <clears throat> Eddie, hand me that World Almanac there. Hey, well, we got two editions. You want the one from 1915 or the recent one? Uh, the recent one. Oh, here you are, then. 1916. <laughs> Just want to see how many pianos there are per annum. Let's see. Uh, paper, peanuts, penguins, pianos. Here we are. Pianos. At last count, 6,843,000. The population of the United States, 130 million. Well, let's figure that thing. I think I'll divvy it by calcium. <laughs> uh, let's see. <clears throat> Say, Mary has 130 million apples, and John has 6,843 pianos. Uh, we divide John's pianos into Mary's apples. <laughs> now, let's see... Holy cat, Eddie, it comes out 37 pianos per square home. <laughs> 37 pianos in every home. How could that be? Large living room. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, I, I think I might have made a mistake in my figures. Hello, Archie. Well, not too much of a mistake. Uh, well, Diana Lynn. Glad to see you. I didn't see you come in. Well, you were busy, and I didn't want to disturb you. Diana, the day a dame like you don't disturb me, I'll tell Grant to move over in his tomb. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me, honey, are there any more at home like you? My mother. Yeah, how is she? My type? (laughs) (laughs) No, but she's your generation. Uh, to change the subject, uh, are you, uh, still working at Paramount? Yes. I ain't. <laughs> ah, that hustle-bustle of the movie business was too much for me. It wore me out. Well, for a new man, they made you move some pretty heavy scenery. <laughs> Miss Lennon, it happens that they hired me as an actor. The next time I'll know enough to read the small print in them contracts. <laughs> Uh, by the way, did you ever get to see the picture? No, my luck held out. Well, you was great. You did a great little acting job. Oh, well, thank you. And you? Well, I wasn't exactly no slouch myself. That's what I heard. In fact, the producers are still talking about you over at Paramount. No kidding? What do they say? Well, I don't know exactly. They always make me leave the room. <laughs> Uh, look, kid, why are we bothering with all this small talk? <laughs> Two people like us. Two people whose hearts should be beaten and that's why hurts in diesel time. <laughs> Archie, I was under the impression that you asked me down here to discuss business. Oh, yes, business. Well, you see, Diana, I'm a piano player myself. Oh, and, I didn't uh, know that. You didn't? Oh, surely you're jesting. <laughs> I've been playing the piano ever since I was a little tight that high. My feet couldn't even touch the floor. How did you reach the pedals? Still. <laughs> yep, I put in a long time studying music. I went to the Harvard Observatory, you know. No. Oh, yes. Graduated uh, Magna Comnesia. Uh... <laughs> did you, uh, by chance, ever know Ivan Yakuputnik up there? <laughs> Who? Uh, Yak Putnik. He was my old professor. Good old Yak. <laughs> Always remember him. He used to stand there beside me at the piano, listening to me play. A tear or two would fall into his glass of hot tea. And he'd tenderly leer at me and say, Archie, nobody plays the piano as sad as you do. <laughs> That's why I want you to come down, Diana. I want you to endorse this correspondence school that I'm starting. Oh, but Archie, I, I can't endorse the course unless okay, I'm... Okay, I know. You want proof that it's good, Pike. Well, look. 
<clears throat> you see that little guy sitting over there at the table? That's Clifton Finnegan, the famous composer. <laughs> he was one of my pupils, and look at him today. You know what he's doing there right now? Writing an opera. On a racing form? <laughs> he does horse operas. <laughs> I'd like you to meet him. Oh, uh, Finnegan. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Finnegan, uh, this is Diana Lynn. Uh, Diana, this is Clifton Finnegan. This is a pleasure. This is amazing. Uh, Mr. Finnegan, I'd appreciate it if you would tell Miss Lynn what you think of the Archie Simplified Piano Course. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. The, the, before I took the Archie Piano Course, people laughed when I walked into the room. Why? Huh? Why? I forgot to open the door. <laughs> Diana, you'll have to excuse uh, Mr. Finnegan. His father met his mother. <laughs> He's what you might call an eccentric. And also what an eccentric might call an eccentric. <laughs> well, you know these composers. <laughs> oh, yes. By the way, what are the names of some of your compositions, Mr. Finnegan? Oh, well, uh, oh, well uh, you see, uh, <laughs> Diana, he don't put in full time at composing. He just does it as a sideline, what they call an extra verse. In, <laughs> in real life, he's, uh, he's a very well-known uh, broker in Wall Street. Yeah, in one of the buildings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He does look a little like he just came off the curb. <laughs> yes, uh, doesn't he? Uh, by the way, CF, uh, how did things go today? Uh, what's the latest reports on the ticket? Oh, uh, the doctor says not to worry. It's just gas. Finnegan, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think your office is calling you. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Do you look? Okay, uh, Miss Lynn. Yes. Uh, it is not farewell. It's just goodbye. Farewell. <laughs> well, there you are, Diana. You see what he had to say about the course? Now, uh, what do you say? <laughs> Will you endorse it? Well, Archie, tell me, have you any other endorsers? Any other? Well, I got a few people in mind. Uh, Stokowski and uh, Jose Turby. Uh... Okay, if you can get Jose Turby and Stokowski to endorse your course, I will, too. Okay, it's a deal. Eddie, give me that phone book.
Who are you calling, Archie? I'm uh, calling Stakowski. You said you wouldn't endorse the course unless I got some other big name. Hello? Oh, hello, Gloria. <laughs> Is Leopold there? Uh, who's this? Uh, just tell him an old friend of his. Yeah. Hello, Stokey. <laughs> How are you? That's good. Me, hey, I'm swell. Uh, huh? Business? Uh, pretty good. Yeah, well, I'd like to see you soon, too. Say, uh, Leo, I'm starting a correspondence course. Huh? No, this ain't Charlie. This is Archie from Duffy's Tavern. Hello? <laughs> mm. Is Leo out? Yeah, but this others. Don't worry. Mm. Hello? <clears throat> Jose of Turby, please. Hello, Jose? This is Archie. Hello? <laughs> mm. Must have been cut off. Mm. I'd better call him back. Hello? 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 Jose? What did you hang up for? Huh? You thought it was Archie from Duffy's Tavern. Well, Jose, it is. Hello? <laughs> mm. Well, that's your friends for you. Last time I asked that guy for an autograph. <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, what other friends have I got now? Archie, how about Beethoven? Wait, I forgot about him. <laughs> I'll call him right up now. Uh, <clears throat> what uh, number was that he gave me again? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, Beethoven and me was together at Carnegie's Hall once. <laughs> Hello, uh, uh, Beethoven? Uh, Archie? Yeah. Where you been, you bum? <laughs> well, long time no see. <laughs> Say, Bate, I want you to do me a favor. <laughs> I'm starting this piano correspondence course, and I'd like you to endorse it. You will, huh? Well, thanks, Bate. That's swell. Yeah, say hello to the little woman. <laughs> Archie, who were you talking to? Didn't you catch the name? Beethoven. And he's in. Now, how about you? Archie, I I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll endorse your course if you let me talk to Beethoven. You want to talk to him? Yeah. Well, he's pretty busy at the moment, and... Oh, the man is very hot right now. <laughs> Making records and things. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, okay. I'll leave you talk to him. Uh, why don't you play a number first, though, in the meantime, while I check back with him, huh? Oh, all right. Okay, hey, Finnegan, come here. Yeah, I like you. Run over to Cone's Candy Store, see? Call me up and say that you're Beethoven. And when I put Diana Lynn on the phone, tell her that you're gonna endorse the course, huh? Yeah, okay, I, I got you. Uh, Beethoven. Right.
very good, Diana. A little too much andante in the left hand, but uh, very nice feeling in a moderato. Thank you, Archie. Yeah, I might be very happy to have you endorse the course. Uh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, hello, Beethoven. Uh, well, look, would you like to talk to Diana Lynn and tell her that you're endorsing the course? Yeah. Okay, just a second. Uh, here, she'd like to talk to you. Archie. What? Ludwig van Beethoven has been dead for 120 years. Well, Beethoven, you're dead. <laughs> and move over. I'll be right with you. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. There's nothing quite like them on television. The Bradfords, not your typical family of eight children. I don't wear nightgowns anymore, Daddy. They'll make you laugh one minute. I forgot to kiss you goodnight. And cry the next, just like your own family. Eight is enough right after Happy Days in Laverne and Shirley. Another exciting tale of escape is up next. You... Finding life rather dull, dreaming again of exotic places, wishing you were somewhere else, we offer you Escape. Escape with us now to the outer limits of space. And the terrifying experiences of four men who penetrated it. As Ray Bradbury, famous science fiction writer, tells it in his gripping story, The Earthmen. Number one. Mission accomplished. Yes, sir. You better make sure you pause after that. Give them a few seconds to get over their excitement down there. They'll go crazy. Be bigger than New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve be bigger than the armistice. Only one celebration will top it in our lifetime. What's that, sir? The one they throw when we get back. <laughs> All right, now, where was I? Um, mission accomplished. Yeah. Uh, first rocket expedition to Mars landed upon Mars 1203 Earth time. Estimated position of landing, approximately longitude 345 degrees, latitude minus 7 degrees. Landed without incident at edge of forest. Atmosphere, uh, what's a good word to say, it's all right for breathing. Optimal? Uh, yeah. Found atmosphere optimal, descended from rock. Uh, Captain Williams. Uh, yeah? Uh, Prescott, sir. I see Prescott. He's running this way. Running something after him? Uh, no, he's just loping along. I think he's smiling. Keep your binoculars on him. Sound off, it looks like he's in trouble. Uh, descended from rocket. Sent Lieutenant Prescott on reconnaissance mission. Uh, Dugan Prescott, all right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, want me to yell to him? No, just stay up there and watch him. Uh, morale high. Commend efficiency and discipline of entire crew. Lieutenant Prescott and Dugan, Sergeant Clitheroe. Thanks, Captain. Uh, there's enough glory for all, Sergeant. Any chance of sending that in now? Not for two hours. Channels won't be clear for voice communication until three o'clock Earth time. They don't even know yet that we made it. I'd like to be down there when they get that message. You, what excitement. 
Siren's band playing artillery salute. Uh, hit Prescott, sir. Good. Come on down, Dugan. <laughs> Prescott, you all right? People. Here, sit down, sit down. Catch your breath. People. Mars has people. Oh, All right, now take your time. You want to drink? Mars is in heaven. People, just like home. Any women? Let him talk. What sort of people? Ordinary-looking people, men, women, kids. Hostile? I don't think so. I came down a road, a country road, followed it to the right angle into a paved highway. Yeah. Before I could decide whether to go right or left, I heard a buzzing sort of sound. I ducked behind a bush. Vehicle rolled past. One wheel must have a gyroscopic balance of some sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inside was a man and a woman. What'd they look like? Just like us. Hair, eyes, nose, mouth, body, clothes. Uh, never Mars inhabit it. Wait till they hear that down there. Uh, as it passed, I followed it. I came to a hill. And when I got to the top, there was a little town. Building, streets, just like home. And then I hurried back here. People. And just like home, huh? Yeah. You suppose they're really friendly? Well, I don't see why not. You heard what he said? Civilization up here resembles the one down there. What would they do on Earth if Martians came down and established contact? You'd make a pretty big thing out of it. Yeah, the people up here will probably treat us the same way. Even so, we're not going to take any chances. We'll be on. We're going into town? Right. As soon as we camouflage the rocket. All right, start cutting some of those branches and gathering leaves. Cover it up good. I don't want anybody monkeying around while we're gone. Right. We can't be gone long, Captain. Channel's open at three. We'll be back by then, if everything goes well. Oh, can you imagine their reaction when they see it? Come on, man, make it fast! All right, men, dress it up. I'm going to knock on the door now and keep smiling to show we're friendly and let me do all the talking. Understand? Yes, sir. Yes? What do you want? You speak English. I speak what I speak. What do you want? Martian speaks English. Uh, We're from Earth. I'm Captain Williams, commander of the first expedition to Mars. And you are the first Martian we've met. Martian? What I mean to say is you live on the fourth planet from the sun, correct? Well, everybody knows that. Well, well, we're from Earth. Where? It's never been done before. What has it? How is it you speak such good English? I'm not speaking, I'm thinking. Telepathy. Now, what is it you want? We're from Earth. From Earth. Some other time, Mac. I got my own problem. How do you like that? He didn't look very bright. I, I, I know, but... Well, uh, but try it again. Uh, knock on the door. I'm in command here, Dugan. I'll do all the thinking. Yes, sir. I'll knock on the door and try it again. Yes? Oh, excuse me, ma'am. Was that your husband I was just talking to? Yes. He shut the door so quick I never got a chance to explain. Oh, I'm sorry, but he is busy. Uh, Can I help you? Are you uh, strangers in town? (laughs) I'll say we are. We're from Earth. Earth? The planet Earth. Maybe you have a different name for it. The third in order from the sun. We came in a rocket. Almost 60 million miles. Don't come near me. I just want to see a can. You and your husband are the first people on this planet we've seen. Don't come near me. You don't understand. We're from Earth. We we came in a rocket. We came in a rocket. Ah! 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 What did I do, Captain? Don't you think we'd better get away from here, maybe? Well, all I did was... Was... How far is it to town, Prescott? Quarter of a mile. I just... I just wanted to shake hands. What was it that scared us? Button your buttons, do whatever you want. Doesn't seem to make any difference. Nobody's paying any attention to us, anyhow. 
You'd think these people had visitors from Earth every day. Nobody even turns around to look at us. Uh, can I say something, Captain? Yeah. We can't blame them for ignoring us, sir. We look just the same as they do. For all they know, we're just a few Martians ambling through the town square. We ought to take a chance and try telling someone else. We've told three of them already. Back at that farmhouse, the man ignored us and the woman screamed and ran away. And that girl we told fainted. A captain looks like a bar or a soda fountain in here. Would it be uh, all right if we went in and had something to drink? Yeah. Why not? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could we... Get something to drink here. Got some nice fruit, Crystal. It's all right. The same for everyone. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen you fellows around. You strangers? We're from Earth. Where? Earth. Third planet from the sun. Oh. Clumsy of me. Earth, huh? Well, what do you know? You mean you... You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Sure. Sure. That we're the first men from Earth ever to reach Mars that has never been done before. That we came 60 million miles in a rocket. Uh, sure, sure. 60 million, huh? Rocket, you say? Well, uh, I'm, I'm proud to make your acquaintance. I'm Captain Williams. This is Lieutenant Prescott, uh, Sergeant Clitheroe, uh, and Lieutenant Duke. I'm honored. I am, I'm honored. Do you mind if I bring my son in to meet you? This is an occasion. <laughs> sure, uh, sure. Bring him in, son. Son, come in here. Rocket, eh? All the way by rocket. Say, hey, now. You uh, understand what we went through, the chances we took. Sure, sure. Why, you're real heroes. Uh, let me shake hands again. You call me, Doc? Son, these men are from Earth. From Earth. Understand? Yes, Pop. We're the first men from Earth ever to reach Mars. Isn't that wonderful, son? Think of it. It's, it's wonderful. Go tell everyone. You don't mind if he tells people, do you? <laughs> mind? <laughs> I should say not. Oh, we'd <laughs> like him to. Oh, as many as possible. Go ahead, son. Hurry. <sighs> think of it. All the way from Earth. There were times in there when I didn't think we'd make it, I can tell you. Hey, I'll bet there were. <laughs> Turbine conked out when we hit the stratosphere, and I began to sweat the big drop. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Turbine, uh, it's pretty serious. Well, even before we left, we were told we only had about one chance in three of making it. Hey, I don't see where you found the courage. We didn't even know what we'd find when we got here. Why? You oh, see, my. it's never been done before. Never. Uh... Let me shake your hand again. Lots of men were killed trying, but they never succeeded. What an, what an honor for our little town. <laughs> You're the first to know, really. The very first. Oh? Your name will go down in history of all the school books with ours. Oh, and the monuments on both planets. Hey, what is your name? Hey, wait a minute, man. Hold on. What's up, Skipper? Outside. All those people. Looks like the whole town. Why, 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 they, they must have heard the news. The glorious news from my son. Yes, they, 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 they come to welcome you. Hey, Hold your fire, come men. Come welcome. It doesn't sound like they've come to welcome us. What? Uh, that's the man we first spoke to, the one whose wife got scared. Hey, gentlemen, please don't shoot. There must be some mistake. I'll just ask them why they're behaving in such a... Here, come back here. Come back here, you old... Come back here. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, Doctor, I don't understand this and I don't like it. Do the, the back way out. See if it's clear. Let's got you fire when I say fire, not before lower your gun. They're all around us, Captain. You make a break for it. One volley at my command. Captain Williams. Yeah? Look, there's a little guy out there giving them all what for. What? He's starting to disperse. Oh, oh, no. Let me out of the square immediately. Immediately, I say. Go on now. Go on, all of you. Go on home. He's coming in. Now, I'll do all the talking. Put your guns away, but stay on your toes. Dugan, let's keep our eye on the back, huh? Gentlemen, uh, may I apologize for the unforgivable actions of my fellow townspeople. They've acted barbarously. Barbarously. We didn't do a thing. We were as friendly as we could be. Well, they're ignorant, ignorant, just ignorant. No reverence for science, none whatever. We're from Earth. Did they tell you? Oh, yes, yes. A great honor, sir. This is without a doubt the most memorable moment of my life. As a man of science... 
I greet you. What have we done to make them so hostile? Oh, no, please, put it out of your thoughts. They're adults, idiots. Simply because two women were stupid enough to be frightened. <laughs> These are my apologies, my sincere apologies. Believe me, sir, I would never have forgiven them if they had harmed so much as a hair of your head. It's scientific marvel and they would do you harm. Unforgivable. Oh, my. We're wasting time. The members of the Institute are waiting. <laughs> Institute, the Institute of Science. We have sole jurisdiction in such matters. And the members have already been informed and are eagerly awaiting your appearance. It will cause a sensation. Well, that's a little more like it. This way, if you please. I have transportation waiting. And have no fear of these rustics. You're in my care now. <laughs> I'm Captain Williams, sir. Who are you? I'm president of the Institute. My name is Dr. Brew. In this way, gentlemen. In this way. Escape under the direction of Norman MacDonald returns in just a moment. How the gambling machine works. The far-reaching effect of legal and illegal gambling. Domination of entire areas by racketeers. That's this week's topic on The Nation's Nightmare, tomorrow night on CBS. And now, back to Escape. I won't make a speech, you understand, just a few informal remarks. Well, the members of the Institute will listen to you with the greatest interest, no matter how informal your remarks. Go right in and make yourself at home. Thank you, Doctor. I'll keep it short. We have to be back at our rocket by 3 o'clock our time in order to... To communicate with Earth, yes. You told me. <laughs> Go right in. I'll join you very soon. Thank you. After you, men. Mm -hmm. He's a nice fellow. Wow. What an auditorium. Yeah. Must be hundreds of people. I wonder how they managed to get them together at such short notice. Straighten up, men. They're looking at us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Mr. O. And I'm Captain Jonathan Williams of New York City. On Earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, one and all, on behalf of myself and my crew. Thank you. Well, it's good to see another man from Earth. I am from Earth also. How was that again? There are many of us here from Earth. You? From Earth? Yes. But, but is that possible? Did, <laughs> did you come by rocket? Has oh, space travel been going on for centuries? What, uh... What country are you from? Tui, Rio. <laughs> I came by the spirit of my body years ago. Tui, Rio? I never heard of it. What was that about the spirit of your body? Well, what do you mean there are many of us here from Earth? <laughs> Not only from Earth. He's from Jupiter. He's from Saturn. Jupiter? Saturn? Wait a minute, this is confusing. Where... On Earth is this Tuirio? A Tuirio? Is it near America? America? What is America? You never heard of America? No. You say you're from Earth and you never heard of America? Earth is a place of seas and nothing but seas. There is no land. I am from Earth and I know. Earth is a place of all jungle. I am from Orion Earth, a civilization built of silver. Silver? Men, come over here a second. Do you realize what this is? What, sir? This is no celebration. These aren't members of the Institute. This isn't a banquet or a surprise party. Huh? Look at their eyes. Listen to them. 
Now I understand why the woman screamed, why the girl fainted, why the old boy and the soda pond ran out on us, why the crowd was hostile, why they've bought us here. Oh, where are we, sir? In an insane asylum. They think we're crazy. <laughs> Clitheroe will try the door again. I just tried it, Captain. It's still locked. Go right in, gentlemen. The members of the Institute will listen to you with the greatest interest, no matter how informal your remarks. <laughs> I'll bet they've been listening, all right. I'll bet they've had us under observation ever since we entered this building. Uh, Captain, look. What? You ought to take a look. That woman who said she was from Earth, too. Blue flame is coming out of her mouth and then turning into the shape of a small naked child. You think that's something? I've been watching one of them change into a crystal pillar and then into a golden statue and then into a staff of cedar and then back into a woman again. Never saw anything like that. Magician? No. Not magicians. Those are hallucinations. They pass their insanity over into us and we see their hallucinations too. Telepathy, auto-suggestion and telepathy. Well, look, Captain, if hallucinations can appear this real to us, to anyone, if hallucinations are catching and almost believable. It's no wonder they took us for psychotics. If that woman can produce little blue fire children and and that one can change into a pillar, how natural if normal Martians think we can produce our rocket ship with our minds. I've been thinking along those lines, too. If someone came up to you on Earth and said he was from Mars, just came in by rocket, wouldn't you think he was crazy? I would. Heaven help me, I would. What time is it? Uh... 235. The channel's open in 25 minutes. Where's that doctor? Where's that doctor? I said, where's that doctor? I'm here, Captain. I demand our release. I demand an apology for this outrage. My government will certainly hear of this. All the governments of Earth will hear of it. I shall tell them of the indignities heaped upon their representatives. Yes, yes, of course. Don't Captain. humor me! Are you going to release us or must I take steps? What sort of steps? I'll kill you. That's very interesting. Excuse me a moment. Dr. Hall. Yes, doctor. Did you call me, doctor? The case is developing along classic lines. I thought you might be interested. He's just threatened to kill me. Uh, Proceed, please, Captain. I wasn't joking, I tell you. Are you going to stand aside? No. All right. Jan. Most interesting. What do you suppose the next phase will be? A denial of insanity. Reaffirmation of sanity. But we are sane. We are. You see, plastic men try to think of something. He thinks we're insane and he won't understand that we're not. No, 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 not at all. I do not think all of you are insane. Oh, no. Uh, just you, sir. The others, the ones you persist in referring to as your crew, they do not exist. They are secondary hallucinations. Secondary... Hallucinations. But you can touch them. You can hear them. Go ahead and touch them. They would prove nothing. The patients have come to me with snakes crawling from their ears. When I cured them, the snakes vanished. We'll be glad to be cured. Go ahead. It's unusual. Not many want to be cured. Uh... The cure is drastic, you know. Cure ahead. I'm confident you'll find we're all sane. He persists in referring to the others. Oh, they never stop. You know, Captain, uh, such cases as yours need special treatment. Uh, The others in this hall are simpler forms, but once a patient has deteriorated as much as you have with primary, secondary, tertiary, auditory, olfactory, and lingual delusions, as well as tactile and optical fantasies, it's a pretty bad business. We may have to resort to euthanasia. Euthanasia? You're crazy! Now, listen. My crew and I left Earth three days ago in a rocket. We landed here yes, in Mars. Yes, 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 you've already told me, Captain. Most detailed dream fantasy I've ever heard. But from. I can show you the rocket ship! I'd like to see it. Can you manifest it in this hall? No, certainly. It's over there on the corner. I don't see. Of course you don't. It's not there. 
Why did you tell me to look if the rocket isn't there? I was joking, you idiot. Joking! Really? You have an odd sense of humor. If you give us transportation and come with us, I can show you the rocket. It's in a small forest near that town where we first saw you. Be rather interesting to observe his reaction at the failure to show it to us. Yes. Would you care to accompany me, Dr. O? Oh, I'd be delighted. Very well, Captain. Lead us to your rocket. Here it is. Here's the rocket. Now are you satisfied? Now are you convinced? I see nothing resembling a rocket. Lugan, Prescott, Clithero, clear away the commissars. Hurry! You'll see, Doctor. You'll see. All right, there. There. Okay, men, that's enough. There you are, Doctor. That's the main hatch. Now, are you convinced? Wonderful manifestation. Wonderful. But like the manifestation of your gun when you threatened to kill me, they're completely unreal and non-functional. They have been thinking about why your gun jammed, Captain. I think it's a change in atmosphere. I suppose he allows his hallucinatory companion to offer the rational because the reality is too painful for him to offer it himself. It's precisely done. It's a rocket. It's a real rocket. See? I can touch it. Uh, may we look inside? I insist that you look inside. <laughs> Come along, Dr. Lowe. This is one of the most... Captain, it's three minutes to three. If we can keep them here until they open the channels, they'll be able to hear the reaction to our report on Earth, and then we'll be able to... I know, I know, I know. What a suspicious bunch of rollouts. Two cents, I'd tell the people back home not to bother with more. I've never seen anything like it. No, and now do you believe? Why, well, this is the most incredible example of sensual hallucination and hypnotic suggestion I've ever encountered. We went through your your rocket, as you call it. I tapped it and I heard it. Auditory fantasy. I smelled it. Olfactory hallucination induced by sensual telepathy. I couldn't even taste it. Lingual fantasy. Allow me to shake your hand, sir, and congratulate you. You are a psychotic genius. You have done the most complete job by the task of projecting your psychotic image life into the mind of another via telepathy and keeping the hallucinations from becoming sensually weaker is almost impossible. Those people in the house usually concentrate on visuals or at the most visual and auditory fantasies combined. But you, but... Captain, have balanced the whole conglomeration. Your insanity is beautifully complete. My insanity? Yes, yes. What a lovely insanity. Metal, rubber, foods, clothing, fuel, nuts, both. Ten thousand separate items we've checked on your vessels. Uh, never have we seen such complexity. Why, there were even shadows under the bunks. And under everything. Watch your concentration of will. Let me embrace you, sir. <laughs> I write this into my greatest monograph. I'll speak of it at the Martian Institute next month. Uh, Doctor, <laughs> he's incurable, of course. Of course. You poor, wonderful man. You'll be much happier, Dave. What? Have you any last words? Oh, no, no, don't you. Oh, you poor, sad creature. I'm afraid you are far beyond any psychiatric therapy. You are an incurable king. No. I shall put you out of this misery which has driven you to imagine this rocket and these three men. I didn't. It not. will be most engrossing to watch your three friends and your rocket vanish once I've killed you. Doc, <laughs> and then I will write a paper on the dissolution of neurotic images from what I observed yesterday. I'm <laughs> from Earth. My name is Jonathan Williams. And these yes, men are... Yes. I know. From Earth. I'm his... Captain. Captain Williams. They continue to exist. Superb. 
hallucinations with time and spatial existence. I wonder how they will react to a bullet. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, but I'm not. No, no, no. An auditory no. appeal. No. Even with yeah, the what? patient dead. Run, run, run. 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 Such persistence of the psychosis. First time I've ever observed it post mortem. But it will fade. It will all fade. Interesting, wasn't it? Well, shall we be returning to the Institute? I should like you to explain certain aspects of the case to the members of my department. Oh, gladly, my boy, gladly. You see. brought you The Earthmen by Ray Bradbury, especially adapted for Escape by Walter Newman, starring Parley Bear with Harry Bartell, Hans Conrad, Larry Dobkin, and Lou Krugman. Featured in the cast were John Boehner, Sidney Miller, Georgia Ellis, Jack Crucian, and Byron Kane. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Lee Stevens. <laughs> with us to an island off the northwest coast of Africa, and the story of a man whose quest for happiness was blocked by a giant, a madman, and a beautiful girl, as Millard Kaufman tells it in his exciting story, The Gladiators. It's all fun each and every weekday when most of these same stations bring you CBS Radio's Arthur Godfrey time. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is CBS where you hear the FBI in peace and war every Thursday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. If you want to take it easy and you want to take a license, then you'll get a regal pail and you'll always know you like it. It's the light and better. Never get it. Yellow, mellow, brew, regal pail. Never fail. It's the better, better brew for you and you and you and you. It's the better, better brew for you. This is KNX Los Angeles. 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 Pardon me, what kind of dog food does your dog eat? Young fellow, there's two things I know. Checkers and dogs. Dogs like canned dog food. Especially Herman here. Do you think he'd like Gaines burgers? Well, he might. Yeah, Ed, leave this to me. Hmm. Dogs like food that's moist and meaty. But Gaines burgers are moist and meaty, see? Go ahead, but... And they taste terrific. And you don't know nothing about checkers, neither. <laughs> Gaines burgers dog food. The canned dog food without the can. Now let's see what Fibber McGee and Molly are up to. When you buy linoleum, its colors are bright and fresh. Wouldn't it be nice if you could always keep them that way? Well, you can very easily, simply by buying a can of Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat. Glow Coat will not only keep the colors bright and new looking, but it will also make the linoleum last years longer than floor covering that is continually scrubbed with soap and water. 
Too much scrubbing softens and cracks the surface. Glow Coat protects the surface. And besides this protection, Glow Coat is a wonderful labor saver. In the first place, it requires no rubbing or buffing. It's self-polishing. Just apply and let dry, and in 20 minutes, you have a sparkling, beautiful floor. In the second place, it's easy to keep a glow-coated floor spotless. Spots and stains wipe up quickly with a damp cloth. You can use glow coat on your other floors, too. Painted and varnished wood, rubber, and asphalt tile. You'll find it everywhere, that attractive red and yellow can of Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. What is so rare as a day in spring in Wistful Vista, with Mrs. McGee sitting reading on the porch, her husband picking weeds out of the lawn, and his on-and-off pal Gildersleeve fixing window screens next door? We can't think of anything. But that's how it is today with Fibber McGee and Molly. Hey, Molly, I got a notion to go fishing. I just found a worm. <laughs> well, keep scratching around here. Maybe you'll find a horseshoe and we can go horseback riding. <laughs> hey, how many dandelion greens you got to have to make dandelion wine? The way you're working, McGee, you won't have enough by September to get a cucaracha cockeyed. <laughs> you pipe down, Gildersleeve. I was talking to my wife. Well, I thought I'd take over your conversation for a while. You must get pretty tired of it. Say, <laughs> hey, aren't you men going to play tennis this afternoon? Or is it too strenuous for you athletes? Oh, Gildersleeve says he had to fix the window screens. I don't know why. I've seen all his clothes, and if I was a moth, I wouldn't want them. <laughs> you tell her the real reason, McGee. You got smart and started bouncing the ball that landed on the roof. Well, get it down again. Have any days, I'll even buy you a new one. Huh? You will? Yes, I will. Anything to keep you too quiet. I'm trying to read this article about us in Liberty Magazine. Oh, you mean in the May 27th issue? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can take a hint, even if Gildersleeve can't. Hey, Gildy, come down off of that ladder a minute. I want to get my tennis ball off the roof. Who are you giving orders to, you little cigar holder? <laughs> get a ladder of your own. Well, of all the nerve. Get a ladder of your own, he says. That's my ladder of your own, and you know it, Gildersleeve. You borrowed it three weeks ago. You mean I managed to get it back three weeks ago? <laughs> Why, you big salami? You know very well you just took it to fix that smoking chimney last April. Yes, and you bought it in January to get your alarm clock out of the elm tree. <laughs> My heavens, what was our clock doing in the tree? I threw it at a cat one night. <laughs> now look, Gildersleeve, I was the original owner of that ladder, as you very darn well know. And I've been pretty good-natured about you using it. Now get off, I want it back. You got as much chance of getting it back as I have of bailing out over Scotland. <laughs> and get away from this ladder. You make me nervous. McGee, don't shake that ladder. You'll make him fall. Oh, so what? Might jar a little sense into him. <laughs> you going to get down off of that ladder, Gildersleeve, or do I have to shake you off like a rotten apple? <laughs> I won't get down. By George, this is my ladder, and I have a right... Stop it! Stop it! Mrs. McGee, make him stop teasing me. <laughs> Oh, quit running to Mama, you big squealer. And I'll give you the light top ten to get off of that ladder. <laughs> Go on, you can't count up to ten. You Stop shaking that ladder. Stop it. McGee, be careful. He might fall on you and hurt you. <laughs> I can dodge him. That big blimp is so slow he can't even fall fast. Well, you coming down, Gildersleeve? No, I'm not. And when I lay hands on you, you miserable little monkey... I'll... Okay, you asked for it. What? <laughs> oh, oh, hey, stop it! Stop it! Oh, no! 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 Uh-oh, I pushed a little too hard. Oh. Heavenly day. Is he hurt, McGee? Of course he ain't hurt. He bounced eight feet. <laughs> the big bladder. Well, I'm ashamed of you, both. Now, you come right in the house before you have any more trouble. Oh, Molly, I don't want to go in the house. Wait till I get hold of you. you... Uh, what you want me to go in the house for, Molly? You want to talk something over? Okay, let's... Oh, wait a minute, McGee. I've got something I want to talk to you about. 
Damn it. What you want to talk about, Molly? <laughs> McGee, I'm ashamed of you. Fighting and arguing in front of all the neighbors. Oh, they love it. But you had no right to push that ladder over with Mr. Gildersleeve on it. Why, shucks, it's no fun pushing over an empty ladder. <laughs> Besides, I didn't mean to push it so hard. But you were wrong in the first place. It is his ladder. Why, Molly? How can you stand there with your neck sticking through that string of seashells I bought you one Christmas long before we were married and say such a thing like that? <laughs> it is true, my ladder. Oh, no, it isn't. That ladder, it is true. I distinctly remember tearing the wrappings off of it the day it come from the hardware store. Don't you remember that? Yes, I do. Aha. Uh -huh. Because you borrowed it from Mr. Gildersleeve before it was even off the truck. What? I did? Oh, sure. <laughs> Furthermore, even though you've always claimed Mr. Gildersleeve was a pushover, you didn't have to prove it. <laughs> well, gee whiz, I didn't mean to push it so hard. Nevertheless, I want you to march right outside and offer your apology. Oh, okay, okay. Come on. Hey, Gildersleeve, I, I want to talk to you a minute. Oh, that's fine, little chum. That's fine. I want to talk to you, too. <laughs> I'm swell. About that little ladder episode, Crocky, I have... Uh, look out, McGee, he's got a baseball bat behind his back. Whoa. Come on back here, you little assassin, and I'll wham a little of the whimsy out of your skippy little skull. Now, just a minute, Mr. Gildersleeve. All McGee wanted was to tell Don't you to... tell him, Molly. It's all off. Yep. If you want me so bad, Gildersleeve, come on up there and get me. All right, by George, I will. One step further, and I sue you for trespass. You come on down here on city property and see what happens. You feeble little fugitive from a lit gun. Why, you overinflated blimp. If I ever came down there, I'd slap you so flat you could go to the hospital by mail. Look, McGee, you'll never get together with him this way. Well, what'll I do? Go inside and call him up. You think you'll let me talk? Well, it's worth trying. Come on in. Okay. Oh, running away, Oh, go smoke some corn silk, you adolescent apple knocker. Come on. Why, George, if he ever came within reach of me, Give me the telephone. Here. I'll watch out the window and see if his wife calls him in. Okay. Hello, operator. Give me the residence of Doc Horton. Huh? Oh, is that you, Mert? No. <laughs> dear, oh, dear. How's every little thing, Mert? Is, eh? What day, Mert? Your baby sister. Oh, got two new teeth this morning. Ah, how sweet. How old is the little tight, dearie? Nineteen. <laughs> Had some teeth kicked out Saturday night in a jitterbug contest. <laughs> What's that, Mert? Oh, okay. Thanks, Mert. No answer, Mom. Well, you've simply got to apologize. Send him a telegram. Say, now you're using glow coat. That's a great idea. I'll fix it to... 
Oh, no, that ain't a good idea either. Well, why isn't it? Well, he'd just fly into another rage when he saw the telegram was collect. <laughs> if there was only some way I could make him listen to me without knowing what... Hot dog! I got it. You have? Yeah. Now, get this, folks. It's the crux of the whole program. <laughs> what is it? Look. Let's say I go down to the Whistle Vista recording studios and make a phonograph record of a handsome apology and send it to Gildersleeve. He'd play it out of curiosity, and it'd be over before he knew what it was all about. Say, that's a wonderful idea. Get your hat and we'll... Oh, is that Gildersleeve? Let me peek. No, it isn't. It's Mrs. Uppington. Oh, swell. Oh, watch me insult her, too, so I can make an extra record. Now, McGee, please don't do that. We've got trouble enough. Oh, it's all in fun, Molly. Come in. Don't do it, McGee. She's too dumb to realize what... Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Uppington? And Mr. McGee. My goodness, what is wrong with Mr. Gildersleeve? I just met him outside. Well, he's angry with my husband, Abigail. McGee knocked him off a ladder. Good heavens. What on earth caused you to do that, Mr. McGee? Oh, just the impulse, Uppy. <laughs> I get him now and then. <laughs> For instance, I never see you riding along in that limousine of yours. <laughs> Sitting there simpering like a dummy in a showcase without wanting to heave a rock right through the window. Oh. <laughs> McGee, I told you. Well, I... Ladies, McGee, I find your sense of humor in very bad taste, if I may say so. You may say so, Abigail. Thank you, my dear. Mr. McGee, your sense of humor is in very bad taste. <laughs> ah, don't be a guppy, Uppy. <laughs> You couldn't take a joke if it was tattooed. McGee! <laughs> you stop at this minute. He's just trying to insult you, Abigail. Don't pay any attention to him. But I don't understand, Mrs. McGee. Why should he wish to insult me? Well, he wants to make another record. What, another one? What do you mean, another one? Why, you already hold the record for being the most boorish, insignificant, maladjusted little malamute in the neighborhood, if I may say so. You may. I do. You did. I know. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, you asked for it, dearie. Yes, I know. Ah, <laughs> oh, the old moose tosses a pretty sassy adjective, don't you? <laughs> hey, is Gildersleeve still out in front any place? Let me take a look. No, no, I don't see. Wait a minute. Huh? What's that sticking out from behind that tree? Let me see. <laughs> That's Gildersleeve's stomach. <laughs> He thinks he's hiding. <laughs> like trying to hide a horse in a handbag. Well, I'll let him wait. Come on, we'll sneak out the back way and go out the back door and hurry down the... Ah, welcome to the Wistful Vista Recording Studios, my friend. Is this your first visit? Yes, it is, Mr... Uh... Uh, Tate. Asa M. Tate. And if I do say so myself, an Asa Tate record is the best record made. <laughs> Well, look, bud, my name is Fibber McGee. Not the Fibber McGee. What do you mean, the Fibber McGee? The Fibber McGee who came in just now to make a recording. <laughs> yes, that's me, Toot. It's Tate. Tate? Yes, as in Tate Funny McGee. Oh. <laughs> now, what can we do for you? Well, you see, Mr. Tate, uh, McGee insulted a man next door... And we want to send him a recording of an apology. I see, I see. A splendid idea. We can handle that just as soon as we have a free studio. Oh, are you pretty busy here? Oh, thriving, Mrs. McGee, thriving. This idea has taken hold like a lady wrestler on a masher. <laughs> Everyone is recording. Valentines, love messages, speeches, legal documents. What do you mean, legal documents? Oh, yes. The human voice is accepted in court just like a signature. Is that so? Yes. For instance, there's a gentleman in Studio C who is making a recording of his last will and testament. A step this way and we'll peek in for a moment. Now, be very quiet. And to the rest of my heirs and assigns, I bequeath the residue of my estate, including house and furniture and all things appertaining thereto, with the proviso that during their lives they shall protect all wood and enamel surfaces against dampness, dirt, and wear with Johnson's wax. The finest protective polish that... Well, cut! Oh, dear me. You broke right into the middle of the recording. Oh, shucks, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello there, folks. Oh, why the record, Mr. Wilcox? Well, it's logical, Molly. This is my will I'm recording. Yeah, we know, but why? Look, you put wax on your most important things, don't you? Yes. <laughs> so why shouldn't you put your most important things on wax? 
<laughs> There's another familiarity, too, Howard. <laughs> What's that? You ought to have it on a record because you've been going round and round on the same subject for six years. <laughs> I hope you'll excuse the interruption, Mr. Wilcox. I didn't know these were friends of yours. Well, I'm not so sure now. Oh, now, Mr. Wilcox, you know very well that we... And be it hereby expressly devised that in the course of protecting and beautifying said household appurtenances, Johnson's Wax is positively the most dependable, durable, labor-saving protection for wood, leather, and enamel surfaces... Come on, Molly. ...that ever... Isn't Mr. Wilcox very young to be making out his will, dearie? Oh, not necessarily. He knows he's going to kill himself one of these days trying to think up new ways to say the same old thing. <laughs> oh, here we throw him in there anyway. Look, bud, how soon can I make my recording? Now, don't be impatient, Mr. McGee. We're very, very busy, you know. Let me think now. Well, hello there, Johnny. Hello, Dirk. Oh, hello there, Mr. Old Timer. <laughs> What are you doing here? Well, do you two know this gentleman, too? Oh, sure. He's our oldest friend. Aren't you, old-timer? If you can take him on the shoulder, bring him around, Johnny, and I'll wrestle him for 50 cents. <laughs> uh, what did you say you were doing here? Who, me? Oh, we just finished recording some hot jive, daughter. Me and my band. Your band? You got a band? Yep. Small combo, Johnny. Hot and sweet. Call him the old timer and he's sexagenarian. <laughs> Ain't a one of us under 16 we make Goodman and them Dorsey kids sound like hand organs in a hailstorm. Well, heavenly days, imagine that. Are you making anything out of it or do you work like uh, George Bernard Shaw for your room and beard? <laughs> daughter, but that ain't the way I heard it. The way I... Uh-oh. Say, you gotta excuse me, kids. Gotta run down the hall and get some refills. Refills? For what? My comb. That's what I play in the band. Comb and tissue paper. <laughs> well, see you later, kids. I'll tell you one of my records. <laughs> Well, this isn't getting us anyplace, but I want to get busy. Haven't you got a studio we can use? Of course, of course. You can use Studio E just as soon as the King's men get through recording their version of Open Your Heart and Say Ah. Right in here, please. Way 
waving at you again. Oh. Uh, how, how am I doing, Mr. Tate? Very, very good, Mr. McGee. The first part reported very well, but for this next part, get into the microphone a little more. Oh. Yeah, that's it. And it will help if you take the cigar out of your mouth. Uh, thank you. <laughs> it's about time you ditched that stogie, McGee. I didn't know whether you were recording an apology or smoke gets in your eyes. <laughs> Well, you ready to cut the rest of it, bud? All ready, Mr. McGee. Start talking with the builder. Ready? Ready. And that's why I want you to know, Gildy old man, that I am sorry I pushed you off of the ladder. I hope we can be friends again from now on, and in honor of the occasion, here is a little poem I wrote. <clears throat> the world would be a better place to live in if guys like I would admit they're wrong and give in without their wife forcing him almost to do it. But I know if I hadn't did it, I would rue it. <laughs> so here's to you, a friend true blue, from your little chum next door, dear Throcky. To have you as a pal, I consider myself pretty lucky. <laughs> There. How was it, Molly? Fine, dearie. All but that poem. Well, maybe it could have been polished up a little bit, but it's the sentiment that counts. Sediment. I said sentiment. I know, and I said sediment. Oh. That's what's left after the drip has stopped. <laughs> well, I'm afraid you just don't appreciate the finer well, things. Well, everything is splendid, Mr. McGee. Splendid. Oh, fine. And I hope you can use our services again sometime. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Now, uh, you got the address where to send that record, didn't you, bud? Oh, yes, Mr. McGee. Mr. Throckmorton, P. Gildersleeve, 83, Wistful Vista. Yes, and send this note with it. It'll be on its way in half an hour. A good day. A good day, Mr. Tate. So long, Tate. Well, frankly now, McGee, don't you feel better for having made that apology? Even if Mr. Gildersleeve uh, hasn't seen it yet. Oh, yes, I guess I do, but... Hello, Mr. McGee. Hello, Mrs. McGee. Oh, hi, Wimple. My, my, you're looking happy and cheerful for a change, Mr. Wimple. Oh, I am. I'm just a different person when I come down here to make my record. It cheers me up no end. What kind of record do you make, Wimple? You a singer? Oh, no. I just talk. Oh, recitation, son. Huh? In a way, yes. <laughs> you see, I record the things I would like to say to my wife. <laughs> I spend the first half hour waking myself into a rage. And then I make a recording of getting her the most terrible bawling out. And I sit here and play it to myself. Over and over and over. <laughs> it sure gets it out of your system, doesn't it, Wimple? Ever think what would happen if she ever got hold of one of those records? Oh, yes, I have. I wake up nights in a cold sweat about it. <laughs> but it's worth all the risk, Mr. McGee. Look, Mr. Wimple, why don't you brace up and really send her one of the records? It would show her that you really have a little spirit. Mrs. McGee would not only show her that I have one... But five minutes after she heard it, I'd be one. Now, <laughs> well, come on, Molly. Let's hurry home and wait for Gildersleeve's reaction. All right. Hey, he ought to be coming over any minute now, Molly. I just seen a motorcycle messenger deliver a package. Oh, that's fine, dearie. I'll be so glad when this is straightened out, all this senseless bickering and quarreling. Anybody think you hated each other? We do, down underneath. <laughs> but on the surface, there never was two finer friends. <laughs> Why, when I think... Well... Heavenly days, what on earth is that? Oh! <laughs> there you are, you little Eisenheimer. What? You oh. practical joker, you custard pie comedian. Huh? Send me a smart aleck phonograph record and a sarcastic note, will you? By George... <laughs> Now, wait a minute. What's the matter? What do you mean a sarcastic no? Well, listen to this. Huh? Dear Throcky, well, forget what happened this afternoon and play this record. Yes? There's a little token of my esteem. Okay. Then you'll know what I really think of you. Signed, your little chum fibber. <laughs> well, I don't see anything wrong with that. Didn't you play the record, Mr. Gildersleeve? Yes, I did. Well... And I want to tell you right now, McGee, if you were worth spoiling a good ten-cent shine on, I'd knock you down and kick your ears off. Oh, my... As it is, I'll just break this record over your dilly little dough. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Mr. Hey, what's the idea? Uh, oh. And never speak to me again, you crumb wit. Well, I'll be... Uh, what's the matter with that guy? Ain't he got any sense of justice? Oh, dear. I put my whole heart and soul into that record. Sure you did. 
Maybe it was that poem that got him. Though I don't quite... Oh, heaven, these days. Look. Look at the label. Huh? They sent him the wrong record. What? This is the one that the old timer was sending to us. Huh? Well, no wonder Mr. Gildersleeve got mad. Well, what do you mean? Look at the title. I'll be glad when you're dead, you rascal, you. Oh, Fibber and Molly will be back in just a moment. Say, aren't these just about the busiest days you could imagine? There's so many things to do every hour of the day, it almost seems like the days are getting shorter instead of longer. Of course, that makes us all grateful for anything that saves us time and work. That is, unnecessary work. Which brings me, naturally, to Johnson's self-polishing glow coats. The modern floor polish that goes on saving hours of work every day for women everywhere. The main point about glow coat is that it not only saves work, it makes floors more beautiful, protects them against wear, keeps the colors of linoleum fresh and bright indefinitely. In fact, makes your whole kitchen a more cheerful place to work in. It's because glow coat has so many advantages at such small cost that its popularity just goes on increasing month after month. Glow coat needs no rubbing or buffing, remember that. You just apply and let dry. In 20 minutes, you have a floor that sparkles with beauty. Need I say more? Order Johnson's self-polishing glow coat tomorrow. Well, it's really too bad the records got mixed up, dearie. Yeah. But you can have the man at the recording studio send Mr. Gidler's sleeve an explanation. Yeah, I can straighten that out, okay. I'd even kind of like to go down and make some more records. All right, let's. You have a dandy voice for us. Honest? You think so? I certainly do. You might even get a job as a news commentator. Oh, boy. Like Raymond Graham Jazz. Swing. Well, you could try that, too, but commentating is more dignified. Good night. Good night, all. This is Marlowe Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Black Finishes for the Home and for Industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. I missed my big chance last time. Angie, I'm not going to miss it again. There it is! That's the Athena 2000 Electronic Machine by Singer. It's $100 off. Push these buttons. It sews 25 stitches. Beautiful. Even measures buttons and makes buttonholes to fit in one step. If you missed your chance last time, the big Singer sale is back. Hey, hmm? Debbie, hmm? if you was my mother, what would you think of your son now? Huh? Oh. <laughs> 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 Now it's time to pay a visit to the only man in old-time radio who wrote all his own material, Fred Allen.
ladies and gentlemen. In Portland, I'm certainly glad uh, that you mentioned the Antique Show. <laughs> what is that, Boston for Antique? <laughs> I was over at the Antique Show the other night. There was a little trouble at the door. What happened? Well, a man walked into the Antique Show and said, what's new? Well, they threw him out in no time at all. <laughs> me out with them. It took me for an old mummy in there. So I was under wraps at the time. The two, two critics were wrapping me. I ran in there and told you. Did you uh, tell me, did you see the show? Oh, yes. Mama was going to buy an old sharing table, but she changed her mind. What? Mama said, why should she buy a table just for old Sherry? Oh, fine. <laughs> old Sherry would certainly never buy a table. So tell me, what was the... <laughs> the big attraction at the antique show? They had a bed George Washington didn't sleep in. Didn't sleep in? He had insomnia that night. Oh, wow. Good to know those things. Did you see anything at the antique show? Yes, I did. In the lunchroom there, I saw an absent-minded musician. An absent-minded musician at uh, the antique show? Yes. He was playing his donut and dunking his fight. <laughs> For antique jokes to Portland, what's new this week? Governor Dewey has a simplified tax form. A simplified tax form, you say? Uh huh. You only have to answer three questions. And what are the three questions? How much money did you make last year? Yeah. Where is it? Yeah. And how soon can you get it down here? <laughs> then that'll work too. <laughs> but say, uh, uh, speaking of taxes and people who have nothing, did you hear Jack Benny's program tonight? <laughs> yes. Jack had Bing Crosby, Dick Haynes, and Andy Russell. What a night for music lovers. Miss Truman singing, I'm singing in a little while. <laughs> yeah. How do you like that? <laughs> Tell me, how do you like that, Benny? You know, he fired his old quartet, the sportsman. I feel sorry for the sportsman. Oh, I do, too. You know, I don't care what Benny did to the other three guys, but any man who would put a tenor out of work would hit his own mother. <laughs> Speed it up. It's, it's dragging. It's dragging. <laughs> Put them all out there. <laughs> Am I an authority on quest? Well, right now, I have four people waiting for me down in Allen's Alley. What is your question tonight? Well, recently, the Married Women's Association in England petitioned the House of Commons demanding that housewives receive weekly paychecks from their husbands. And so our question is, quote, do you think wives should receive weekly salaries? Shall we go? As the sap said to the maple tree, I think I shall start running. <laughs> Portland. Hey, I guess the senator has company. Look, there are two sets of footprints in the mint bed. <laughs> well, uh, let's not. Somebody, I say, somebody wham the wood. Yes, Claghorn's the name. Monsieur Claghorn, that is. Monsieur Claghorn. Folly vous français vous all. <laughs> senator. Hey, I'm studying French, son. Who is, I say, who is the who is the poire de morée de ma grand mère? <laughs> what is that? Where's my grandmother's cod liver oil? <laughs> well, come on, I speak French like an alicot. Tell me, why, uh, why are you studying French, Senator? Well, France sent Maurice Chevalier over here. Yes. This country's sending me over to France. It's uh, reciprocity. A swamp, that is. But you, uh... Yeah, I've been training. I've been training to go to France, son. Yeah? I've been drinking so much Napoleon brandy, I'm going around with my hands stuck in the front of my coat. Tell me, what are you going to do in France, Senator? I'm on a goodwill tour. I'll start the south of France, yeah. and I'll stop off in Paris. Actually, I'll look in at the Folie Berger to, uh, <laughs> to see what's going on, see what's coming off. <laughs> and I'm too fast for you, son. I'm wasting my wit. Yeah, you see. <laughs> what there is of it, you said. Well, tell me, Senator. Senator, about our question. Now, do you think the housewives could receive a weekly paycheck? Well, um, that's been a vital question in the South for 200 years. Really? That's why when you drive along the country road in the South, yes. you see the wife out laboring in the field, picking cotton, yes. tossing tobacco, and chucking Oprah. Or yes. Her back bent with drudgery and toss. I see. Then you see the husband sitting by the cabin. Yes. His chair tipped back. His hat pulled down to keep the sun out of his eyes. Uh-huh. No, and that husband ain't low. No. Oh, he knows his wife wants a weekly paycheck. And as the husband sits there not working with his chair tipped back in the sun, he's thinking it over. <laughs> well, the senator has the solution, all right. I wonder if Titus Moody is still out. Howdy, bub. <laughs> you, uh, you look mad tonight, Mr. Moody. I've been seeing red all week. 
seeing red? Yeah, my wife's got a picture of Skelton on the melodeon. Oh. I've been seeing red all week. Oh. oh. Well, Mr. <laughs> well, Mr. Moody, do you think... <laughs> well, it shows Skelton can't do anything on our program either. <laughs> do you think housewives should receive a weekly paycheck? Some women ain't worth a toot on a carrot horn. Well, how about your wife, Titus? If you want to pin me down, go to it. <laughs> how, how are you handling this paycheck business? Well, when we was first married, I owned the farm. Yeah? My wife wanted wages every week. Yeah? I says, you work for me and I'll pay you at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. At the end of the year, I didn't have no money to pay her, so I gave her the farm. You gave her the farm? Yeah, uh, next year I worked for her. And at the end of the year? She didn't have no money to pay me, so she gave me back the farm. <laughs> and? She went back working for me. Oh, I see. Well, that's the way it's been going for 20 years. She, uh... One year she owns the farm and I'm working for her. Yeah? Next year I own the farm and she's working for me. Well, you have some sister. Uh, something like communism. Nobody, Nobody's got nothing, but everybody's working. <laughs> Mr. Moody, is your wife happy? Why, I don't pry into her business none. (laughs) All all I know is my wife ain't to be trusted with money. No? No, every time she gets her hands on money, she causes me trouble. How do you mean, Titus? Well, first time I met her, she had two dollars. And she caused you trouble? Trouble? Everlasting trouble. She bought our marriage license. Oh. Well, she ain't to be trusted with money. So long, Bob. So long. Mr. Moody sure had his troubles, especially with that tea and red joke. Oh, well, let's try this next joke. How's it going? Ah, Mrs. Newsbomb, do you think housewives should uh, get a weekly paycheck? This was seeming to me under the circumstances to be all depending. All depending? All depending on what? Some wives outside jobs are taking. I see. George Washington's wife, Martha, is opening for Paul McKenna kitchen. <laughs> Say other wives have outside jobs? Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone's wife is working? Effie Boone. Oh, Effie Boone. <laughs> what, uh, what about your case, Mrs. Nussbaum? Are you getting a weekly paycheck? It's a Dutch bedlock. How do you mean? To my husband, Pierre, I'm presenting an ultimato. An ultimato? <laughs> you wanted better working conditions in your home? I am asking a week, it should be five days. Yeah. Two weeks vacation, they should be with pay. Yeah. My husband's relatives should drop dead. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, some incidentals I'm demanding. The electoral process shall be fixed. The toaster, huh? This popping the toast for down. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tell me what happened when Pierre got your demand. He is refusing to negotiate. And you? I am refusing to call him off. Well, what, what was the outcome? For three weeks, nobody in my house is living. Your house is empty? Nobody's in your house? I am outside picketing. And your husband? Pierre, a union man cannot cross in the picket line. <laughs> to Mr. Cassidy's house. Let's see what Mr. Cassidy is up to. understand. You give her a check? It's a lump sum. A lump sum? Every Saturday night, you see, I come home, 
With me week's pay tucked away safe in the door, me see. I see. When I opened the door, me dear wife is standing there in the hall with knuckles akimbo. Yeah. <laughs> I I blow her a kiss, reeking of rain gold. Yeah. I put a two of banister and knocked me unconscious. I see. When I come to, me shoe is off and me money is gone. You mean the lump sum? Me wife's got the sum. And? I got the lump. Good night. <laughs> Popular singer was Henner. Although the voice of the silver mask Henner is no longer heard on the air, his son still carries on. We now present Bobby White, nine years old, his song, My Wild Irish Rose. Everybody's been waiting for since last December. Friday is the first day of spring. Yes, time to plan your flower garden. And here's the biggest flower seed bargain you ever heard of. You get 88 different kinds of flower seeds, including 12 new varieties, all America Awards winners, all first-quality seeds. If you could buy this exclusive collection in any store, it would cost approximately $1.55. But it's yours for only 25 cents in coin and the top from any Tenderleaf tea package. Send to Tenderleaf Tea, Box 4, New York City. You get fragrant flowers, including new petunias, assorted low-border flowers featuring azuratum, medium heights, including marigolds, background flowers starring early flowering cosmos, plus early American beauty asters, art shade calendula, giant French carnation, giant imperial larkspur, and a booklet full of garden tips. But don't miss out. Send one top from any Tenderleaf tea package in only 25 cents in coin. Address Tenderleaf Tea, Box 4, New York City. Ask your grocer for Tenderleaf brand tea and send for your seeds now. Offer good in USA only. Thank you. That was Glock from Power Things and Guacamora. Played by Mike Soel, Goodman, and 25 men who are not mentioned in Kusevitsky's biography. Okay, uh, Portland. Yes? Have you a little uh, perfume I might borrow there? I have some right here. Oh, it's well. It's called Breath of Gregory Pet. Breath of Gregory Pat. No wonder he looked a little winded in the yearly. But why are you putting on perfume? Is Marjorie Maine in town? Marjorie Maine? Why, I'm calling on Miss Beatrice Lilly tonight. You know who Beatrice Lilly is. She's the Judy Canova of the British Empire. Oh, how right you are. I read that Miss Lilly is looking for a new musical comedy to take back with her to England. And I have an idea, Portland. I'll see you later. <laughs> Ah, this must be Miss Lily Sweet. There's a sign on the door that says, Beatrice Lily has switched to water because water is milder. <laughs> I, uh, I, wonder, I wonder if she's home. Yes? Is Miss Lily in? I'm Beatrice Lily. Yes. You, uh, you remember me, Miss Lily. I'm Fred Allen. Well, I recall your face. But you have a strange aroma about you. Yes. Yeah. Your hair seems to be soft with rancid zephyr. Well, that's, uh, that's a new perfume, Breath of Gregory Peck. Breath of Gregory Peck? Yes. <laughs> Gregory could do with a bit of 
couldn't stand you. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, why don't you try a glass of my scent? What is your per- what is your perfume called? Afternoon with Arthur Treacher. <laughs> no thanks. I-, I read in the gossip column of Popular Mechanics, uh, Miss Lily, <laughs> that you had just returned from California. Did you have a good time in Hollywood? Oh, it was one mad well. Every afternoon it was into the pool, and then tea. Yes. Then it was down to the pool, and then tea. Yes. <laughs> After dinner, I just stayed in the pool. <laughs> I dove down and wrote a few letters. Well, I suppose uh, when you were out of the pool, you traveled with the fast British set in Hollywood. Oh yes, and it's long. Yes. <laughs> Lassie is British. Yes, Lassie strikes back. Yes. And mother was an English setter. <laughs> How did you spend your time in Hollywood? Well, when I wasn't in the pool, yes. I was croquetting, cricketing, and leapfrogging till all hours. <laughs> Why, it must have been gaiety at its peak. The most exciting thing was our English trap shoot. Really? What is an English trap shoot? Well, everyone sits around the room. Yes. And the first one who opens his trap gets shot. <laughs> Dangerous. It is. At the last trap shoot, Reggie Gardner got winged. <laughs> Reggie was talking? Yes, it was a mistake. He was only yawning. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, tell me, B, where, where did you live in Hollywood? Well, I stayed with Ronnie and Benita. Oh, the Coleman. Yes, you know, they have a lovely place in Beverly Hills, Miss Victorian stucco. Really? The garage has a belfry on it. <laughs> really? Yes, the weather vane is a live peacock. Well, that's Hollywood. Tell me, how are Ronnie and Benita? Well, they're a bit cramped for space. Every room is filled. Filled? You know, they've made several appearances on some radio programs. So instead of money, they got paid off in tobacco. <laughs> if they haven't been going on the contended hour, their house guest would be Elsie by now. <laughs> Tell me, did you do any uh, radio in Hollywood? Oh, yes. I went out with Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. Oh, Paramount Lum and Abner. <laughs> well, well, I turned down another program. I couldn't get permission from the king. Permission from the king? What program was that? Queen for a day. <laughs> well, tell me, would you would you like to be queen for a day? Frankly, I'd rather be Duchess of Windsor for twenty minutes. <laughs> Speaking of radio, B, remember remember when you were on my program last year? Oh yes, I still have some of those tea balls left. <laughs> well, how about coming on again? Can you use any flower seeds? <laughs> no, Fred. I'm sailing for England in a few days. Well, that's why I'm here. Yeah. I read that you're looking for a new musical comedy to do in London. That's right, Fred. Be your search is over. You can do the play I told you about last year. Play? Well, I don't recall. Oh, you remember Piccadilly? Piccadilly? What's it about? Well, as the curtain rises, you hear a fanfare. <laughs> the scene is Piccadilly Circus. All London is in a festive mood. It's C. Aubrey Smith's birthday. <laughs> as the show starts, the merry Londoners break into song. <laughs> I'm good, but I'm sticky. Right. 
As the set scene opens, you are waiting for your bus. It's a typical London spring morning, and as a tribute to a spring day in London, you sing. There are days that I feel I should chuck it when the rain's coming down by the bucket. It's a nice place for skipping. The sky drips and drips. I'm here in a puddle, a clear up to my hip. Oh, what an inclement morn. Oh, what a typical day. The streets full of blossom and jetsam. Everything's coming my way. a love interest. I'm your sweetheart, Herbert. We have a clandestine rendezvous at Kensington Garden. We're sitting on a park bench, and you speak. Herbert, aren't you suddenly? Dorothy, I've got a question to pass. <laughs> Herbert! But Dorothy... Oh, you touched me, Anne. But I had me mitten on. But Herbert, don't be much concerned. Certain Dell. Don't burn my sister for me. Don't <laughs> Don't put salt on my fish and chips. People will say we're an animal. Don't tug my tea bag string. Don't nibble my bloater fin. Don't touch my fraternity pin. The neighbors will say we're infatuated. <laughs> Don't shuffle my snooker cue. Ever, please don't get gay. Does the eye won't even look at you? The neighbors <laughs> will say. B.D. Rogers and Hannah live and let live. Now, the next scene is the big climax. What happened? Well, your father refuses to let us marry. As the scene opens, you are pleading with your father. You say... Oh, have an art paper. Ever wants to take you to America. America? My little daisy live among those savages? The Chippewas, the Algonquins, the Brooklyn Dodgers? <laughs> and I, I have a job waiting for me, sir, in Canada. You see, Herbert's renting an off. He's going with the Northwest Mountains. But Canada, Daisy, it's too blasted cold. The temperature goes down to ten beneath the cipher. Freezing weather won't bother me none, sir. You say you don't mind the cold? Why don't you? I shall tell you why I don't, sir. For the cold, I don't give a newt. Cause I'm wearing me new union suit. Yes, I'm wearing me new union suit. With my hinge, quite a figure, I'm a cutting. Down the strand, you can all see me strutting. Fits me close and keeps me comfy, and there is no slack. The cloth pure wool and the buttons are brown. The seams sure hold it together. The arms roll up and the legs roll down in case there's a change in the weather. Uh, to lend least I give all the credit. They sent me a suit and I shall never forget it. In such a suit there is nothing that any bloke can ever lack. It's my itchy little suit with the thingamabob on the back. Thing. Excuse me, be someone at the door. Come in. 
Who's Fred Allen? I'm Fred Allen. The summons is for you. Summons? Being caught one week from tonight. Yeah, the summons. Who's doing you, Fred? Look, Rogers and Hammerstein. This is ridiculous. They claim I stole this play Piccadilly from their show, Oklahoma. They're going to sue me, eh? Well, I'll show them. Well, Fred, what are you going to do? Hand me that phone. Hello? 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 Operator, get me my lawyer. Senevesi Hershkowitz, Kaufman Epstein, Lumsbong, Adelman, the Encore, it's NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Why are women so happy about new Tickle antiperspirant? Is it because Tickle is the first roll-on with a big, wide ball? <laughs> is it because Tickle comes in four fresh fragrances? <laughs> or is it because Tickle helps keep you dry all day? <laughs> Make yourself happy. Staying drier is nicer with a little tickle. <laughs> Take a trip back to Dodge City with Marshal Matt Dillon in Gunsmoke, coming up next. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun Smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Building up the fire this time of night for? More light. See better? See what? Nothing. There's just one more light, that's all. Mister, ever since we met on the trail back there this afternoon, you've been watching me. We're strangers, ain't we? Sure. You've been watching me, too. I did at first, but I trust you now. Crawl back in your blanket. Okay. Better. Now go to sleep, will you? You going to sleep? I'd like to watch the stars a little while first. There ain't no stars but me. I can see them over your shoulder there. Laying on my back gives me the ache. Gives me the ache, too. We got a lot in common, mister. Yeah. You never told me what name you go by. You never told me neither. I'm gone if you ain't the most suspicious man I ever run into. I'm still alive. You ought to quit worrying so much you get old before your time. My pa taught me to worry. Who's your pa? He's dead. Died worrying, probably. No. No, he died of the milk sickness. He's a good man, though. Ain't any good man. He was. Why? What he believed in. What did he believe in? Well, he always said he believed in foot washing, saving your seed potatoes, and paying your honest debt. Your pa was crazy. I'm going crazy if I don't get the bugs out of this blanket. Shake them out. I'm going to. some sleep. It'd be 
teach me how you know which way to go, Mr. Dillon. That's easy, Chester. Yeah, but all the fella said was he'd found a man's body some 20 miles east of Dodge. You've been riding like you knew right where it was laying. Well, he was a teamster, Chester. I'd just been following his wagon tracks, that's all. Oh. <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Dillon. Maybe I shouldn't never leave Dodge. Chester, there he is straight ahead there. Do you see? Yes, sir. That must be it, all right. Come on. Oh. Oh. Well, look at there. He's still in his blanket. Yeah. Looks like he was shot right in the heart. Uh, at least the poor fellow died in his sleep. Well, he must have come half awake. His hands on his gun. He never got it out, though. Somebody sure jumped him fast. Say, maybe it was Indians. No. No, his hair's still on. Now, besides... Somebody was sleeping over here. I declare. Who do you suppose it was? I don't know, Chester. Bet he couldn't be a very brave man. No, sir, he sure couldn't. A dirty coward. <sighs> Go get that shovel off your saddle, huh, Chester? Yes, sir. Dillon, it's worth a long ride like that if only to work up a good thirst. <laughs> I've seen you work up a good thirst just sitting around, Chester. Yes, sir. I'm just lucky, I guess. <laughs> well, I never heard it called that before. Give me a glass of beer, barkeep. Beer or nothing. Give him whiskey. I don't want whiskey. Ain't you man enough to drink whiskey? Drink it? When I want it, I don't believe you do. Drink some now. I ain't bothering you. Can a man come in here and have what he wants? Cowboy, ain't you? What's wrong with being a cowboy? Nothing. Only I always thought it took a man to be a cowboy. You trying to start trouble, mister? I listen to him. <laughs> What's so funny about that? I killed a man once for telling me not to laugh. I telling you nothing? Mister, I think you're a coward. You got a gun in your belt. Go ahead, use it. What for? So you can kill me and call it self-defense? All right, that's enough. Leave him alone. What are you mixing in this for? I don't like gunfighting around here. You don't like it. I'm a U.S. Marshal. Oh, Marshal. Now, what's your name, stranger? I'm called Kriego. All right, Kriego, move down the bar. Go on, move. I'll see you later, cowboy. <laughs> I wouldn't have dared draw on him, Marshal. If I ain't no gunman. He'd have killed me, sure. Yeah, he probably would have. My name's Jesse Hill, Marshal. I'm proud to know you. Well, Jesse, you keep that gun in your belt, huh? And stay away from Kriego? I ain't no troublemaker. Yeah, I know. But sometimes a man can't avoid it. Not around somebody like him. <laughs> well, I think I'll do my drinking across the street. See you later, Jesse. Yeah, so long. That Kriego's an awful mean man, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, he's mean, all right. Especially when he's sure the other man hasn't got a chance. wonder where he came from. I never saw him around here before. Now, he's new in Dodge, Chester. Let me tell you something. It had to be that kind of a man who killed that cowboy we buried today. Well, you think it was him? 
Well, he could have done it. He's enough of a coward. But if he did, no one could ever prove it. Uh, no, sir, I guess not. But he'll make a mistake yet, Chester. His kind always do. You like that material, Kitty? I'd like to make a dress of it. Is this all you have, Mr. Jonas? I'm afraid so. But I'll order more if you want it. How long will it take? A mm, few weeks is all. Okay. I'll need about uh, seven yards. Mm. You'll have it, Kitty. Mm. And say, hmm? look here. Hmm. These new parasols. Ah. They just come on the Santa Fe today from St. Louis. Hello, Matt. Hello, Kitty. Ah, Mr. Jonas. Uh, your coat's out back, Marshal. Oh? You can go try it on if you want. Oh, <laughs> new coat, huh? I'd like to see it, Matt. Well, you wait here, Kitty, and I'll just go put it on. <laughs> sure hope it fits. I had a parcel of trouble talking him into ordering that coat. Well, he's needed it ever since I've known him. Mm. Men just don't like new things, Kitty. Yeah. Now, is there uh, anything else? Ah, uh, no. That's all for today. How much do I owe you? Mm. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, I'll have to add it up. Well, now... There's a right pretty girl. Go on back to your hogs, mister. <laughs> Salty, too. I like that. Oh, no. Now, look here, stranger. I don't pay this... any attention to him, Mr. Jonas. You got it figured? Well, it comes to uh, about uh, $2.40, kid. Uh-huh. I'll pay it. What? I says I'll pay it. You'll do nothing of the kind. Put it on my bill, Mr. Oh, Jonas. there you are. I like to buy things for pretty girls. Providing they let me carry the package home for it. Now get out of here and leave me alone or I'll hit you again. Maybe you're a little too salty. Maybe what you need is a... Ch- Go ahead, Krigo. Finish what you were going to say. It's no business of yours. I want to hear what you were going to say. When she slapped me, you saw her. Get out of the way, Kitty. Gladly. Now, let's not fight. Be quiet, Mr. Gentlemen. Jonas. Yes, sir. Rigo, I think you're a coward. I'm going to prove it. What are you up to? A cowboy Jesse wouldn't draw on you. But I will. Are you ready? No. There, I got my gun out and you didn't do a thing, did you? I ain't drawing on you. Now get out of here, Krigo. And if I ever see you anywhere near Miss Kitty again, I'm going to break your neck. Now go on, get out. He sure showed his colors, Matt. Yeah. You know, I think that's the first time I ever saw you draw first on a man. Well, I figured he wouldn't draw, Kitty. How'd you know? A Krigo doesn't take any chances. And right now, I'm wondering how many more men he's going to kill before he's through. We will return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first... The crusade for freedom is a crusade for your freedom and mine. The truth dollars people send the crusade for freedom help preserve our own freedom, even as they get the truth and hope to people behind the Iron Curtain. Truth dollars help finance Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, the most effective weapons Western democracy has for countering lies and distortion. Send your contribution to the crusade for freedom, care of your local postmaster. That's crusade for freedom, care of your local postmaster. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. Chester. 
Chester. I'm back here, Mr. Dillon. Well, come out front, huh? Yes, sir. You picked a mighty poor time to ride out to Fort Dodge, if you don't mind me saying so. Tell me what happened, Chester. I hear that you witnessed it. Yes, sir, I was right there, Mr. Dillon. Grigo agged him into drawing first. Yeah. Self-defense again, is that it? Yes, sir. The poor fellow was awful slow. And you know what Crego did? What? Well, he shot him in the gun arm first, and then through both knees. And finally, he shot him in the belly and killed him. There was nothing I could do once they'd started. Yeah. Who was he, Chester? A fellow named Lydacker that told me. Some stranger. Huh? Why don't you run Crego out of town? Ah, uh, running him out of Dodge would just mean he'd go murder somebody someplace else, Chester. Well, at least he wouldn't be doing it here. Yeah, I know. But somehow I... I'd feel responsible for letting him get away. Vermins like that oughtn't be allowed to live. Ah, uh, they wouldn't be alive if he wasn't so careful about picking the man he shoots. No, sir. Oh, say, Doc was down a little while ago. Huh? He's through with autopsy and wants to know who's going to bury that fellow. Did he have any friends? Yes, sir. That cowboy Krigo tried to fight Jesse Hill. Oh. I think he was a friend of his. He helped carry him up to docks anyway, and he seemed real mad about it all. Quiet, you know, but mad. Oh. That could lead to trouble. How do you mean? Well, Jesse backed off from Krigo once, but uh, he might go looking for him now. I don't think he'd have a chance. And we'd sure better find him, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, Chester, we better... Come on. Maybe Jesse left town, Mr. Dillon. Well, I hope so. Though we haven't looked at every place yet. Somebody said he had a room at the Dodge house. Oh? Seems to be pretty fancy for a line writer, doesn't it? He probably spent six months' pay in the last few days. They always do. Well, they can't spend it out on a prairie, Chester. I guess it doesn't mean much to them. Yeah, I know, but you'd think they'd save a little money, a few dollars at least. Oh. Uh, tell me something, Chester. Hmm? When were you at the bank last? Well, I keep my money in my sock, Mr. Dillon. It's safer. Oh, oh, maybe, yeah. Isn't that kind of tough on the merchants when you go to spend it, though? Well, nobody ain't turned it down yet. Money's money. Wait a minute. There's Jesse across the plaza there. Yeah, and that's Krigo he's talking to. Come on. Hey, it looks like they're having an argument, Mr. Dillon. Yeah. You going to stop it? Well, if I can Crego! Jesse! They're about to fight, Mr. Dillon. You murdered him, Crego. Long draw. Hold it, Jesse! All right, Crego. Put your gun away. Sure. He tried to shoot me, Marshal. You saw him. He's dead, Mr. Dillon. Well, that was pretty easy for you. Wasn't it, Crego? He shouldn't have tried it, Marshal. I told him not to. You're lying. I heard what you told him. Well, what difference does it make? He drew first. I shot him in self-defense. Yeah, sure. Crego, did you know that man you killed the other night was Jesse Hill's friend? Jesse was telling me that just now. Well, I got an idea. You talked him into drawing just to work Jesse up to a fight. He was both a couple of bums, Marshal. How about that man on the prairie? Was he a bum? What man? The one that was lying wrapped in his blanket. I don't know what you're talking about, Marshal. Krigo. How long you been killing people? Marshal? I killed my first man when I was 18. Fellow tried to knife me, so I shot him. I'll tell you something else. 
I ain't wanted by the law. Nowheres. Nowheres at all. Did you ever fight a man who can handle a gun? What do you mean? You will someday, Krigo. You'll make a mistake and pick on the wrong man. Will I, Marshal? Oh, I'm going to go and get me a drink. Ain't there nothing you can do about him, Mr. Dillon? Now, there's one thing I can do, Chester. At first, we'll get Jesse and his friend buried. Rigo still standing at the bar of the Alpha Ganson, Mr. Dillon. All right, Chester. You gonna take him in? No. I'd just have to turn him loose sooner or later. Well, what are you going to do? Something I've never done before, Chester. But if it works, it'll save some lives. How? Well, you'll see. He was bragging about already killing two men since he's been in Dodge. Well, he'll go right on killing men if he isn't stopped. He's like one of them hound dogs that gets a taste of blood in his mouth and, and sort of goes crazy with it, ain't he? Yeah, that's what he's like. Okay. Here we are. Is there anything you want me to do, Mr. Dillon? Yes, there is, Chester. What? Well, you'll know when the time comes. But stay out of the way. Yes, sir. Frigo. What do you want now, Marshal? I've been thinking about you, Krigo. And I've decided that uh, you're not fit to live. You, you got no call, Marshal. I killed them men in self-defense. Sure. Ain't no court in the world that would convict me. I'm plumb innocent. I'm not talking about hanging you. What are you talking about? Krigo, I'm going to walk out of here and wait for you in the street. And I'm going to wait one minute. And if you're not there in one minute, I'm coming back. What for? I'm going to kill you. No. No, I ain't going to fight you. Yes, you are. One minute, Krigo. You, you killed him. Yeah. He had his gun out. He, he'd have shot you right in the back. Thanks for letting me know, Chester. Oh, oh my goodness. Is that what you wanted me to do? Yeah, that was it. Well, suppose I hadn't saw him. Now well, then Krigo would have killed another man. I feel kind of sick. <laughs> you did fine, Chester. Now remember, Chester, it was more than one life you just saved. Gunsmoke, under the direction of Norman McDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by John Meston, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Vic Perrin, Howard Culver, and Richard Deacon. Harley Bear is Chester, and Georgia Ellis is Kitty. Gunsmoke has been selected by the Armed Forces Radio Service to be heard by our troops overseas. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal... Fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in gun smoke. Tomorrow 
night on most of these stations, observing the end of Amos and Andy's 26th year of entertaining America, Jack Benny, Bing Crosby, Edward R. Murrow, and Lowell Thomas join a distinguished cast in tribute to Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll, the men who are Amos and Andy. Tomorrow evening on CBS Radio, don't miss this star-studded Amos and Andy anniversary show. George Walsh speaking. For mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. Final Net for five good reasons. One, Final Net is not an aerosol. It's concentrated with a hole that really lasts. Two, it holds without stickiness. Three, it goes where you want it. Four, Final Net has no aerosol propellants. Five, this much Final Net goes as far as this much aerosol. Use non-aerosol Final Net. It's as easy as one, two, three, four, five. America's favorite miser is coming up next. It's the Jack Benny program. J.D. Tell The Jello program. Phil Harris and his orchestra open the program with Song of the Marines from the picture The Singing Marine. <laughs> After week, I've been saying to you good people, get genuine Jello. o accept no substitute. Look for the big red letters on the box. Well, there's a good reason for this, and I'll tell you just why it is so important. Those big red letters spell Jell-O, and the name Jell-O is a trademark, the property of General Foods. So when you see the name Jell-O on the package, you know you are getting the genuine article made by General Foods. There is only one Jell-O. If you hear any other flavored gelatin dessert referred to as Jell-O, you will know that this is incorrect. The way to be sure that you are getting Jell-O's extra rich fruit flavor is to insist on the real thing. And the trademark Jell-O is your guarantee that you are getting genuine Jell-O. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Don Wilson speaking. I'd like nothing better than to introduce Jack Benny at this point for a half hour of fun. But I am indeed sorry to have to tell you that Jack is confined to a bed with a severe case of flu and will not be able to appear tonight. Mary won't let anyone else act as nurse, so she's giving him expert care, and we expect to have him back with us next week as hale and hearty as ever. So Phil Harris, Kenny Baker, and I will try to carry on with the assistance of Trudy Wood who very graciously offered to work with us in Jack's absence. So uh, now let's get on with the show. Are you ready, Phil? I'm always ready and no crack. Mm, I see. Hello, Don. Well, hello, Kitty. I don't want to say hello again, and I don't know anything else to say, so maybe I better sing. Well, have you a good song to pep Jack up? Pep Jack up? Well, what's the matter with him? Why, he has a bad attack of the flu, and he's home in bed. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Well, we all are, Kenny, but what's the name of the song you're going to sing? You Are My Love. I wrote it all by myself with somebody else. Hmm. <laughs> well, what are the names of the people who wrote it? Kenny Baker and Don Honrath. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Baker singing the song that he wrote with Don Honrath. <laughs>
desire holding you fills me with fire and something here beating within my heart tells me that you are my love you're so sweet such a dear armful loving you couldn't be harmful here we are your heart to my heart it's part of me you are my love sweetheart this evening's complete Jenny, really, that was really swell. You think Jack liked it? I'm sure he did. I'll bet he's just itching to get back here on the program right now. Here's where I play my next tune, Don. Hey, you're pretty sure about that, Phil, aren't you? How do you know? Well, if I don't, you'll have to do a lot of ad-libbing. <laughs> All right, Phil, you win. What's, uh, what's it going to be? Because my baby says it's so. I see. That's another medley for our melody, rather, from the singing Marine, isn't it? All right. much, Phil. Thank you. Oh, hello, Trudy. Hello, Don. Hey, Don, that girl looks exactly like Trudy Wood. Well, it is. Oh. <laughs> well, Trudy, I want to thank you for coming over here tonight. It's, it's really mighty fine of you. It's a pleasure, Don, and I hope Jack Benny is back with you again next week. We all join you on that, Trudy, and uh, we're sure that he will be. What are you going to sing for us tonight? Never in a million years. Oh, from the picture Wake Up and Live, Miss Trudy Wood. <laughs> Never in a million years could 
Trudy, really it was, and very swell. Thank you very much. Say, Don, I always wanted to be an announcer. May I announce the next tune? No, Kenny, no. Oh, all right for you. Oh, <laughs> I see. You're going to pout about it. Well, if that's the way you feel, go right ahead. You announce this next number. Thanks. Say, what, what's the name of it, Don? Phil Harris playing a brand new tune on the Isle of Kitchimacoco. Play, Phil. Oh, boy, can I announce. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Jack. What? Jack? What do you mean, Jack? My name's Wilson. <laughs> I have to give Jack <laughs> oh, a hug someplace. I see. <laughs> well, what have you for us now, Phil? <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm going to wait till you kids make up. <laughs> Go right ahead, Phil. It's okay. <laughs> I got an orchestra number dedicated to Jack Benny when he starts ribbing me. Well, what is it, Phil? <laughs> that foolish feeling. <laughs> well, swell, and I hope you feel just that way when Jack comes back next week. <laughs> Thank you. 
That was Phil Harris feeling foolish on one of the nicest cases of embarrassment that I've ever heard. Bill. Thanks, Don, for that broken down <laughs> com compliment. <laughs> All right, you can go over there now while I introduce you again. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present the piece de resistance for Phil Harris, Phil Harris's family, his wife, and all his friends who wired to listen in. Phil himself, not an imitation, singing Nobody. When skies seem full of clouds with rain And I'm all filled with naught but pain who soothes my thumping, thumping brain? Nobody. Then when that winter comes with all that snow and sleet, yeah, I am all hungry and I got cold feet. Who says, why don't you come on in here, bud? Can't you see we're fixing to eat? Nobody. I ain't never done nothing. I ain't never done a solitary thing to nobody, as far as I know. And I know very well that I ain't never got myself nothing from nobody at uh, no time. So until I gets myself something from somebody at some time, I ain't gonna do nothing. For nobody at uh, no time. Now when summer comes so cool and clear, and my friends sort of see me edging there, who says, why don't you break down and come on in here? Can't you see we fixing to have a beer? Mm, nobody. And then when I try so awful hard and I schemes and plans to keep going around looking just as sharp as I can. Who says, oh, have a look, have a look, look at that handsome man. Not a single soul. <laughs> then when all day long things kind of go amiss, you all know how they do. And I go on out home expecting to find a little bliss who trips up to me lightly and plants upon my cheek a glowing kiss? Uh-uh. You know, folks, I had a steak. I mean, a pretty. Been some time ago. I took that sauce bottle and worked out on it pretty good, but oh. Uh, who says you better look out what you're doing, boy, because that sauce is Tabasco. Mm, nobody. Can't understand it, I ain't done nothing. Can you hear me? I ain't molested or irrigated around with no one. That's right. And you know yourself, folks, that there ain't nobody in the habit of coming up and giving you anything nowadays, kind of offhand like, is it? Well, until I get myself something from somebody at some time, hear ye, hear ye. I ain't gonna do nothing for nobody at uh, no time. Because I believe in that old saying, let us do unto the others as we would have the others do unto us. Yeah. <laughs> This land that show was something. <laughs> Where'd you get the knowledge? Hey, Kenny, you know, I'm supposed to say that. I know, but I did so well on my other announcements. Well, if you're going to announce and Phil Harris sings, then I'm going to pep Jack Benny up by singing myself. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now say... Phil Harris and his orchestra playing Southern Hospitality song is still the same as Signature Turn Off the Moon, period. <laughs> oh, yuck. Nice going, Kenny. You saved Jack from a relapse. <laughs>
seem sore about it should fill us, Ed. Well, gee whiz, I, I don't know why. I can't sing. I bet the singing teacher could tell you. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, Don. Don't you guys fight. What do you feel so badly about? Well, if Don feels so bad, maybe I better announce the next number. Oh, no, you won't. No, you won't, Kenny. I may not be able to sing on this program, but I'm still the announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Baker will now sing, as only he can, one of the most charming and popular songs of the season, September in the Rain. Gee, what an announcement. I bet this is going to be good. <laughs> people say that one of the nicest things about a dinner is the last course, and that's certainly true when you serve this grand dessert. Ice cream, real rich ice cream made with jello ice cream powder. It's the quick, modern, easy way to make delicious ice cream, and you make it right in the freezing trays of your refrigerator. Though, if you prefer, you can get the same grand results by using an ordinary hand freezer. And women all over the country are delighted with jello ice cream powder. Just listen to what Mrs. N.J. McDonald of St. Joseph, Missouri has to say. Jello ice cream powder produces the finest ice cream our family has ever tasted. It's so easy to make, and when company comes in, we are always prepared with a delicious dessert. I just want to thank you for this splendid product. Well, that's a mighty fine letter, and we appreciate it and all the others that are coming in. And you'll feel the same way about Jello ice cream powder, too, when you taste the delicious ice cream it makes. Ice cream made and less cost. So order Joser tomorrow. This is the last number of the 34th program of the current Jell-O series, and the cast joins me wholeheartedly in wishing Jack Benny a very speedy and complete recovery so that next week he and Mary Livingston will be back here as well and jolly as ever to say to you, good night, folks. K-E-L-L. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. America's been waiting for a family show about a real family. Maybe you're just old-fashioned. 
Yeah, maybe. <laughs> a show that reveals the joys and the sorrows. You better all dig down and find your pennies because this family could be in deep financial trouble. The triumphs and the defeats of real people. Mary, would you lay off him? He's just trying to do his job. The Bradfords are the family. Eight is Enough is the show. Right after Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. Lux Radio Theater brings you another classic story coming up next. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward G. Robinson in Bullets or Ballots with Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. Lux presents Hollywood. Bullets or ballots? This is the question answered in tonight's play, the vivid drama of a battle against racketeers. Screened by Warner Brothers, you'll hear it starring Edward G. Robinson, Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger, while our special guest is Frank B. Gompert, nationally known criminologist. Louis Silvers conducts our music. Just a word before hearing from our producer. A man notices when a woman is fresh and sweet, really dainty, he may not know why, but he knows it's nice to be near her. And charming Loretta Young tells you, men fall for skin that's sweet. A Lux toilet soap beauty bath is the best way I know to protect daintiness. Makes you sure. Loretta Young, like many other screen stars, uses her complexion soap, Lux toilet soap, as a bath soap, too. Its rich, active lather carries away perspiration, every trace of dust, dirt. Leaves the skin really fresh and sweet. Make a Lux Toilet Soap Bath your daily beauty bath. And now, the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Racketeering is a comparatively new word in the American language, but an old bugbear in American history. Following the Revolution... American vessels in the Mediterranean were plundered and their crews thrown into slavery so frequently that the United States, to continue commerce in those waters, signed a treaty with the pirate's ruler, the Sultan of Algiers. Uncle Sam paid $800,000 for the ransom of imprisoned sailors and for years paid an additional $23,000 annually as a guarantee for future safety until our Navy under Stephen Decatur forever ended this racket of the Barbary pirates. Today's racketeers, dealing in millions of dollars, would scorn the modest sums involved in historical racketeering. And only by militant public resistance, such as that shown in tonight's play, Bullets or Ballots, can America purge herself of these internal parasites. In his screen characterizations, Edward G. Robinson has often lived outside the law. But tonight he walks a straight and narrow path as he pins a badge inside his coat and becomes, as he did in the picture, Detective Johnny Blake. An established air personality, because of his own program, Big Town, this fast-talking, fist-swinging favorite is from Warner Brothers Studio and will soon appear in Confessions of a Nazi Spy. In Bullets or Ballots, you saw another brilliant performance by one of the screen's best bad men, Humphrey Bogart, who likes playing villains, and tonight resumes the part of Bugs Brenner. In our glamour division, there's the statuesque Mary Astor, who brings her loveliness and talent to the role of Lee Morgan. Otto Kruger displays his genius for the sinister and changes only his first name in playing Al Kruger. We raise the curtain now, and the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward G. Robinson in Bullets or Ballots with Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. A radio station in a large eastern city. At a table in one of the smaller studios... A man reads quietly from a typewritten page. Behind the glass enclosure, the radio engineer sends the speaker's voice out across the city, into the homes of listening millions. The man nears the end of his speech. And so, ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, there are a thousand rackets. Rackets which are forcing prices beyond the reach of the poor. Looting business, food, laundry, poultry, dry cleaning. And still the American people let the racketeer go free. Men like Al Kruger, protected against the law, return from mock trials to collect their share of the $200 million plunder taken each year from this city alone. And again I say, these rackets must be stopped. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been ordered by the Crime Combine to discontinue these broadcasts. 
The gentleman who phoned added, or else. For his information, I shall continue to broadcast regularly. And my papers will continue their present policy of open attack on racketeers and directors of organized crime who are the really dangerous enemies of society. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to Mr. Ward Bryant and his March Against Crime. Mr. Bryant will be heard again at this stage. Good night, Mr. Bryant. Good night, Joe. That was a fine speech tonight, Mr. Bryant. I heard it on the speaker down here in the hall. How'd you like it? Get me a cab, will you, Joe? Sure. Yes, sir. You sure have the right angle on this racketeer business. I... Hey, look out! Look out, Mr. Bryant! Look out! Mr. Bryant! Mr. Bryant! Help! Hey, uh, paper! Ward Bryant killed! Editor Dr. Crusading editor murder! Gang bullets get burned! Ward Bryant killed! Gangster car! Cigar, cigarette, cigar, cigarette, cigar. Who is it? It's me, Miss Lee. Hyman, can I come in? Come in. Evening, Miss Lee. How are you, Herman? They said you was in your office. So why are you surprised? How are the collections today, Herman? Oh, just fine, Miss Lee. You really got something in this numbers game. It's going to catch on up here in the Bronx even better than it did in Harlem. Here, here's one day's collection. <laughs> did you have to bring it all in nickels, Herman? No, ma'am. Oh, there's two other bags, too. Green money. Mm, that's very nice. Yes, ma'am. You know, if it keeps on coming in like this, you can sell this cabaret and move right into Park Avenue. Thanks. We'll stick to the cabaret and the Bronx. Bye, Herman. See you tomorrow. Uh, uh, say, there was something else I wanted to tell you. Never mind. It'll come. Oh, oh, I remember. Yeah, I, I saw Mr. Blake when I come in. Blake? Yeah, that detective fellow. Where was he? In the bar. The bar? Is he drinking? Yeah. What's happened downtown? Any extras out? Oh, yeah, yeah. That publisher was murdered. The one name... That uh, explains it. Oh, let's see. The name was... Uh, Never mind, Herman. Um... Sit down and rest. Oh, I got it. Brian. Thanks. Hello, Johnny. Oh, hello, eh? Sit down a while. Don't mind if I do. Guess it's all right for the boss to chin with a guy she hasn't seen in months. How have you been, Johnny? Okay. Why didn't you let me know you were here? I was busy reading this about Brian. Hmm. That was real brave killing, wasn't it? Hmm. Did you know him? Yeah, a little. Swell fellow. Had a swell wife and kid. It'll be plenty tough on him. Wife and kid, huh? Yeah. You're a funny person, Johnny. When you come out of your shell, you're really human. But I don't like to see decent people pushed around. When something big breaks down there in your old stamping ground, it gets under your skin, doesn't it? What makes you think so? It's the only time I ever see you take a drink. Oh, no, say, this is just a celebration. I found out who stole Mrs. Blousemeyer's laundry. Oh, that must have been something. It was. You weren't on the level. Sure, I've been transferred up here now regular. Well, for... That's a fine finish for a police career, isn't it? Trying to find stolen laundry in the Bronx. Well, it's better than being pension off with the fire horses. Well, I'm not kidding myself. It's no use. I'm no use to them downtown anymore. Well, with things like this Bryant killing going on, it looks like they need you plenty. They ought to have your whole flying squad back in action. Oh, no. They don't believe in kicking the rats in line anymore. Nowadays, you're supposed to kiss them and tuck them in. Your friend McLaren doesn't think so. Well, McLaren's only a captain. Say, he takes orders, too. So you just go along staying loyal to McLaren and the police department. Yeah, that's about it. And looking for laundry. Sure. Someday, Mac will be back up on top. Then you won't have to worry about me anymore. Um, Johnny, who killed Bryant? Al Kruger. You sure of it? It wasn't Al himself. One of his stooges. Uh, Bugs Brenner, maybe. How do you know? Uh, Kruger had the most to lose by a cleanup. He controls every racket in town. Yeah, not the numbers. The numbers? <laughs> yeah, that's small time. If it ever gets big enough, he'll grab her just like he's grabbed everything else. He's got another organization, that guy. Crime Incorporated. Protected right down the line. They can't lay a finger on him until we find out who's behind him. The higher-ups who see to it that he gets away with anything he wants, including murder. I wish they'd let you take a crack at this job. <laughs> Why? Feeling sorry for me? Maybe. Or maybe it's just because I hate to see a swell guy eating his heart out. Oh, forget it, will you? Well, uh, see you around. When, Johnny? It's a long time between your visits. I'll make it soon. Swell. Hey, I thought you didn't let mugs into this place. I don't when I know them. Well, look who's coming in. Who is he? Crail. 
I sent him up to Sing Sing a couple of years ago. Well, well, well. Hello, Detective Blake. Uh, the parole board turned you loose on the public again, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> no thanks to you. Well, I hear they cut down the big shot detective down to size. Gee, it must be tough not to be able to kick the boys around anymore and make them tip their hats to you. Yeah, but well, they still do. <laughs> to a Bronx flatfoot? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and as long as I'm part of the force, they'll keep on tipping their hats. Remember it next time. All right, everybody, it's all over. Bugsy, throw that guy out. Music, Harry. <laughs> Well, I guess to go downtown see what's going on. You haven't lost the mental touch, have you, Johnny? See you soon. Don't hurt your knuckles. What do you want? I want to see Al Kruger. Yeah? Blake's the name. Detective Blake. Oh. Wait a minute. Hey, Al. Well, Johnny Blake. Dick. Johnny Blake? Come in, Johnny. All right, Vinci, get out. Hello, Al. How are you, Johnny? Sit down. Yeah, a big night for you, huh? Working overtime? Yeah, that happens a lot. Oh, your rackets must be doing all right. Yeah, about 5,000 last week. <laughs> 500,000, you mean? <laughs> Maybe. I can't count that high. You got it? Thanks. I thought you were homesteading the Bronx. What are you doing in this neck of the woods? Oh, just poking around the old hangout. What do you think of Brian's death? Mm, I was just reading about it. It's too bad. He's a fine fellow. Yeah. They'll probably blame it on you, Al. You're telling me. A couple of the boys are up here from headquarters a half hour ago. They were very nice about it, though. Yeah, that's the trouble. They have to be. You'd have taken me around the corner and rolled up a newspaper. Yeah, I guess I would. But I didn't get much out of you the last time I gave you going over. <laughs> you came close to it. Yeah, I wish I'd known it at the time. You'd have gotten some more. I wanted to get you on that rap. Yeah, good old days. Yeah. You've traveled a long way since then. Would have gone a long way, too. You'd thrown in with me the first time I asked you. Mm-hmm. Maybe I would. Listen, you'd, you'd been a great help to this business, Johnny. You know more about the inside of this town than any bird that ever lived in it. But if I'd thrown in with you, Al, I'd have done it to nail you. No, you wouldn't. You'd never double-cross anyone in your life. Even a crook if he told you something in confidence. You rode the pants off of all of us, but you always let us know where we stood. And you've always known what I thought of you. Yeah, but you're the only fella I'd take it from. Listen, I still want you to throw in with me, Johnny. I'll stick with the department. After all the kicking around they've given you? Mm Mm-hmm. You're a chump. All you'll ever get out of it is a petty larceny pension. I could do more for you in a year than you learn in a lifetime on the force. Well, maybe I'd like to make my money the hard way. Well... No, probably still be asking you ten years from now. If you live that long. Hey, Al, you see the papers about... <clears throat> hey, what's he doing here? Well, it isn't Bugs Brenner. I was forgetting out of here, Blake. Hold your horses, Bugs. I asked Johnny here. Now, never mind, Al. Bugs hasn't been able to forget the week he spent in the hospital after he took that swing at me. I don't think much of him either. I'll see you around. Oh, uh, I forgot to compliment you, Bugs. Nice, clean job you did on Brian. What are you talking about? Nothing yet. Good night, Al. Hey, what's he talking about? As if you didn't know your ten-cent thug. I told you to leave Brian alone. I don't know anything about him. What's the matter with him? Is he, is he dead? Yes, he's dead, and you did it. I pulled you off a truck, and you pay me back by taking a chance on ruining a hundred million dollar gold mine. Well, someday you'll get wise to the fact that the strong arm stuff went out with prohibition. You're not running liquor anymore. You're in big business. Sit down. Hello? Plaza 9, 5, 4, 7, 2. That's right. We've just seen the extra, Mr. Kruger. Please come to see us at once, tonight. Yes, sir. Right away. Well, that ought to satisfy you. Hey, who is that? The big fellas? The first time they've called in six months, and when they call at this time of the night, it means they're going to rake me over plenty. They're liable to pull the props out from under me for this Brian mess. Well, if they do, it'll be the last thing that'll happen to me. Hey, Al, who are these fellas? Who are they, Al? If you knew, you wouldn't sleep much tonight. Now, beat it. (laughs) And the killing of one leader, Mr. Ward Bryant, cannot stop these broadcasts. The march against crime will continue. Faithful to the memory of one who died in the service of the people. Miss Lee. Shut up, Herman. I want to hear you. The first step has already been taken. 
A new police commissioner was recommended by the grand jury last week. A man with a splendid record and fine reputation for honesty and integrity. We are pleased at this time to inform our listeners that the appointment was ratified today. The new police commissioner of this city is Mr. Franklin McLaren. Mr. Mc... Herman. Yes, ma'am? Get Mr. Blake on the phone. Circle 0461. Yes, ma'am. C, I... Say, that's what I've been meaning to tell you uh, about Mr. Blake. Well, what? Well, Mr. Blake got fired from the police force this morning. Fired? Someone's kidding you. No, no, it's true. You ask him. This Mr. McLaren started a big shakeup, and they fired a lot of fellas. But he was depending on McLaren. Well, you ask him, Miss Lee. Oh, now, where was I? Oh, oh yes, see? I... Uh, uh, wait, never mind calling. I'll, I'll run over and see him. Well. Hello, Johnny. Well, how are you, Lee? I never thought you'd get over this way. Well, should we just stand here and swing on the door? No, uh, no, come on in. Well, what are you in an uproar about? Herman said you were fired. That's right. Yeah, sit down, make yourself comfortable. Who did it? McLaren. And you were the one that was telling me that when McLaren got on top, everything would be just fine and dandy. Well, I was wrong. Sure. It's about time you got wise to yourself. Around this town, the only reason friends pat you on the back is to find an easy place to break it. Well, you're a friend, aren't you? I guess you're dumb enough to think so. No, no, I'm not dumb, Lee. You like me pretty well. That goes both ways. Women and home life had been in my line. And I'd have fallen for you a long time ago. Hmm. Would have been sort of nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. It wasn't in the cards, Lee. Yeah. Can't beat the cards, can you? No. Um, you didn't get enough salary to save much, did you, Johnny? Oh, I'll get along. Suppose you'll be looking for a job. Mm-hmm. I, uh, thought you might like to come in with me and help me run the numbers game. What? You've got all the help you need. Oh, I won't have. It's getting bigger all the time. Some weeks it brings in ten to twelve thousand. Twelve thousand? From that penny ante game? Yeah. Well, the last time you told me about it, you were only getting in a few hundred. I know, but they're crazy about it in Harlem, and now it's going over in the Bronx. Oh, please come in and help me run it, Johnny. You could do a swell job of building it up. You'd make a lot of money for both of us. Yeah, pretty regularly. You'll do it? No, not a chance. Any money I made would be just coming out of your pocket. I don't take money away from women. Johnny? Hiya, Johnny. Hi, Louie. You missed a sweet bottle, Johnny. Yeah, well, that's too bad. Yeah, your pal McLaren liked it a McLaren? lot. McLaren? Is he here? Yeah, right over there, see? Oh, yeah, thanks. See you later. Hello, Mr. McLaren. Oh, hello, John. Ah, uh, congratulations on your new job. Yeah, thanks, John. They told me you were trying to see me today. Sorry I was busy. Oh, it's okay. I can say it now. I just wanted to thank you for the kick in the teeth. What? What? Hey, hey, hey come hey, here, Blake. I got him, Commissioner. Yeah, take your hands off. You me. can't suck the Commissioner and expect to get away with it. Will you prefer charges, Commissioner? No, just throw him in the street. Yeah. You want another drink, Johnny? Mr. Blake, to you. Uh, sure, sorry. I'll freshen this one up. Hello, Johnny. Hmm? Oh, uh, hello, Al. Mind if I sit down? I just came from the fights. Yeah, I saw you when I went in. You don't miss much, do you? Uh, it's a habit. How was the main event? They ought to have had you in the ring. That was a sweet punch, Johnny. Al yeah, McLaren had it coming to him. Yeah, finally he washed up, eh? Yeah, plenty. A lot of thanks you got from McLaren and the public. Yeah, not even that petty larceny pension you were talking about. Now on, I'm going to see what it's like looking out for number one. Uh, that offer is still open, Johnny. I'd like to have you in with me. Doing what? I like it a hunch we're in for some trouble. With McLaren and that grand jury on a tear, if there's any weak spots in the organization, i got to find them now. You'd be the first one to spot them. I want you to look over the whole setup, and the only one you answer to is me. You've got a lot of confidence in me. Uh, I've heard fellas you've sent to prison say that if you ever made a deal, you'd see yourself dead before you'd go back on it. Yeah? How about it? Okay, Al. It's a deal. Good. <laughs> We 
have come to the end of the first act of Bullets or Ballots, starring Edward G. Robinson, Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. The curtain will go up on Act Two after our short intermission. But now, here's something that happened recently, which I would like to have you hear. You better hurry, Mary. We're going to be late. All right, just a moment. Gosh, you've been primping for an hour now. Don't exaggerate. I'm coming. Don't be cross, Bill. Well, hello. I thought you'd never show up. Say, you look wonderful. Mm, you like it? Like what? <laughs> the hat, of course. Gosh, the hat. Sure, I like it. But I like what's under it better. How about a little kiss? Come on, let's get going. I'm going to be so proud. There's nothing like a smooth, soft complexion to make a new spring hat do its best. And as a matter of fact, the best-looking spring hat in the world can't do much for the woman who's been careless about her skin. The woman who's let cosmetic skin develop. Dullness, t- little blemishes, and large pores. That's why clever women everywhere take the screen stars tip. They use cosmetics all they like, but they're always careful to remove them thoroughly with Lux Toilet Soap. This mild white soap that nine out of ten screen stars use has active lather. Let it help you keep skin smooth and soft, lovely to look at, nice to touch. Mr. DeMille. Act two of Bullets or Ballots, starring Edward G. Robinson with Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. Fired from the police force, Johnny Blake has gone over to the racketeers as a working part of Al Kruger's crime combine. But now an outraged citizenry demands action. Swiftly and without warning, the new police commissioner cracks down. McLaren Dynamite Racketeers! Police start clean up! Loan sharks routed! Laundry racket smashed! McLaren raids jewelry fences! One by one, the rackets fold, and thousands of dollars are turned back to the taxpayers. In a hotel room, Joe Vinci, the latest racketeer to feel the lash, savagely reads the headlines. Police raid jewelry fences. 200,000 in diamonds recovered. 200 grand. Well, that fixes my business plenty. Ah, you ain't getting it any harder than the others. It's phony to me. The cops couldn't have found those hideouts without somebody tipping them off, and I'm going to find out who's doing it. You don't have to look very far. All this has happened since Blake got in. What are you talking about, Blake? I'm talking about Blake. I'm going to ask him a few questions. Hello, Louie. This is Bugs. (laughs) Let me speak to Blake. Yeah, yeah, Bugs. You just drove over to the bank with Al. Oh, yeah? Well, when he gets back, I want to see him right away. Sorry, you'll have to move that car. This is a no parking zone. Forget it, copper. This car belongs to Al Kruger. <laughs> Thanks. Want me to put your name or his on the ticket? You write a ticket for Al Kruger and he'll tie that nag of yours upside down. Hey, what goes on? What's the idea of the ticket, Alan? What's it to you, Mr. Blake? What's the matter? Afraid McLaren will fire if you don't get rid of all those parking tags? Oh, no, he's already weeded the rats out of the department. You wouldn't like to climb down off that horse of yours for a minute, would you, Donlan? I'd be glad to. Hey, now, wait a minute. Take it easy, Johnny. Well, I'm off. What do you want to make of it? Please! Hey, now, wait a minute. Johnny, cut it! Come on, How's that, Donlan? Come on, let's get it. The department wants lilies, huh? You need a horse to be a cop, do you? You face rat! This goes for the whole floor. There you are. Come on! Johnny Blake, come on, Johnny. Come on, you had enough work for your fist today. Well, it took two of you to do it, as usual. Shut up! You all right, Donlan? Yeah, call the wagon. Yeah, call the wagon. Get a whole squad to take me in. Yo, tell Al, if he wants me at that meeting on time, better rush the lawyer now. All right, in here, you. Thanks. Now, someday, McCoy, I'll run into one of you boys when you're alone. I'll mark off the days on my calendar. How are you, Johnny? Well, hello, Mr. McLaren. How'd you get in here ahead of me? Well, they sent me word that you were on the way. Did I sock Donlan too hard? Well, you didn't do him any good. Or me either that night at the fights. <laughs> you ought to learn to pull those punches of yours, Johnny. Well, if I'd have pulled them, it'd look phony. How's your jaw? <laughs> Still in a sling. <laughs> well, what you stop the fuss for this time? Well, I had to see alone. This was the only way I could manage it. Well, what happens next? I wish I knew. Uh, here, uh, here's another report. The whole poultry racket down through names and addresses. It's the plan of a garage, uh, their business headquarters, and so on. I'm afraid it won't do much good, though, except for raids. Well, that's good enough for the time being. We're well, doing pretty well on your information, Johnny. Yes, yeah, so I've been reading in the papers. Did you find out who bosses Kruger? No, all I know is that there is somebody higher up, and he controls everything. 
Now, we can nail that bird. The whole works will fold up on the inside. Does Brennan know who it is? Yeah, nobody knows except Kruger. Well, do you think you'll ever get it out of him? <laughs> oh, not a chance. Well, well, uh, how are you working it? We've got to know. Now, look, uh, Brenner is Kruger's number one man. If anything happens to Kruger, and I'm going to see that it does, Brenner steps up. But I'm not going to let him because I'm going to step into Mr. Brenner's spot. How? But I don't know yet. Is that all you've got to tell me? Well, that's all now, except keep on smashing him as fast as you get my instructions. When the break comes, I'll know what to do. Until then, you've got to play the cards the way I deal them. There's only one thing, though, about it. What's tough. There's only one thing tough. T- tough. Well, what about it? What's that? Kruger. You know, he's just as much as a rat as the rest of them. He'd knock me off in a minute if you find out. And I'll hate to cross him. Because you haven't given him an even break? Yeah. Well, I haven't given you one either. We had another man on the force who tried to smash that mob. They threw acid in his face. His headlights don't burn anymore. I handed you a rotten job, Johnny. Well, I asked for it. Hey, all I know is handling mugs. I'd have come back to work for you if I had to ride a horse or hand out traffic tickets. I... Hi. Yeah? Kruger's lawyer's in the office with a room for you. Come on. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, so long, Mac. Uh, take care of yourself, Johnny. Sure, and as soon as I'm set, you'll hear from me. In the meantime, make them tip their hats. <laughs> You heard me, Al Blake. Nobody else but Blake. I tell you, the guy's double-crossed. He's like, right, Chief. Shut up! Now listen right. to me. I said shut up. That means you too, Bugs. I'm running this outfit. Yeah, but Chief, look, look, you got to give us a that. Good evening, gents. So, uh, thanks for the fast legal service, Al. What's the matter? What is this, a wake? It might be. Seen the papers? New racket raids, net 21. Hmm. Nice picture of McLaren. Yeah, the boys think you're working for him. I'm wondering. I'm not. Bug, shut up. What have you got to say, Johnny? Oh, sure, sure, Al. I just sold you right down the river. The cops said they were sorry they kicked me off the force. McLaren sent me a basket of flowers for hitting him on the jaw. Said if I want to come back, you give me the whole Bronx to wander around in. I wouldn't clown, Johnny. Oh, we're wise to you, Blake. You're through. Oh, no, I'm just starting. Hey, now listen, cop. Yeah, take your hands off. <laughs> I don't like guys that put their hands on me. Let's keep this a business meeting. All right. Start talking. Al, I went to work for you because you wanted help. I didn't come to you. You came to me. Now you think I crossed you. Why, I couldn't get a dime a dozen if I handed this whole mob over to the cops, and you know it. I can see now why you need help. Oh, and you need plenty of it. Al, are you going to let this guy talk his way out? Shut up! Keep talking, Johnny. <laughs> Uh, it never fails, does it? When mugs get in the jam, they always start off by knifing each other. Hey, I thought you were smart, Al. What would you suggest? Let McLaren have his fun. You can't stop him. As soon as he's made a showing, the grand jury will fold right up under him. They always do, you know that. Yeah, sure. And meanwhile, we sit back and wind up broke. No, spend your time building up new rackets. So that when McLaren comes up for air, he'll find a dozen more going. Just pull him right out of the hat, huh? No, go to work. Quit playing cops and robbers. Stop knifing each other. I suppose you've got a good racket in mind? Well... Name it. Sure, I've got one. Numbers. Go ahead. Now, what's the odds against picking the right number out of from one to a thousand? A thousand to one. That's it. We take the last three numbers of the racetrack payoff every day. The suckers try to guess it. And the payoff is 600 to one. Now, that is if anybody picks the right number. Now, a lot of people would try to pick that every day if one dollar would win them 600. Oh, what are you trying to sell us? That Penny Andy game Lee Morgan's running up in the Bronx and Harlem? Oh, they're so Penny Andy that she's picking up 12000 a week out of a few neighborhood stores. Most of the bets are nickels and dimes. Seven million people in this town, and all of them looking for easy money. You just offer them 600 for one and watch this thing spread like a four-alarm fire. And they won't be playing one number apiece. They'll be picking four or five. Now, if you want to control the winning number, you can pay off on racetrack bets and manipulate the totals. All it needs is organization. Now, you get a million people buying numbers every day, and this one racket will clean up 300 million a year. Why, it's easy. It's a cinch. Three hundred million. That's it. Did somebody say something about Penny Andy? All right, you fellas beat it. Mr. Blake and me want to talk business. Now, wait a minute. I said beat it! Okay, Mr. Kruger. Nice talking, Blake. Now, sit down, Johnny. You know, you're a pretty smart guy. Yeah? My mother used to say I was going to be president. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, 
Miss Lee. Miss Lee, I, I gotta see you right away. What's the matter, Herman? Where'd you get that shiner? Oh, uh, Miss Lee, it's important. Come inside. Well, Herman, spill it. Uh, well, they took the money away from me. The numbers money, the bag and everything. Who did? Uh, I don't know. Some men. They stopped me on the street. They, they told me to keep my face out of there. They said I, I couldn't even make collections no more. Oh, they did, did they? All right, sit tight, Herman. What are you going to do? They're mugs, Miss Lee. I'm going to tell Johnny Blake about it. He'll run these chisels right out the end of the 93rd Street dock. Mm. Wait here, I'll be right back. Oh, clerk, clerk. Yes, miss? I was told that Mr. John Blake had moved here. Oh, uh, that's correct. I'd like to see him, please. My name is Lee Morgan. Oh, I'm sorry, but Mr. Blake isn't in his room. He left just a moment ago. Oh, thanks. Yes, ma'am. Uh, evening. Evening. You looking for Johnny Blake? Why, uh, yes, I am. Well, my name's Brenner. Maybe I can help you. I've got to find him right away. Ain't you the Lee Morgan that runs the numbers game in the Bronx? Yes. <laughs> I hear they started running you out of it tonight. They won't get away with it. Ah, it's a dirty trick. I don't blame you for gunning for Blake. Gunning for him? Yeah. He's the one that's taking it over. Blake. You're a liar. He's grabbing it to put himself in strong with Al Kruger. Go in and ask him. He's in the coffee shop. Yeah? Thanks. Hello, Johnny. Oh. Lee. Well... Uh, sit down, Lee. Thanks, but I may not be staying long. No? What's on your mind? Just one thing. Are you taking over the numbers game, Johnny? Well, are you? Yes. Why? Well, I can't tell you. I see. And I tried to take you in with me. It sort of worked out better to toss it to the wolves, didn't it? Well, I, uh... Uh, uh, I thought they'd let you keep on running your end. I guess that wasn't poetry about friends finding an easy place to break the back. So long, Johnny. Good luck to you. Twenty, thirty, forty thousand, and one makes forty-one thousand. That's, that's your not... cut, Johnny. Hey, say, that's not so bad. <laughs> you earned it. That was a great idea, taking over the number. Sure was. By the way, you uh, better sink that cash in a safety deposit box. Don't put it in a regular account. No? Oh, sure. S uh, safe deposit. Yeah. I get it. Uh, is that what you do, Al? Yeah. Well, it's easy to get at. They can't trace it. <laughs> well, you and the bosses must have had to take over a vault. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where they put theirs, but they're plenty happy. Yeah, how about meeting them sometime? Hmm? Uh, not a chance. I'm the only one that knows who they are, and I guess they want it to stay that way. Well, I suppose you can't blame them. Well, good night, Al. Oh, uh, say, mm. uh, what would happen to them if uh, you got lost? Well, pick someone else and keep on going. Brenner, huh? No. It would probably be you. Me? Yeah. They think you're the best man I've got. But you wouldn't want it, Johnny. It's the top job, but it's the last one a guy ever holds. There's only one way out. Yeah, that's the payoff for helping them, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but don't worry about getting it. I don't intend to get lost. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, uh, good night. Good night. Hello? 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 Hello, McLaren. Yeah. Uh, this is Johnny Blake. I'm ready to go, Mac. Grab Kruger right away. Now, wait a minute. I can't trouble an arrest like that. Well, you've got to. And put him where nobody can get at him. Well, what are you going to do, Johnny? Well, I've got no time to answer questions. Well, wait a minute. That's not all. Crack down on Brenda Smith, Cracker. Break it up. Smash it. Do you hear? All right. Whatever you say. Well, thanks, Mac. You'll hear from me later. This is the last move. Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's intermission and guest time now, but first, a suggestion. 
Screen stars use Lux toilet soap to help care for million-dollar complexions. They use it as a bath soap, too, because it has active lather that leaves skin fresh and fragrant. Here's what Joan Blondell says. Use Lux toilet soap as a beauty bath. It's the best way I know to protect daintiness. You'll love it. Are you enjoying the luxury of a daily beauty bath with this white, gentle soap screen stars use? You'll love the delicate, clinging fragrance it leaves on your skin. You'll be sure of daintiness. Now, our producer. The battle that Johnny Blake is fighting in our play against racketeering and terrorism is being fought throughout the country by men like tonight's guest, Mr. Frank B. Gumpert, who matched the brawn and daring of gangsters with the relentless weapons of science. Mr. Gumpert is the criminologist in charge of the research laboratory of the Sheriff's Office of Los Angeles County. He's a policeman who fights not with machine guns, but with microscopes. Has a degree in law as a master of sciences and a doctor of philosophy. He's been technical director of several movies dealing with crime and has worked on some 8,000 cases, 80% of them murders. As a 20th century Sherlock Holmes, Mr. Gumpert, tell us uh, just how you do it. Well, we have to deal in chemistry, ballistics, physics, toxicology, and handwriting, Mr. DeMille. No one man can be outstanding in all fields. But a laboratory, combining experts in each field, can come pretty close to solving any crime. To me, one of the outstanding values of our laboratory is not its power to convict the guilty, but to free the innocent. Hundreds of times, evidence that might have otherwise convicted a perfectly innocent man, when examined in our laboratory, has freedom of every suspicion. I know you're perhaps the nation's greatest expert in solving crime with the evidence of human hair. While you, while you might have some difficulties with me, what can you uh, learn from those whose tresses are a bit more abundant? You'd do fine, Mr. DeMille, as long as you have a single hair left on your head. From that single hair, we can usually learn a man's approximate age, his environment, the places he visited recently, his type of employment, his personal habits, and frequently, his race. We can also learn a dozen things from a cigarette. A cigarette? Yes. Anyone who smokes a cigarette reveals secrets through the saliva that remains on the end, even though many months have elapsed since it was smoked. Saliva tells us what blood group the man who smoked the cigarette belongs to. There are 20 blood groups in which we deal, and often we can eliminate 19 out of 20 suspects by a blood grouping test. I, I see it's getting harder and harder to commit murder. Not to commit it, but to get away with it. But while we solve crimes, the public can do far more than we can do in preventing them. Don't be intimidated by the threats and boasts of racketeers. Every time you surrender, you betray not only yourself, but your neighbors and your community. At the first sign of a threat, get in touch with your local authorities. And now, ladies and gentlemen, just to prove what an ordinary piece of evidence may reveal, I gave Mr. Gompert a coat which I wore sometime yesterday. He examined it and is now going to tell exactly what he found out about me from that coat. You're sure you want me to go through with it? Yes, of course I do. We really don't have to, Mr. DeMille. Huh, backing out, are you? Okay, Mr. DeMille, you asked for it. I took your coat and last night beat out all the dust. Here's what it told me. Yesterday morning, you took a walk with a brunette between the ages of 20 and 25. An actress, probably a star. You stopped at Halchester's Flower Stop, bought an orchid, had lunch at the Brown Derby, and ate, among other things, a shrimp cocktail. Later you... No, went... no, 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 that, that, that's plenty, thanks. But uh, don't, don't try to tell me you learned that from my coat. You probably followed me. Sorry, you're wrong. Here's how it's done. A few black hairs on the coat told me the lady's age. And a preparation on the hair revealed that she had something to do with acting under powerful lights. I guessed she was a star instead of an extra because the face powder also found on the coat was very expensive. You were walking because if you had been riding... The powder would have been differently placed. It was in the morning, because that particular powder does not look well on a brunette at night. You went to Halchester's, because I found the pollen from a cymbidium, that is, a terrestrial orchid, and Halchester's about the only store carrying that kind. You went to the Derby, because I found a tiny spot of sauce used for a seafood cocktail, and it contained a trace of an herb, which I won't name, because the chef of the Derby claimed that it is part of his secret shrimp receipt. Yeah, you win, Mr. Gompert. Who was the girl? Well, <laughs> that's for you to reveal. Ah. <laughs> it happened to be my daughter, Catherine. <laughs> I have only one suggestion to make. The next time you go to the Derby for lunch, how about asking me along? <laughs> and thanks for the invitation here tonight. It's great to take you, Mr. Gamble. Great. And that's a date. 
Edward G. Robinson in Bullets or Ballots with Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. Confident that the higher-ups will choose him to replace Al Kruger, Johnny Blake has ordered the gangster's arrest. The trap is ready to spring, but Bugs Brenner arrives at Kruger's apartment first. He faces the leader, a revolver in his hand. Just at the end of Mr. DeMille's uh, uh, introduction, have a door open there. The market rate? In his hand. Face of the leader, revolver in his hand, door open. All right, Rudy, if you don't mind. Confident that the higher-ups will choose him to replace Al Kruger, Johnny Blake has ordered the gangster's arrest. The trap is ready to spring. But Bugs Brenner arrives at Kruger's apartment first. He faces the leader, a revolver in his hand. Well? Hello, Bugs. What are you doing over here? The cops just smashed my milk racket. And so? So I'm starting to take over the numbers game. No! That's awfully confused. R- Rudy, <coughs> after the shots and the groan, mm. you come up again, is that it? Yeah. Yeah. Into the drum roll. Mm. There's another. And then down. And then down. Uh, t- uh, hold it. You sustain that, will you? Yeah. Sustain that drum roll. We kind of take it out and bring in the sash over it, right? At the end, yeah. Yeah. Do you mind taking that once more? Okay. <coughs> Bank attention. Frank. Eddie, you want to play the tip for me? Frank. Frank. <laughs> Huh? Well, Rudy, I'll have to clap my hands so you get the effect of the shots. He's out of shots, I'm sorry. Hmm. He's out of shots. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What? What? Quiet. Yeah. Charlie, the first shot, a groan, and then bang, bang, bang. Instead of all together, you see? All right. Once more for Mr. Mills instruction. Confident that the higher-ups will choose him to replace Al Kruger, Johnny Blake has ordered the gangster's arrest. The trap is ready to spring, but Bugs Brenner arrives at Kruger's apartment first. He faces the leader, a revolver in his hand. Well... Hello, Bugs. What are you doing over here? The cops just smashed my milk racket. So? So I'm starting to take over the numbers game. Al Kruger slain. Racketeer found dead in hotel room. Who is it? Good morning, Miss Morgan. Oh, come in. Mr. Uh, Brenner, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. A lot of news in that paper. Yeah, who did it? I don't know. We're trying to find out. I thought he was your friend. He was. You don't seem very upset about it. <laughs> well, ain't no use crying if the dice fall that way. Well, what do you want? Hey, do you want to go back in the numbers game? What are you trying to do, kid me? Ah, you started the game. You ought to have a share in it. And I suppose Mr. Blake will let me have it. He'll have nothing to say about it. I'm running things from now on. If you want the Bronx and Harlem districts, they're yours. And if you need protection, you'll get it. Yeah, that sounds good. Too good. You don't trust me, huh? I don't trust anybody. <laughs> Neither do I. You know, we ought to work fine together. How about it? You're uh, going to take it away from Blake? Yeah. All right, go ahead and take it. Ah, that's the girl. Hey, uh, come on over here. We'll get along swell, you and me, huh? Yeah, in the numbers game. (laughs) Okay, okay. I called the boys for a meeting tonight. They don't know it yet, but they got a new boss. Now, we 
We'll find out who got Al sooner or later. We ain't got any time to waste worrying about it now. The question is, do I run this business from now on or don't I? That's all right with us. But the bosses might have something to say about it if we ever hear from them. I'll take care of that. Why didn't she ask Blake in on this here meeting? Because he isn't going to be so important from now on. He's the one that sold Al. I'm sitting back waiting for McLaren to run down. It ain't worked out that way. I'm going to put the rackets back in full swing whether there's trouble with McLaren or not. Sorry I'm late. What it? You holding an election, boys? It's already been held. Oh, and you're it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. You got any objections? A few. And what's the first one? The job was given to me. To wow. win. The boss has called me in two hours after the news broke. You expect us to believe that. I told him you might have a few doubts, but I couldn't persuade him to come down here and prove it. Yeah, who are they? Did Kruger tell you? No. But I think I'll keep sitting in this seat till I hear from them personally. Oh, sit anywhere you want to, but uh, don't try and stop me from carrying out orders. I have to take charge of the week's collection and have it to him by 10 o'clock tomorrow night. I'll meet you boys at the garage at 6. Oh, no, you won't. How do we know they called you? Yeah, how do we know? Because I'm telling you. Is that enough? No. I'll answer that. Oh, wait. Get away from that, Blake. Hello? Who? Yeah, he's here. Hey, who is this? Okay. It's for you, Blake. Who is it? They wouldn't say. <laughs> yeah, well, excuse me, gentlemen. Hello? Hello, is this uh, John Blake? That's right. We'd like to see you, Mr. Blake. Uh, Al Kruger told us you could be trusted. When would it be convenient for you to come? Well, name your time. Let's say uh, 7 this evening. Sure, where? At the Oceanic Bank and Trust Company. I see. Ask for Mr. Thorndike, the president. Yeah, well, thanks. I'll do that. Fine. And I'm sorry I have to run, boys, but I know you'll excuse me. I've got an appointment with the bosses. So long. Sit down, Mr. Blake. My name is Thorndike. Oh, yeah, the president, huh? <laughs> That's right, and this is Mr. Hollister. Hi, Mr. Hollister. What do you do? And Mr. Caldwell. Mr. Caldwell of uh, the Caldwells? Oh, so you're the head. Yes. Well, no wonder the organization has been so well protected. Why did you try to take Kruger's job over? I didn't try to take it over. I took it over. Didn't you think we might object? Why should you? I proved that I can run it better than anyone else. Better isn't any good. Well, you have given us quite a bit of revenue. Well, I've given you more than any four of them put together, and I'll keep on doing it. Provided you give me a f- give me a few breaks. You know, I'm not in this for fun. Mm. Satisfied, gentlemen? The job's yours, Blake. Thanks. You're not making any mistake. Uh, incidentally, Mr. Blake, uh, you're the only one who will know who we are. I understand that. The first thing we want you to do is collect our receipts from the garage tonight and bring them here. Yeah? <laughs> well, I've already arranged to collect them. Oh, uh, yeah. Will it be all right if I get here at 10? <laughs> Quite all right. And uh, now, before we get into detailed instructions, I'd suggest that we have a drink to Mr. Blake's success. How about it, Mr. Blake? Thanks. It'll taste pretty good. <laughs> Hello? Hello, McLaren? Yeah, Johnny? Uh, we're all set, Mac. I'm in with the big shots. Who are they? Well, what's the difference? You can't pick them up yet. You'll have to catch them with the dough to make it stick. Well, go on. Now, look, I'm meeting the boys at 6 tomorrow night at that garage I told you about. When you see me leave there with the dough, pull up fast and raise the joint. Oh. And then send it to 24 and wall. I'll fast that 10 o'clock shop to meet the big shots in their office. When I give the word, you can make the pinch. Nice work. Go now, remember, a few minutes after 6 at the garage and come in shooting. And that's all, Mac. <laughs> Just a minute. Hold your horses. Hey, let me in. See, I did come in the back way, Buck. Cops are after me. Has Blake been here? No, what's happened? Nothing except that he's done what I always said he was going to do. Put the whole crowd on the spot for McLaren. They got everybody except me and Joe. Raided the garage. Wait a minute. Johnny was... He worked with the police? Oh, he's been working for them the whole way. Now, I'm going to pay him off. I'll get him if it's the last thing I do. I'll... Hello, Lee Morgan. It's Bugs Benner there. Who's calling? Tell him it's Joe. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I haven't seen him. He said I could reach him there. I'm sorry, but he's not... Wait a minute. Give me that phone. What's the matter with Give you? Give it to me. Hello? Bugs, this is Joe. Yeah, go ahead. I found him, Bugs. Blake? Where? He's hiding out. 1124 East 18th. 1124 East 18th. Yeah. It's an old private house. There's a back stairs leads right to the door of his room. Ah, okay. Thanks, Joe. Bugs, what are you going to do? I'm going to pay Mr. Blake a visit. Wait, now, listen, Bugs. Get out of my way. Get out of my way. Hello? Hello, information? 
Listen, I want the number of a house at 1124 East 18th Street. Yes, hurry, please. All right, Blake. You can stop right now. Who's that? Who's down there? Bugs. Your old friend, Bugs. I hear you're making a trip out to see the big fellas, Johnny. Yeah? Yeah, and a hearse. Yeah. Too bad, Bugs. You only hit me once out of four shots. I guess I did better with only two. Johnny, I tried to call you. There was no phone here. Yeah, I know. Has Brenner been here? Yeah, he's in there on the floor. Oh. Are you all right? Oh, sure. Drive me over to Wall 24th, will you, Lee? I've, uh, I've got some business. All right, sure, Johnny. I was afraid he'd kill you. He told me you were working for the police. Yeah, on and off. Oh, I've been a heel, Johnny. The things I said that night at the hotel. Well, you didn't know. Forget it. I, I tried to stay sore, but it seemed sort of funny not seeing you around. You're all through with it now, aren't you? Yeah. I'm glad. You can go back on the force. Mm -hmm. Maybe the Broadway district. Yeah, maybe. Well, here's where I get off. Thanks, Lee. Thanks. You sure you're all right, Johnny? Oh, sure. You run along. I'll wait for you. No, you'd have to wait too long. Thanks for the lift. Your races, Lee. I'll remember that. Will you? Good night. Good night, Johnny. Hello, Blake. How are you, gentlemen? Ten o'clock on the dot. You keep your appointments. Yeah, I wanted to make the first job perfect. Here's the money. I'll open it up. Did you have any difficulty with Brenner? Oh, no, no. We got along fine. Well, how does it feel to be head of the organization? I've been waiting for a night like this for 15 years. You deserve it. Thanks. Uh, will you gentlemen need me anymore tonight? No, we'll contact you next week. Well, that's fine, fine. Uh, wait a moment. Hmm? What's the matter with you? With me? Oh, nothing. Why? You're hurt. Oh, no, no. Everything satisfactory, gentlemen? Yes, of course, but uh, you can't... Well, good night, then, gentlemen. Good night. Johnny. Johnny, are you all right? Hello, Mac. Did you nail him with the dough? Yeah. Well, that's that. Who got you? Brenner? Yeah. Oh, where is he? He's washed up. Check the bullet he put into me with the ones that killed Brian Kruger. They're all from his gun. You didn't miss a bet, did you? Well, I tried not to pull the punches this time. I guess Brenner didn't either, either. Oh, that's all right. I'm taking you to the hospital. No, it won't do any good. So long, Mac. Keep kicking him in the line, Mac. I will, Johnny. Yeah. I like to think that when the mugs see a policeman, they'll keep on tipping their hats. A life and a play end together. And now the late Johnny Blake becomes Edward G. Robinson. And Lee Morgan is once again Mary Astor. And here's a question, Mr. Mill, that I've been waiting a long time to toss at Mr. Robinson. Don't you ever get tired of dying, Eddie, or of being Hollywood's favorite bullseye? Oh, I don't mind being bored by a bullet, Mary, if the results don't bore the audience. But I'll admit it's a distinct relief to be able to die occasionally on the side of the law and order as I did tonight in Bullets of Ballots. But how did you like the story? Speaking as Lee Morgan, not so much. You just about ruined my life by dying. Mm. But speaking as Mary Astor, well, yes. Eddie, I've learned that anything connected with the name Lux must be good. Uh -huh. I found that out years ago when I started using Lux soap. Anyone who's at all fussy about her looks knows that Lux soap is about the nicest, most dependable complexion care there is. Mm. I guess I'm like most actresses in Hollywood because I'm never without it. Incidentally, Mr. DeMille, the last time Eddie was on this show, didn't I hear him promise you a job on his own program, Big Town? No, he certainly did. He even gave me a name. I, I was to play Benny the Bummer. 
But that's the last I've heard about it. Well, the truth is I haven't had a spot lately for a torpedo. <laughs> Besides, I don't think you'd be much of a pineapple juggler, Mr. DeMille. Oh, then couldn't I play a detective sometime? Oh, huh? sorry. No experience. Well, couldn't I take some lessons from Mr. Gumpert? Say, I might have an opening on Big Town at that. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Thanks. Well, sure, you mean that... it? Oh, pardon. Yeah. Sure, send that uh, Mr. Gomper around sometime. He uh. sounds like a great bet. Uh. I remember. Keep tipping your hat. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Don't <laughs> give up. I'm sure you'd make a perfectly lovely Benny the Bomber. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Good night. Go on, copper. You'll hear from Mr. DeMille again in just a moment when he brings great news about next Monday's program. Our stars were assisted tonight by Wallace Clark as McLaren, Edward Marr as Joe Vinci, Lindsay McCarry as Ward Brandt, Chester Clute as Herman, Wally Mayer as Crail, Galen Galt as Doorman, Lou Merrill as Thorndike, and so and so. Mary Astor's new film is Paramount's Midnight. Humphrey Bogart is from Warner Brothers Studio and is now appearing in Dark Victory, which stars Betty Davis and also features George Brent. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studio. He directed music there for the story of Alexander Graham Bell. Here's news for our Canadian listeners. Beginning this week, 29 Canadian stations are joining our network for the broadcast of The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. The makers of Lux Toilet Soap bring you this enthralling story about the love and problems of a young, attractive woman doctor every afternoon, Monday through Friday. Look in your newspapers for the time and station. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Our producer, Mr. DeMille. An average young man marries into a wealthy family, only to find that neither big business nor a glittering social life can alter his affection and ambition for a racehorse named Broadway Bill. Bill's adventures on the racetrack and our hero's experiences with his wife's relatives provide the gay romantic play you'll hear next Monday night. And leading Broadway Bill to our barrier will be two Hollywood stars who are favorite, uh, favorites at heavy odds, Robert Taylor and Francis D. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Robert Taylor and Francis D. in Broadway Bill. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. 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 This... Don't come near me. Thursday, John Amos, Ernest Borgnine, and the cop of the future are set up by a girl on the edge. Then a new puppy brings Chrissy and Jack closer together. Yeah, there's nothing a girl likes more than a little tickle on the tummy. Knock it off! Three's company after Future Cop and Barney Miller. The Warrior of the Woodland, Ranger Bill, is coming up next. Bill, warrior of the woodland, struggling against extreme odds, traveling dangerous trails, fighting the many enemies of nature. This is the job of the guardian of the forest, Ranger Bill. Pouring rain, freezing cold, blistering heat, snow, floods, bears, rattlesnakes, mountain lions. Yes, all this in exchange for the satisfaction and pride of a job well done. <laughs> If our great-grandfathers could see our country today, they'd find that there are many changes as compared to the America of yesteryear. Some of the changes are the result of necessity. These changes are dictated by circumstances beyond our control, but are a result of new industries and occupations necessary to the existence and survival of the United States. This fact has been felt even in the Forest Service, where manpower availability becomes an increasing problem with each passing year. We have more duties 
and fewer qualified men to carry out these duties. But let's find out what happened in the story, Petticoat Ranger. Don't look now, fellers, but I can tell you who it is by the sound of them still she's wearing in that sweet-smelling perfume. Boy, you're not joking, old-timer. <laughs> Hello, Jane. Hello, Bill. I don't know if I should talk to these two male animals. <laughs> <laughs> I think they only make fun, Jane. Yeah, sure we are. Uh, Janie, girl, uh, what are you going to do for excitement now that you're going back to school teaching? Do you have trouble finding excitement, Stumpy? No, but uh, we're going to kind of miss you around here. Uh, nobody to tease and poke fun at. So you finally admit that you're going to miss me, old-timer. Huh? Uh, I reckon so. You're a good sport, <laughs> Janie, girl, and uh, a first-rate fire watcher. Ah, uh, you're a sweet old gentleman, Stumpy. I think I'm going to give you a big kiss right on your sun-dried forehead. <laughs> now, see here, let's not get sentimental about this. Let's just shake hands and call it square. <laughs> oh, what's the matter, Stumpy? <laughs> You're not afraid of Jane, are you? No, never you mind, young fella. It's just a token of appreciation, Stumpy. <laughs> oh, I remember how you were against me when I first came. Well, any flowery words from me you earned. And let's leave it there. Why, some of that sweet-smelling perfumes liable to jump in my clothes, and I'd be the laughing stock of the forest. Even old grizzlies would howl like they was feather tickled. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I'll just say thank you, and that's for the rest of you gentlemen too. Oh, you're welcome, Jane. You're nice people. Uh, I always think women belong in the kitchen, but now, well, maybe change mind. Uh, they're singing a little different song now, aren't they, Jane? Oh, my, yes. <laughs> I'll never forget how things were when I came to work here right after finishing school last spring. Uh, neither will I. Last spring, I was scratching myself bald, trying to figure out ways to make my man stretch enough to cover all the jobs. <laughs> Bill, what wrong? You have a deep frown on face. You'd have a deep frown, too, my friend, if you had more jobs than men to fill them with. Ah, you speak truth there. Here, uh, just take a look. If you've ever seen a jigsaw puzzle with pieces missing, this is it. Yeah, that's right. Well, what you plan to do? Well, that gray wolf is a good question. Even working one man and a dog on patrol hasn't helped now. It did several years ago, but it doesn't now. Of course, the dogs do help because I'd be in an even worse spot if we didn't have them. Well, how you feel, Fire Tower Watch, now? Well, that's the pressing problem. We're just going to have to double up in our jobs during the dry months, that's all. Are the assignment sheets ready, pal? Yep. I've got them sorted for distribution. Okay. Got them on their way like a good fellow. Right. I'll be back in a little while. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of moaning and groaning when the men read these work assignments, Sonny. Yes, I expect they will, Stumpy. But it's got to be done. I notice that you got yourself cut in for a pretty heavy load uh, besides your job as boss ranger. What makes you think the boss is an exception when the going's rough? I can't expect my man to work harder than I do. Good night. What's Bill think I'm made of? Iron? Oh, brother. I've got to stand fire watch at Eagle's Roost after I get through riding trail. Man. Bill, or better get me a foam rubber saddle if he expects me to inspect fire lanes 18 hours at a shot. I'd get sore about all this work. Only Bill's doing more than we are. Bill? The fellas are doing an awful lot of complaining. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? Oh, nothing really. I hope the fellas are tired enough now to listen to my idea to give them some relief from this terrific workload. 
You mean you've had an idea all along and didn't put it to work? Yeah. It's a radically new idea, and I've had to wait for the right time. Will you tell me what it is? Nope. Not yet, pal. But you can tell all hands to be here first thing in the morning. That is, all men that can be spared from duty. Yes, sir. I've got a notion that this is going to be something really hot. Let's come to order, men. <laughs> I uh, understand you're pretty well fed up with the heavy workload, although no one has complained to me. Well, we're not fed up, Bill. Just tired. You said it, Tom. Bill, we're plumb tuckered out. Wore down to a frazzle and a nub. They'll have to change my name from Stumpy to Stubby. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, we know you're doing more work than we are, but to be truthful, we're beat. Real beat. Well, so am I, fellas. I'm glad to hear that you're good and tired. Bill, either you're up to something or your rough sprung leaks. You never talked like this before. <laughs> Gentlemen, I've got a radically new idea to present to you. Oh, here it comes. This is the hitch, the gimmick. Yeah, spill it, will you, Bill? Yeah, let's have it. Fellas... I'm going to hire several women as fire watchers during the dry season. <laughs> Just a minute while I bang my head against the wall. My ears ain't working right. He'll be all right after his head clears. Well, maybe not. I think he'd say he's going to have women fire watchers. Yeah, oh, that can't be. I don't know what that is. What's, <laughs> what's the matter, old timer? He means it. Yeah, I don't that. Can you imagine what a fire tower look and smell like with a female in it? <laughs> yeah, petticoats hanging from the tower rails. That sweet smelling perfume covering the forest like stunk gas. <laughs> yeah, sure. All the critters in the forest will take off for the hills because they'll think it's something from another planet. <laughs> Maybe we give Bill a chance to talk now. Sure. He'd better do it now. You won't get a word in edgewise when those petticoat ragers take over. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you fellas were tired. Uh, too tired to horse this around like you are. Uh, you took the tired feeling away with those magic yeah. words of yours. <laughs> petticoat rangers. Yeah. Uh, are you really serious, Bill? Yeah. yeah. So we yeah. Yeah. Yes, fellas, I'm really serious. And I want you to give this some serious thought. Oh, you can't mean it. Why, well, we'd be the laughing stock of the whole country. I can just see some young lady sitting in the fire tower trying to figure out where she dropped the stitch in her knitting while the forest burns to the ground. <laughs> oh, come on now, Sam. Uh, your wife isn't as dumb as that, is she? Well, no, of course not. She's smart and has a level head, but... But what? Do you think your wife is the only intelligent woman in the world? Oh, come on, fellas. Let's give in. He's got his argument all prepared like the parson's Sunday morning sermon. Give! My foot! Oh, Ned's right, old-timer. We're all dog-tired, and what's the use of kidding ourselves? I'd rather be dog-tired the rest of my life than hen-pecked by one of them female chickens uh, roosting up in a fire tower. Yeah, maybe old-timer have point there. Why should we be guinea pigs to find out? Now listen to me, fellas. <laughs> I know I struck you a staggering blow to your masculine pride, but let's face it. A half dozen women doing fire tower watch in the dry months would take a terrific load off of us and give us all a chance for shorter working hours and the day of rest that we need so desperately. Half a dozen women? Yep. <laughs> He's going to bring them in like bananas <laughs> in bunches so they can really give us a bad time. <laughs> I don't like this at all. Okay, fellas, that'll be all for this morning. You uh, think it over. I'll be around to talk to each one of you before the week's out. You don't have to bother with me. I'll tell you right now, the answer is no. Spell it any way you like, but it all means no. really angry about this, aren't you, Stumpy? <laughs> sure I am. Who ever heard of female women being in the Forest Service? But you'll have to admit, Bill has a point. Point or no point? 
I ain't for having petticoats in the fire towers. This is a man's outfit, and it takes men to get the job done. Good men. I wouldn't be surprised. Bill didn't already have some gal lined up for the job. Yeah, I figured as much. He's just shock-busting us for when she shows up. Maybe it'll work out better than you think. <laughs> That's what the bear said when he got his paw caught in a steel-jawed trap. Jane Reeves speaking. Uh, Jane, this is Bill. Oh, hello, Mr. Jefferson. How are you? Uh, fine, thank you. Only I uh, told you to call me Bill. Uh, Mr. Stump's all right some places, but not out here. All right. What's on your mind, Bill? Are you willing to give it a try, Jane? Oh, yes, I'd be thrilled to death. I've got half a dozen friends who'd like to try it, too, when you're ready. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to make the test run solo. Oh, sounds like your men are up in arms. <laughs> not quite, but almost... They don't like the idea of petticoat rangers. <laughs> Is that what they call me? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> How do you like it? I think it's cute. <laughs> when should I report? Oh, not so fast, young lady. I haven't got their approval yet. Well, I understand. There isn't much use trying to force me down their throats. They'd only resent me all the more. Right. I'm sure it'll work out, though. Just be patient for ten days more or so, and then I'll call you. All right. Oh, I do hope they'll agree, Bill. I think it would be a wonderful experience, and, and I can take the gas. <laughs> I'm sure you can, Jane. And uh, I'll let you know as soon as possible. Goodbye. Gentlemen, uh, you know why I've called you together. Oh, sure, sure. All right. Uh, what's your answer? <clears throat> Oh, Bill, Ned, Sam, and I have been asked to speak for the group. The answer is no. That's right. right. We agree. Yeah. No, still no. Yeah, That's we've talked this over considerable, and it's unanimous. Yeah, we'd rather keep on the way we're going. Right. All right. That's your decision. I'll abide by it. You're not angry? No, of course not. Displeased? <laughs> Sam, have you got a guilty conscience? No, sir, not at all. Oh, come, you ain't got nothing to say. Your brain cells go on a strike? That's what bothers me. You've always got some final word to give. <laughs> you fellas are afraid I'm burned up, aren't you? No, no, I think so. Well, I'm not burned up, believe me. I just wonder how long we can keep this pace up. I know I can't carry the overload too much longer. <laughs> That boss of ours is a shrewd operator. You said it. He made us feel uneasy by not blowing his top when we said no. He's slick, all right. Of course, that's what makes him the best boss ranger in the country. If he'd blown his top back there, then we'd feel justified in turning him down on this petticoat ranger business. You fellas know what he's up to, don't you? Sure. He's biding his time. Playing a waiting game. Man, that old Indian trick. Sometimes patience win battle when all else fails. Sure. He's waiting until we give in from sheer exhaustion. I know that young whippersnapper like I know the sound of my own voice. Yeah, bless his scheming heart. <laughs> That's right. Well, the only time you'll get me to approve of female women in the Rangers is when they pat me on the chest with a spade. How'd you slash your hand so badly, Sam? Uh, with my bowie knife. I wasn't thinking about what I was doing. Your ankle's got some broken bones in it, Tom. What happened? Uh, I fell off my horse. Must have dozed off. Stumpy, you gave your head a nasty crack there. You never did this before. Nope, never did. I was just walking along and... All of a sudden, the ground flew up and hit me in the head. Sam, you're bruised from head to foot. Tangled with a bear? No, I rolled off a ridge to get away from that rattler, and it came on all of a sudden. Funny thing about that, I 
used to hear them rattle. This office looks like the old soldier's home. There are ten crippled men sitting in this room. Ten men that can't perform their duties as they should. Ten men subtracted from our already insufficient force. Ten men who've put an additional burden upon the remaining able-bodied men. Do you know what caused all these needless accidents? Yes, sir. Fatigue. Go to the head of the class in the cripple ranger's home. Since you're so intelligent thus far, Tom, perhaps you can tell me how this could have been prevented. Yes, sir. We need more manpower. Using women as fire watchers would take that duty away from the ranger force and allow some time for rest and recreation. She'll be here first thing in the morning. Gentlemen, it's my privilege to present to you Miss Jane Reeves. Good morning, gentlemen. I, I'm pleased to be here, and I, I hope you'll get to like me and, and like my work. Uh, Stumpy, uh, close your mouth. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah. Hey, excuse me for leaving my tater trap hanging open, young lady. You needn't apologize, Mr. Jenkins. How do you know my name? Bill pointed you out as you were coming up the walk. I, uh, I asked him who the distinguished-looking elderly gentleman was. You asked him that? Well, yes. Why? <laughs> I thought maybe you was trying to butter me up because I'm the chief objectioner against petticoat rangers. <laughs> I think I caught all you fellas flat-footed. You didn't expect to see an attractive, intelligent, and athletic type young woman, now did you? I thought so. Well, she's here and ready to begin training. Now, you can all go back to your work. Jane will be around to see you when it comes your turn to show her your particular aspect of the ranger job. Jane, uh, will you come into the back office a minute? Uh, Stumpy... Uh, you stand by for orders, uh, special orders. Now, young lady, I want you to listen closely to last-minute instructions. Yes, sir. I'm going to assign the old-timer to see that you get around the whole operation. Oh, that's wonderful. I like him very much. Uh, he's a tough old grizzly, but... He's warm-hearted underneath. Oh, yes. <laughs> he give you the shirt off his back if you needed it. And what's more important, he's a very fine Christian gentleman. But uh, he spoke the truth when he said he was the chief of the opposition. I hope I can change his mind. I think you will. But you'll have to prove yourself. I'll try my best. I know you will. Now, you're aware, of course, that you're under close scrutiny. Oh, yes, sir. Fine. I want you to be tough but in a feminine sort of way. Stay feminine. Yes, sir. Wear perfume. Even out in the forest? Yes. The men will expect you to be feminine, but you can't act helpless. Do what's within your physical limitations. The men will respect you for that. Act intelligent, but not smart alecky. And don't try to tell them what to do or how to do it. Mm -hmm. You're uh, just learning. I understand perfectly, <laughs> Bill. And uh, if you get discouraged and feel like shedding a few tears, uh, don't. Just bite your lip and ask the Lord to give you strength. A whole lot depends on you, Jane. Yes, I'm aware of that. Scared? A little. <laughs> You'll make a good petticoat ranger. We all were a little scared the first time we went out on the trail. And don't let those tough rangers of mine tell you differently. when the going's rough like this. They're better at doing it without any outside help. If you try to use the lines, they'll fight you. 
It might cause an accident. I understand. You don't like your assignment of taking me around, do you, Stumpy? Nope. I sure don't. Why? Because this ain't no fit place for a woman. It's hard enough for a man to keep body and soul together out here without having to worry about a female woman. These trees are our friends, Jane, and we love them, each and every one of them. We watch them when they get sick or infected and nurse them back to health. We thin them out so they can have more room and air to grow big and healthy. Mm -hmm. They're our friends, too. Don't forget that when you're up in the fire tower. I'll remember every word, Sam. You better, young lady. Now let's mount up and move along. We got to meet Bill and Gray Wolf at the fire tower at the edge of Dead Man's Gorge by dark. Oh, it's a wonderful way up here. Oh, it's so lonesome, too. Yeah, you're right, Jane. You feel plenty close to Lord up here. Sometime Ranger get very lonesome. But there are many other things to help you forget loneliness. In the morning, you see whole Shady River Valley, which stretch for 50 miles below Fire Tower. Oh, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> You'll have days and days to look at it all by yourself, Jane. Is this going to be my post? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Don't bite your lips so hard, Janie girl. There's a radio and a telephone up there. Oh, you're a big comfort, you old walrus. You <laughs> walrus. <laughs> <laughs> you know something, Bill? She's getting to act like a ranger already. You soften up already, old timer. No paint. But I'll give credit where credit's due. <laughs> Jane, I think you scored a point. <laughs> right now, we've got to get you set in the tower. You're going to leave me alone here the first night? Yes, but... Uh, We'll be sleeping down here in the cabin and leave in the morning. When sunrise comes, you'll look out over a hundred million dollars worth of timber and property. It's your job, young lady, to guard it against its worst enemy, fire. I'll guard it, Bill, if it costs me my life. Jane's been up there a whole week now. Don't you think somebody ought to go visit her? You and I are going today, pal. One week of lonesome vigil at a time is enough starting out. She uh, phoned in a few things she wanted us to bring along. Yeah, some ribbons and bows to tie on the girder, sonny. <laughs> <laughs> you die hard, don't you, old walrus? <laughs> she really put you in your place. <laughs> hey, Harry, fire tower ring. Bill speaking. Bill, there's a small flash fire in area 7 of the valley. Position 17 south, 93 west. Area 7, 17 south, 93 hey, west. Hey, that's Jane's right. What's the condition of the fire, Jane? Not much smoke. Heavy flame. Treetop and fast moving. Uh, report to me every ten minutes by radio. Let's roll, boys. We've got a hot one. Fire jumpers, are you airborne? We are airborne. We are airborne. Can you read me? I read you, fire jumpers. Over and out. Jane's bill, over. Go ahead, Jane. Fire is proceeding in a southwesterly direction from Area 7. There's a small cabin on the left flank of the fire in the ridge. Can you send somebody to investigate the cabin? Yes, but it'll take two hours to get to it. It's not soon enough. The fire will be there in less time. I can see a horse tied outside the cabin. We'll go down to investigate. Repeat, we'll go down to investigate. Jane, stay out of there. Jane, do you hear me? Jane, answer me. She's gone. Stop it. You take command of the fire. Ray Wolf and I will leave the truck at clearing 31. We'll try to get to that cabin by copter. Too late. Fire pass over cabin now. Yeah. I don't see any signs of life down there either. Jane could escape through tower trail by staying close to Ridge Wall. Right. 
The tree growth is too thick. No, she made it or not. A pilot? Yes, sir. Drop us right behind the fire on your cable. It's pretty hot down there, sir. It'll be a lot hotter if that young lady gets killed. Cabin ashes now. Yeah. Here. Here. Trail sign up. Horse. Going to tower trail. Yeah. She made it then, Playwood. Good for her. Yeah. Come on. Let's try to catch her before she gets back to the tower. You did catch me, too, though I don't know how you did it in all that smoke and heat, Bill. Oh, it was ready to drop. Well, we're used to it, Jane. You saved a sick man's life by your courageous action. I'm making that part of your record. When you risk your life to save another, all the fellows accepted you as a ranger. They knew you had what it takes. We sure did, Jane, girl. Even the old walrus here had to admit that you're a pretty good ranger. Petticoat and all. Oh, Stumpy. Can I come back next summer? Sure. And you can bring some more female women with you, too. On one condition. What's that? <laughs> They've got to be like you. Good petticoat rangers. <laughs> and that's how we started having women fire watchers in the summer months. And every year now, the ladies come back to their favorite fire towers and guard the trees when the weather's hot and dry. Well, see you next week for more adventure with... Ranger Bill! Hi there, boys and girls. This is Ranger Bill back again for just a third of a minute with an extra word of thanks to you for joining us today. Hope you'll team up with the Rangers every week at this time when your local station gives us this chance to get together. See you then. 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 See you Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. I'm and Joy's got nuts, mounds don't. I'm and Joy's got real milk chocolate, yeah, yeah, yeah. coconut and munchy nuts too. Mounds got deep dark chocolate and chewy coconut. Sometimes you feel like a nut, yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes you don't. Peter Paul, I'm and Joy's got Paul mounds don't. Plus, now there's also a new mounds with creamy rich milk chocolate. The first couple of radio comedy, are Burns and Allen, are up next. Taste the difference. Campbell's Tomato Juice presents... George Burns with Gracie Allen. And Ted Husing and Milton Watson. With Jack Bernard and his famous orchestra.
George Burns and Gracie Allen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, George, isn't it wonderful to be back in New York again? I'm so thrilled that I can hardly speak. Gracie, and while we were... Gracie, we've only been away two weeks. Well, I know it, but it's the same old New York. Yes. You know, I said to myself this morning as I was riding uptown on the M, I said to myself... You were, you were riding uptown on the M? Well, sure, I like the M much better than the subway. So I said Gracie, to myself... Gracie, it's not the M, it's the L. Well, I know, but I don't like to say L on the radio. <laughs> Well, it's kind of nice to be back in New York again. Oh, yes. I've never had such a welcome home in my life. Mm. I was certainly thrilled when I heard those whistles blowing. They, you know, uh, I never they blew expected... whistles for us? Well, sure, but what I can't understand is we got in at 10, yeah. and they didn't blow the whistles until 12 o'clock. Gracie, those were lunch whistles. Oh, don't be a silly word, Judge. You ever heard of eating whistles for lunch? <laughs> yeah, they're delicious with ketchup. Now, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can't stop me tonight. No, and my brother, you know, he got so excited that he threw a streetcar right through a plate glass window. Your brother picked up a streetcar and threw it through a plate glass window? Yes. Crazy, do you know how much a streetcar weighs? Certainly, three tons. And three, uh, three tons? Yeah, up ton and down ton. Up, <laughs> up ton and down ton? Yes. But where's the other ton? Mm-hmm, leading the band. Leading, um, <laughs> leading the band. <laughs> my thought. Hey, wait, wait, George. Yes? For two whole weeks while you've been away, I haven't made one single announcement about Campbell. That's right. Not once have I stepped up to the microphone to tell the world the famous Campbell slogan. Well, I'll tell them about it, Ted. Oh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ted Hughes says, if you're using Campbell's tomato juice, you're using the best Campbell's tomato juice in the world on account of you're using the same tomato juice that using is using. <laughs> That, uh, that using is using? George, I juice got through telling him that. Oh, you juice got through. Ladies uh, and Ted, gentlemen. Ted, I'll take it for you. All right. And I won't have to sell Campbell's tomato juice from a piece of paper. I've got it in my head. Well, George, if, if, if you can't have brains in your head, then I guess Campbell's tomato juice is the next best thing. Uh, thanks, Ted. Thanks. Say, say, Gracie, it's all I can do to control myself whenever you start talking about Campbell's tomato juice. Well, I'm glad you do control yourself, Ted. That shows that you have the power of mind over tomato. <clears throat> mind over tomato. Yeah. Gracie, did something happen to you when you were a baby? Yeah, um, oh, yes. I weighed 10 pounds when I was born. Oh, then you were born, yeah. huh? Oh, sure. Yeah. And the next week I weighed 20 pounds. 20 pounds. And the following week I weighed 30 pounds. Well, for a while, it looked like I was going to grow up to be a Jack Renard. A Jack Renard. <laughs> well, I wish you were a Jack Renard. Then you'd be leading this orchestra instead of bothering me. Sure, and then Jack wouldn't be leading the orchestra and wouldn't be bothering anybody. Well, <laughs> there's something to that. You've got something there, Gracie. Uh, you may not think I'm good, Gracie, but you should see the size of my correspondence. <laughs> see it? Well, how can you miss it? It's breaking the buttons off your back. Uh, let me tell you something. Wait until you see how classy Jack Renard is going to look next week. Yeah, I blew myself to a new suit. You did what? He says he blew himself to a new suit. Oh, well, now that's a good idea, Jack, because it looks like you're going to blow yourself out of the old one. Uh, uh, using <laughs> Watson. <laughs> Renard. Yes. <laughs> This is Ted Husing, ladies and gentlemen. Which kind of tomato juice drinker are you? A dabbler who shifts about and drinks a different brand each time? Or have you given Campbell's tomato juice a try? Taste Campbell's tomato juice. Taste the difference between it and all the other brands you know. 
For here at last, you'll find the honest-to-goodness fresh tomato flavor, just like a tomato you might have picked in your garden last August. No spices or canning processes have spoiled it. It's the real thing. You'll get a brand-new refreshing thrill from your first glass full. And a real benefit to health, too. Vitamins that Campbell's have taken care to retain for you. Try Campbell's tomato juice. Drink a glass of it just for me or just for George and Gracie. And then another glass just for the joy of it. The Marx Brothers comedy, A Night at the Opera, contains the beautiful ballad entitled Alone. Milton Watson sings it for us now. A million stars are shining bright that glorify the sky. A million lovers are tonight. But here am I alone, alone with a sky of romance above. That was man for love. There must be someone waiting who feels the way I do. Whoever you are, are you, are you alone? Alone on this night that we do. Magic violin of Jack Grenard. Here's George and Gracie again. You know, George, if my brother were as rich as Rockefeller, he'd even be richer than Rockefeller and vice versa. Well, that's a nice beginning. <laughs> if your brother were as rich as Rockefeller, he'd even be richer than Rockefeller? Sure, he'd still be getting his $5 relief money on the side. Okay. <laughs> well, which brother is that? Uh... My brother Ike. Ike? Yeah, well, we call him Ike for short. His whole name is Hitchike. Oh, Hitchike. Uh, 
That's yeah. the fool, the good-looking one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But when he gets in the car with anybody, he goes 50-50 on expenses. Mm. So your brother goes 50-50 on expenses. Yeah. The, uh... Uh, the motorist supplies the gas and oil, oh. and my brother supplies the air and water. <laughs> Well, that's very con- that's very considerate of your yeah, brother. Well, I think so. Hmm. And once upon a time, while my brother uh, was... Once upon a time? Yeah, once upon a time. Once but again. while my brother was hitchhiking, yeah. he saw a movie star in an automobile. A movie star? Yeah. Well, what did your brother do? He stuck out his thumb. He did? <laughs> and did the movie star give him a ride? No, he autographed my brother's thumb. Okay. <laughs> nice going. Uh, thumb fun, eh, Gracie? Oh, <laughs> Oh, that's very good, George. You ought to be in punctures. In punctures, eh? George, George. George. Yes? What is this? Opportunity of a lifetime. Opportunity? Oh, Milky, don't take it. My uncle had the same opportunity as you. Opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Gracie, yeah. yeah. quiet with your uncle. What is it, Milky? Well, James Kling from Paramount is here to look me over. James Kling? Yeah, he's a talent scout. Ah, that's nothing. My daddy's a boy scout. He can make a fire with two sticks. Mm. Yeah. Well, what was that? He makes a fire with two sticks, huh? Please, Gracie, don't mess this up. I may get a contract out of this if I can make an impression. Well, what? Here comes Not... Mr. Kling now. Oh, Mr. Kling, how do you do? How do you do? Mr. Kling, you know Ted Husing. How, how do you do? do? And George Burns. How, how do you do? How do you do? And Gracie yes. Allen. Why, of course, of course. Mm. Well, hello, Mr. Kling. Are you the Kling of Hearts or the Kling of Spades? A Kling of Spades. <laughs> Uh, tell me, Mr. Kling, what's new? I hear you're giving Milton Watson the once over. Well, I happen to be in town, and it just occurred to me that Mr. Watson might have possibilities. Milton's got possibilities all. Oh, well, now, maybe he ate something that didn't agree with him. Huh, George? Gracie, that talking business. Mr. Kling, did you hear Milton Watson's song tonight? Yes, he has a grand voice. Well, thanks. I can't help wondering how Mr. Watson would be if he were playing opposite Loretta Young. Well, now, look, it all depends on what they'd be playing, Mr. King. Now, if they were playing football, I bet Milty could be there. <laughs> but he certainly can't play post office, you know what I mean, Milty? Yeah, he knows what you mean. But stay out of it. Uh, Mr. Kling wants to find out if Milton can act. Yes, especially in romantic parts. Mr. Watson. Have you ever had any of these so-called hot lover rolls? Hot well, lover rolls? But well, I have them for breakfast and they're delicious. <laughs> uh, Gracie, if I had a girl like you, hot lover alone. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. That was George Burns, ladies and gentlemen. The telephone number is Brian 9 seven, eight hundred. Thanks, Gracie. You see, Mr. Kling, uh, I've never done anything very important in that line. Of course, I've taken a lot of work in dramatics. Good. What can you do? Well, I've got uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin in my repertoire. Oh, yeah? Then Jack and I must have the Empire State Building in here. <laughs> Please. Please. <laughs> Miss Allen, wouldn't you like to see Mr. Watson get a chance in a love scene with some beautiful girl like Loretta Young? In a love scene with Loretta Young? I know he wouldn't even have a fighting chance. Thanks, Gracie. You're welcome, Elsie. Uh, Miss Allen, you at least admit that Mr. Watson is a good singer. Well, as singers go, what I mean is Milky's low notes are so high that they make his high notes sound low. Mm. What you mean is that you don't even know what you're talking about. Well, you and Mr. Kling don't know what I'm talking about either, so it's 50 50. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Watson, will you do some short love scenes? <gasps> oh, yeah, Milky, and I'll help you. You'll help me? Yes. I'd rather do a love scene with Jack Renard. Why? Why, Gracie, will you stay out of this? Uh, Mr. Watson, right now is the time when we can get an audience reaction. Maybe there's some reading or recitation. Do something. All right, here goes. <clears throat> when a man does a wrong, he goes right along. And the world soon forgives and forgets. Give a girl time. You'll do a mother juice rhyme. A mother juice rhyme. Now is the time, rhyme. Yes, rhyme. Uh, mm, uh, Milky Dumpty sat in the wall. Yes. Humpty Wilty yes. had a great fall. All of Queen's love scenes are going to use. They won't mean on Milky Wilty from Carol's Tomato Juice Finish. I hope so. You're saying Watson Bernard. <laughs> Jack Bernard and his orchestra, and a new pop star, Hypnotize.
Here's a straightforward proposition. Tomorrow, go to your grocer and say, I want a can of Campbell's tomato juice, please. Just that. I want a can of Campbell's tomato juice, please. Then take it home and drink it. And ask yourself if it isn't the very best tomato juice you ever tasted. Do that, and Campbell's and George and Gracie and I will stand by your verdict. There is a difference. And you can taste it quicker than I can tell you about it. It's in the lively, fresh tomato tang of Campbell's tomato juice, in the keen, natural taste of it, unspoiled by spices and undiluted. From the red Campbell tomatoes on the vine to the final feeling of the can, extra special steps have been taken to make Campbell's tomato juice a better drink. There are special health elements in it, too. Vitamins you need. Reasons for drinking Campbell's tomato juice regularly each day. Hundreds of thousands who have heard me talk about Campbell's tomato juice on these broadcasts have given it a trial. And now these loyal George and Gracie fans are loyal Campbell's tomato juice fans, too. So give it a try tomorrow, won't you? And taste the difference. And here's George and Gracie. <laughs> I got a letter from home packing me for the New Year's present, and they're all worried about you. Worried about yes, me? I'll read it to you. Mm. Mm. Uh, dear Gracie, yeah. <laughs> poor mother can't spell very well. Maggie's spelling Gracie's C R A D I. C R A D I. Oh yes, it was. Uh, it was probably a slip of the pen. Yeah, oh, dear. Mm. Well, anywho, it says that mm, Daddy well, and Daddy. Never mind. Just in... read the part where they're concerned about me. Uh, what were they worried about? Your injury. Injury? Yeah. What kind of injury? Well, I don't know, but here it is in the letter. It says that, here, also received George's little check for New Year's, and I hope he didn't break his arm making it out. <laughs> well, it's really nice to know that somebody's worrying about me. Hey, George, George. Yes, oh, why, Newby, Newby, when did you get back from Hollywood? You look wonderful. You're as down as a beret. A beret. Say, George. Mr. Kling didn't leave. He didn't. He still wants to hear me do a bit of acting. Well, that's fine, but we... He's right in the control room. He is. He's going to listen to us. He wants me to do a scene from Rain. That Broadway show, remember? Well, certainly. Well, that's great, Milton. Well, well, here are the scripts. Will you all help me? Well, we'll be glad to. We'll do the part where I'm converting Sadie Thompson, and I've lost my head. Oh, you lost your head? Oh, well, that's all I know. Do you never miss it? <laughs> Wait a minute, Milton. Who's going to play Sadie Thompson? Not Gracie, I hope. Yep. She's the only girl oh, here, so she'll have to play Sadie. Play Sadie? Well, I never played it. But if it's like playing a piccolo, I can't play it. <laughs> and if it's like playing a violin, Jack would not can't play it either. Well, this is going to be fine. If Gracie is going to play Sadie Thompson, then this won't be rain. It'll be Custer's last party. <laughs> Look, uh, what part do you want me to play? Well, George, uh, uh, you play the old trader who runs the trading post. Okay. And Ted? Yeah. You do the sound effects. It's supposed to be raining all the time. Oh, well, I'll be glad to, Milton. Uh, how about Jack? Oh, I'm sorry, but there's no part for Jack. You mean there's no part big enough for Jack? Quiet, quiet. <laughs> all right, let's, let's get started. Okay, uh, Gracie, look at the script. You're Sadie Thompson, and you're walking up and down your room in a dilemma. In a dilemma? Oh, yes. I won't like that on account of I look better in a kimono. <laughs> Gracie, you're Sadie Thompson. You've been a bad, wicked woman. A vampire. But you're reformed. Why? <laughs> Why? Yes. Well, Watson, you better handle it. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the Reverend Davidson, that's me. Yes? I've converted you, Gracie. Yes? You've given up men. Yes? And you're through with liquor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why, you've even stopped playing that nerve-wracking phonograph. Oh, was that a nerve-wracking phonograph? Now, I could have sworn it was Jack and I's band. <laughs> Look, will you try to understand Watson is Reverend Davidson? Yes, and while I'm persuading you to be a good woman, yes. I myself have fallen for you. Oh, why, this is so sudden, Mildy. Who the thunk it, um, <laughs> Watson, director Mr. Kling is waiting. Oh, yeah, Ted. Uh, are, are, are you ready with the sound effect? Well, I've, I've got the water, but I've got no place to pour it. Say, George, have you got a pan? No, I haven't got a pan. You haven't got a pan, George? Well, what do you call that thing between your ears? <laughs> That's what? a birthday oh, cake. Yeah. That's what that is. <laughs> oh, well. Hey, I've got it. I've got it. Here it is. Rain. Rain. <clears throat> Great thing. It says here, Sadie Thompson hums while she's waiting for Reverend Davidson to knock on the door. Okay, Ted, knock. Go ahead, Gracie. Act. 
Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Cry, little baby, papa. Who's that knocking at my door? Who's that knocking at my door? Are we alone? Well, certainly we're alone, Davy. There's nobody here but you and me and George and Ted Hughes and the audience and Jack Renard. <laughs> and it's silly, George. Uh, look, Gracie, read the line. Read the line where it says Sadie. Yeah, uh, Sadie. 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 Yeah, but uh, look, um, what comes after Sadie? Reverend Davidson, he's nuts about it. <laughs> look, read right here. Yeah, oh, mm. Uh, Reverend Davidson, I want to tell you, you won the battle. I'm going straight. George, what does that mean? You be quiet. Sadie, stop. Tell me no more, Sadie. It's time you heard a confession from me. Why, Milton, you can't say that in front of a lady. Uh, but then again, I'm Sadie Thompson, huh? Um, well, let's hear it, baby. Oh, uh, Gracie, your line, your part, your script, your Sadie. I know, and I'm pretty too. Uh, look, will you read right here? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> So you want to confess to me, Davy? Say, are you kidding me or are you drunk? George, I sound like my mother talking to my daddy. Oh. <laughs> drunk. Drunk. That's it, Sadie. I'm drunk with you. Sadie, you've gone to my head like a drug. My brain is going round and around and around. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> when you watch your script... You're spoiling Watson's career. Go ahead, Milton. Okay. <clears throat> it isn't the rain that's driving me mad, Sadie. It's you. It's you. Come to me, Sadie. Closer. Closer. Gosh, I'm glad I'm out of this conglomeration. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet, Jack. Yeah, Milton's in the mood for love. Quiet. <laughs> Gracie, read this line. Oh, yeah. Uh, stop, Reverend Davidson. Get away from me. So that's what your face does for you, eh? Are you listening, Mr. Lubitsch? <laughs> Sadie Thompson, you can no more stop me than you can stop the rain. Okay! Ted, he didn't tell you to stop the rain. Oh. <laughs> Will you all be quiet? <clears throat> Kiss me, Sadie. I'm only flesh. Oh, baby talk. No, he's getting flesh. Getting flesh. <laughs> Oh, oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Kling, Mr. Oh. Kling, it's terrible, but it's not my fault. Terrible? Why, it was simply wonderful. Wonderful? I, I've never heard a man read a line with such sincerity. Well, well, congratulations, Jack. Yeah, yeah, that's that's wonderful. wonderful. Contact yours. Put your name right down here, Mr. Jack Renard. Jack Renard? Renard. <laughs> the way he read that line, gosh, I'm glad that I'm out of this conglomeration. It was beautiful. Mr. Kling, Jack Renard wasn't even in the play. I know, that's why he gets the contract. Oh, <laughs> let me see the contract. Jack, isn't it grand? Congratulate Jack, everybody. What? He's going to Hollywood to be a stand-in for a load of hay. A load of hay? Using... What's the Renard? Gracie's making a popularity survey. She sings, How Do I Rate With You? Let's cut out all the smart talk and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk on the very timely topic of you and me. You tell me all about yourself. Come on, goodbye. I'll tell you all about myself. I've nothing to hide. I'm in the social register. I'm in Right. 
state of coma. Would you get your friends to vote for me, even your janitor? Yeah, my janitor would sweep you right in. If I should run for president, I'd get a vote or two or three or four, but they only one thing matters, how do I rate with you? Do you think I'm the top, or am I a total flop? Do I thrill you when I talk? Or ooh, 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 would you rather take a walk? I may some pie with Jack Renard. And Milty will be too. Don't call me Milty. But baby, what I want to know is, yeah, oh, what's the name of this song, Georgie? How do I rate with you? That bit, you rate well. <laughs> Campbell's tomato juice, made by the makers of those fine Campbell's soups, invites you to listen and laugh with George Burns and Gracie Allen again next Wednesday, when they will broadcast from Boston, where they are appearing all week, starting this Friday, at the Metropolitan Theater. Meanwhile, say to your grocer, Campbell's tomato juice, please, and taste the difference. This is a cubic foot. There are five more of these inside the new Chevrolet than there are inside this year's older style full-size cars of Chevy's nearest sales competitor. That's based on U.S. government estimates of vehicle interior size as reported in the 1977 EPA Guide for New Car Buyers. The new Chevrolet with five more cubic feet of room. It stacks up beautifully. Now that's more like it. Next, hunt the biggest of all game with the Green Hornet. The Green Hornet. He hunts the biggest of all game, public enemies who try to destroy our America. With his faithful valet, Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with racketeers and saboteurs, risking his life that criminals and enemy spies will feel the weight of the law by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Britt Reed in the thrilling adventure, Long Distance. The Green Hornet strikes again. Michael Axford returned from his noonday meal, he found a note on his desk. Oh, golly, Britt Reed wants me to come right into his office. Now what have I been doing wrong? I wonder. Not suspecting that he was due for a meeting that would start an amazing sequence of events, Axford entered the office of his young employer. Reed, I... Uh... Suffering snakes. Axford, you remember Clicker, Benny. Do I? Holy crow. Hi, Axford. You look the same. Clicker. Sure it's a sight for sore eyes that you are. How's a man of action these days? Great. But you've been away for months. Golly, I'll never forget the times you went out with me and took pictures while I did those things and got scooped for the Sentinel. <laughs> <laughs> Toss your eyes over these pictures. Miss Benny's been in the mountains down south, Axford. She's made a collection of pictures that's priceless. The best ones will be in the night edition. Oh, golly, are these? Oh, those are just the best of them. I used up enough film to paper the walls of the Sentinel building. 
I thought you'd like to see quicker while she was here. Sure. Lunch is on you, Axford. Or have you eaten? Oh, I've eaten, but I can always eat again. <laughs> Sit down. Uh, thanks. Well, Miss Benny, these pictures are documentary. I think the government would like copies of every one of them. Oh, good. Uh, what are they of? Well, Miss Benny collected these for a story on the small plants in the war effort. Oh. And, Axford, are they going to town? Cheap as how those fellows and girls down south are working. But what do they do? Are you kidding? Listen, one Air Cobra has 70,000 parts. Counting the motor is one. And that's just one plane. There are lots of other kinds of planes and tanks and guns and cars and radios and machinery of every sort, all of which are made up of small parts. Yeah, but how did they... Here, take a look at this picture. Here's a plant that's run by a man, his four sons, and his wife. They turn out washers. Here's another plant that employs ten men and women turning out bushing. Here's another one... I get it. Why, there are hundreds of plants like that, all of them shipping parts to the big assembly plant. You've done a peach of a job, Miss Benny. It rates a bonus. Oh, best news I've heard in six months. Hey, these here pictures don't look like a small outfit. Oh, those, that's a different set. Golly, what's these machines? Look at the size of them. Oh, that's the auxiliary generator section. All these pictures were inside the power plant. Oh. Here's a view of the outside of the plant. Is this the main source of power for the whole area? Yeah. It'd be bad, wouldn't it, if something was to happen to this plant? Sure it would. If the power was cut off, all the small factories would be shut down. Hmm. Just how far-reaching would that be? Well, if there was a long shutdown, it might set up a bottleneck in a lot of the biggest industries in the country. But there wouldn't be a shutdown. Guarded? <laughs> like the canal zone. The place bristles with guards. Hey, just a minute. There was a story this morning from that part of the country, a flooded area. Let's see. Yeah, here it is. I remember that, Reed. I read it. What is it? Flood. Yeah? Right in the country where you were. The waters are still rising. There's likely to be trouble. Well, it can't hit the power plant. Now, why can't it, Clicker? Well, they've got an emergency set up there. It's the quickest thing you ever saw. They can cut over to the emergency just as a submarine cuts over to the battery power when it dies. They could run the power plant for some time without using the turbines. That's slick, by golly. Hey, look, I'm famished. How about that lunch, Michael? Uh, is it all right, Reed? Why not? Sorry you've eaten, Axford. You won't be able to enjoy your second meal. Who won't? <laughs> Come on, Clicker. I can always eat. <laughs> See you later, boss. Yes, meanwhile, I'll look the pictures over some more. Right. Uh, Casey's still out eating, I guess. She'll be glad to see you back, I bet. Oh, the old city room still looks the same. Yeah. Hi, boss. How are you going to go? Well, 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 Clicker Benny. Oh, a sight for my big brown eyes. Hello, Larry. How's Trick? Still knocking them dead? In the groove, honey. <laughs> Where to? Jack, for Chow. I'm taking her, Lowry. I'm horning in. Oh, come on along. Glad to have you, Lowry. Don't give me that look, Axford. Ah, you're out of time in me hair, Lowry. <laughs> hey, I didn't notice that gas racing had cut down traffic much. Not on this street, it hasn't. Well, here we are. There's always a... I've got a secret central. Hey, what's that? Hey, you folks. If you're reported, I've got a... Ah! Holy crow! Got me! That cab! Get the number! Get that cab! Get the cab! Get a doctor! Here, here now, let thing. me help you. Lowry, keep all these people here. back. Take him inside the lobby, Axford. Here, Michael, let me help you with him. Uh, I got him. Now, keep back, will you? Break it back. Hold the, hold the door, clicker. I got it. There, there now. Is he badly hurt? Oh, by God, he looks like it. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't... Realize? Here, no, laddie. Take it easy. How is he? Larry, hop in the office and call the doctor. Okay. The, the power. Power. What power? Power. Another man. Clicker, he's gone. Jesus. What was he talking about? Well, I don't know. We might as well carry him up the stairs. In a minute, most of the city room will be here to ask questions. Did you get the number of that taxi cab? <gasps> Golly, Axford. Of course I have it. Maybe I got something. Huh? I got a picture of the cab. Camera in my handbag. You did? Maybe you got evidence. If then. it shows anything at all, I... Well, what's the matter? Axford. Huh? Ray, Ray, hold everything. I've seen this man before. I've got to see Britt Reed. And now... <laughs> Here he is, Mr. Reed. This man in this picture. Employed in the power plant down south? Yeah. This is the man who was shot in front of the building. Well, how long ago did you make this picture? Ten days ago. Well, we'll check on it, Miss Benny. And here's the film for my camera. I think there's a picture of the murder cab here. Mm, great work. I have the camera fitted in my handbag with the lens pointed through a hole. After the man died, I realized that I'd snapped the picture. Maybe the killer can be identified. We'll see. 
Want me to take the film to the lab and process it myself? Yes, will you? And if there's anything there, make enlargement. Right. I'll have Lowry on the story and ask for checking back. I'll be back in less than an hour with the prints. Hey, come to think of it. What? That guy was trying to say something about power as he died. <laughs> Check back, Reed. His name was Slade, and he's been living alone here in the city for the past six months. That doesn't check with what Miss Benny claims. It don't? She thinks the man's employed, or at least he was ten days ago, in a power plant down south. Well, there must have been another guy. This fellow's been working as a waiter in a nightclub here for the past six months. Well, where was he before that? Well, nobody seems to know. I talked with Barney Roost. Barney Roost? He runs the 710 Club. Yeah, that's where Slade worked. Roost said he didn't know anything about him. I wonder why Slade wanted to see a reporter. What story did he have to tell? Golly, I've been beating me brains out trying to make something out of what he said. Oh, well, here it is. And it's none too good as a picture. Good shot of the cab and the license number, but the men inside aren't very clear. Uh, let me see it, Clicker. Well, at least the cab number's here. Check on that cab, Axford. Okay. Meanwhile, we'll try and identify the men in it. You know, Reed, there's something about your type of guy. Uh, what about my type of uh, guy? I, I always say you look more at home in a nightclub than in the Daily Sentinel office. Well, that's an uncertain compliment. Now, take me. I never feel like I'm in a place when I'm in a joint like this. Where you have to uh, check your hatch in there. Well, I don't know. But if I was to come in here on official business to see that guy, Barney Roos, that runs the joint... I'd be all right, but sitting at a table like this, eating fancy food... Axford, here comes Barney. Let me do the talking. Huh? Oh, oh, sure. Good evening. You're Mr. Reed? Yes, Mr. Roost. This is Mr. Axford. You wanted to speak to me? Will you sit down? Very well. Daily Sindel, aren't you? That's right. Uh, you had a waiter here, a fellow named Slade. I read about him, the poor devil. What was back of the murder? That's what we'd all like to know. I was questioned about him by the police. All I know is that he came here six months ago, and an hour. I put him to work. He was a good waiter. Waiters go now, there. Well, Mr. Roos, here's a picture of a man's face. Well, Mr. It's enlarged from part of a small picture. That enlargement, or maybe it was blown up too much. Can't hardly make out the features. Yeah, there's a similarity between this picture and your head waiter. You see it? Could be. Could be, yes. Well. Have the police asked about him? Yes, well. Then I suppose you understand. Is this a copy of the picture upon which the police based their suspicions? Yes. Unfortunately for the police, and fortunately for my man Jeffrey, he has an ironclad alibi for the time of the murder. Oh? Jeffrey? Is that the guy's name? Yes. What was his alibi? Maybe it could be busted. I am his alibi, Mr. Axford. Oh. Not to be easily busted. Here, excuse me. I must check the cashier. Tell your waiter to bring me the check. I'll send him. Good evening. By God, Reed, he's the cool one. Yes. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? He won't charge us for what we eat. Hey. <laughs> Uh, hey, here comes Clicker. Yes, I asked you to report to me. Report oh, on God, what? I'm, most, I'm glad you're still here, Mr. Reed. There's something I can't understand. Oh, what's that? I called long distance and talked to Harry Jackson. He's still on a job. But who's Harry Jackson? Suffering snakes, I'm not being kept up on things. Jackson's the guy who works in the power plant. The one I thought had been killed. Then it's just a mistake in your but part. Dang it all, I don't make mistakes like that. I know faces. Photography has taught me to look for things. Those two men were dead ringers. Even to the mole on the chin and the wart on the forehead. You mean the dead guy and the guy named Jackson working in the power plant? Yeah, just as the head waiter here and the guy in the picture of the murder cab look alike. Mr. Reed, there's something screwy someplace. Maybe two men could look just alike once in a great while. But in this case, there's a double for the killer. And a double for the man who got killed. And that doesn't ring true. <laughs> Yes, 
eyes, do you, please sit down? You blunted badly. I don't see how. That photographer on the Daily Sentinel will get a picture of you in the cab after you fired the slid. They can't crack the alibi, though. Besides, I hear that the picture's none too clear. Nevertheless, it brought the investigation closer to us than I like. The fact Slade worked here was bad enough. But now that they've questioned you... Well, something... what's to be done about it? Slade had to be rubbed out. The rat was going to squeal. What's the latest weather report, Miss The flood's getting worse all the time. The power plant's been in some trouble already. Uh, headquarters has made fair study of the weather situation. The flood will get much worse... I think we've timed things just right. When they cut over to the emergency power, goodbye. I hope so. I... Bonnie. Yes. You! Stand still. How'd you get here? We even hold it. Lock on your door is well oiled, Roos. There wasn't a sound when I opened it. Well, now that you're here, Horner, they'd like to extend my sincere thanks. Getting you is just like getting a neat bundle of cash. I can use that reward. And where you are. Gladly. This is where I want to be. Right next to a push button that drops a steel plate over any exit from the office. Now, how are you going to get out? <laughs> Hornet facing Barney Roost and Jeffrey in the nightclub's office was trapped. Though he held his gas weapon to cover the two schemers, it was Roost who felt himself in control of the situation. You see, you can't get out of here, Hornet. No window. The only door is sealed with a steel plate. We use that gas weapon on us. You'll be here until we recover consciousness. You can never find the means of opening the door. Roost? I heard enough to convince me that you two have Jackson at the Southern Power Plant working for you in a scheme to destroy the plant. Indeed. It doesn't take much deduction to realize that Slade permitted Jackson, made up to resemble him, to take his place. And then realizing that he'd sold out his country, he regretted his choice. and had to be killed to silence him. Knowing that, what do you propose to do about it? It's quite simple. I'll do it right on this phone. Barney, Quiet. Sir. Let him see how wrong he is. I want to speak to Harry Masters, head of Southern Power. Now, you'll probably be able to reach him through the operator at Skagway. It's a small town, and she'll know his whereabouts. The long-distance call sped south into the flood area, where swirling waters had already made many people homeless and threatened others. Mr. Masters isn't at his home now. He's at his summer place, but he's cut off by the flood. Well, hasn't he a phone there? The lines are down. The men are working on it. Of all nights to work. And in water like this. Hold the boat steady. I can just about reach the pole. After this line's checked, there's only about 30 more. Stop beefing. The phone service has got to be maintained. Operator, never mind, Mr. Masters. Give me the local police chief. <laughs> you can't reach, Masters. Huh? Please hurry, Operator. A lot of good the chief will do you on it. Stand where you are, both of you. Don't try to rush me or I'll use this gas gun right now. No need to rush you. Hello. Hello, chief. Never mind who this is. I'm calling to warn help, you. Help! The green order! You... <laughs> Let that go for the long distance. The operator will know where the call came from. If he cops here in no time. Who will believe you against me? What if Jackson is an imposter? He's done his work now. He's not needed any longer. Enough from you, but... Roost. You fool, don't! You can't get out of here! Take it! You, you gassed him! I was going to let you out. Give you a chance. Now you're trapped. I don't know how to open that steel door. It'll be open from the outside soon enough. Meantime, you can join your boss. Take it! Taking the boss some time to make his phone call, Zach. Yeah, he know it, Clicker. I've been watching for him. He's all the time phoning the office and where he is. 
Oh, they'd like to go home. The super fish kids. Hey, got... those are cops coming in. Holy crow, is it a raid? Come on, we gotta see what's up. Here comes Laurie. He must have been a police headquarters with Lowry! Hey, Lowry, what's up? Why, if you're not at a barn dance. Why? Clicker. Hey, got your camera? Yeah, a small one. What's up? Old company called headquarters. The Green Hornet's supposed to be here. Something snakes, the harness. Where? Come on, the cops are going to Barney Roos' office. <laughs> That's the office door. Yeah. Can't someone get these people back? How can I make a picture when they're all crowded around? Holy crow, that door is solid steel. We need a can opener or something. Get these people back. While the police examined the steel plate that covered the entrance to the office, the word spread like wildfire that the Hornet was on the other side. Patrons of the club jammed close. Hey, what goes on? Who's in here? I heard that it's the Green Hornet. The Hornet? They got the Green Hornet trapped. It was Ed Lowry who found one of the executives of the club. Here's a guy who can open that door. He knows where's the button that'll open it from this side. Have your guns ready, boys. If the Hornet's in there, we'll get him. Expert, get away from there. My cat. Hurry it up. Get that door open. Now get back, will you, Paul? All right, buddy. Come on, get back now. On the other side of the door, Britt Reed was trapped. There was no escape from Barney's office. He was with the two unconscious men, tense, waiting, waiting for the steel panel to move. In his hand, he held a desk lamp, the bulb removed from the socket. The panel started moving, sliding to one side. Discovery was two seconds away. Then he jammed a paper knife into the lamp. Blue sparks flew from a short circuit in the lamp. A fuse blew, and the room was in darkness. Hey, the light! What happened to the light? Be careful where you step! Let me out of here! Don't shoot! Watch the door! The crowd surged forward, pressing into the office. In a moment, the police had their flashlights in action, darting the beams about the room, and then... Axford! Axford, where are you? Britt Reed's voice. Here I am, Reed. Holy crow, be careful. The harness around here someplace. No one but Britt Reed knew that in the darkness, the Green Hornet had joined the crowd. <laughs> It was half an hour later that Britt Reed talked to Cato, his faithful valet, in the bedroom of his apartment. Oh, this sure will do, Cato. It'll be easier to move without the dinner jacket. Yes, sir. Well, where was I? Oh, yes, I, I blew the fuse as the door opened. Then it was a cinch to join the crowd. Axford thought I'd been making phone calls, you see. What of the crooks? Well, Jeffrey and Roost regained consciousness. They claimed the Hornet had been there with trumped-up charges trying to blackmail them. I see. Huh? Here. Thanks. I got a top coat for them. Yes, sir. I told expert Lowry and Clicker to stay at the club. See what happens. They think I've gone to the Sentinel office. I see. All right, now the top coat, and then we'll get going. Yes. I know there's disaster ahead for the Southern Power Plant. But, Cato, I can't pass the word without revealing myself as the Hornet. Any long-distance phone call I made would be traced down fast. Well, what do we do? Come on, I'll show you. You drive the Black Beauty while I write a message. A few seconds later, stepping through a secret panel in the rear of a closet in his bedroom, Britt Reed and Cato went along a narrow passage built within the wall of the apartment itself. This passage led to an adjoining building which fronted on a dark side street. Though supposedly abandoned, this building served as the hiding place for the sleek, super-powered Black Beauty, streamlined car of the Green Hornet. Britt Reed pressed a button. The great car roared into life. section of the wall in front raised automatically, then closed as the gleaming black beauty sped into the night. Toss out this package with a note for Clicker Benny. And then we'll go to the Sentinel building. Yes, sir. Now I'll get out near the office. You drive to the dark alley back of the building. And meet me at the little private door to my office. Very well. What is note for Miss Benny? I want her to put through a call to the South. She'll read the note and look for me in my office. And when she doesn't find me, she'll make the call. Well, there's the club. Open the horn as you approach. Axford and the others are in front of the club. Fine. All the better. Open her up. Oh, 
kid get away? What did he throw out of the car? Maybe a bomb. Get after him. Come on, boys. The cops are going after that car. Not a chance for them. Here, you. Give me that. I'm working out the harness. I'll take that package. What is it, Axel? Oh, hang the day. I count it on this camera instead of the big old flash bulb out this. Vinny, this has your name on it. My huh? name? Holy mackerel. How'd the hornet get a line on me? Open it up, Axel. Now, what do you think I'm doing? Uh, here, it's just a note wrapped in with a block of wood. Let me see it. What's it say? Mine, because of pictures I made on Southern Power, he saw them in the night edition. Jump and did it. I've, I've got to get to Mr. Reed and fast. Come on, Esther, take me to the office. Flicker Benny, with Axford at her heels, learned that Britt Reed had been seen entering his office. She rushed in that direction. The outer office was dark, but a light shone from Britt Reed's office. Axford opened the door. Reed, I... Ah, he's not here. But they said he came in. Yeah, I know. He comes in and slips out by a private door to the rear of the building and wants to be thought of as working here. That door over there leads to the rear. Oh, hang it all. Uh, sometimes he goes over there to use a phone when he don't want to be disturbed. He's got an extension to this phone, but he wouldn't be there now because his hat is gone. Uh, anyhow, the door's locked. Well, this business can't wait. I'll call Southern Power myself. Hello, switchboard. Listen, get a long-distance call through in a hurry. I've got to talk to Harry Masters, the head of Southern Power. Get the operator at Skagway. Britt Reed sat at the extension phone in the small inner room with Cato beside him. Do you have the black beauty in the alley? Yes, sir. Axford's in the office with her. She's putting in a call through to Skagway. While Flicker Benny tried desperately to reach the head of Southern Power, the lineman fought valiantly against the flood and storm to string lines to the isolated island. It was bad enough before. Now we got the storm on top of the flood. Wrap it. Then we'll be able to check. They always talk about the mail going through. What about the phone service? This is the worst mess I've had since the New England storm a few years ago. There you are. Cut in now. Hello. Hello, operator. Number 16, testing. Oh, hello, 16. I can hear you. Line 42. Wait. Hang on. There's an important call. Hello? Hello. Can you get through to Harry Masters now? One moment, I'll try. Actually, they repaired the line. They're ringing Harry Masters. Kato, the phone company's come through. The lines are up. They're ringing Harry Masters. of the Daily Sentinel. Oh, hello, Miss Benny. There's lots been happening here. Uncover the plot to knock out your power company. What? Yeah, as soon as the storm gets bad enough. I have a message from the Green Hornet. I told you about him. He sent me a message. I tried to reach my boss with it, but I couldn't, so I called you. Your man Jackson is a fake. There's some plan to destroy the power plant when the storm reaches a peak. But how can they? How do you think? <gasps> Who is this? Green Hornet is speaking. What? Esther, the Hornet's on the line. Silver and snake. Listen to me, masters. He must be on the extension, maybe over here, the back door. Uh, this door is locked on the other side. Masters, when your plant cuts over to emergency power, the whole thing will go sky high. A blast is wired. I'll smash this door down. Masters, uh, Esther, the Hornet told Masters about... He must uh, be in here. I'll get the spalpeen. Uh, uh, I'm coming for you, Hornet. Uh, uh, where's that light switch? Hang it all. Uh, please. Reed. Hansford, where's your time? Look at the boss. He's out cold on the floor. And that's the phone. It's still open. Reed always used that phone for private calls. The Hornet must have got him here. What's that? The Hornet. He's gone again, driving away. Ah, oh, Reed, laddie, come too. It's me. It's Michael Axford. Oh, what? Oh, you've been gassed, Reed. The Hornet was here. Yeah. Yes, the Hornet was here. Axford. Uh, we know. 
He came here by your private entrance and found you. I was just stepping out for a few minutes. So he let you have it. Then grabbed the phone and heard Clicker Bindi talking. Mr. Reed, the Green Hornet knows a plot. He may have saved the Southern Power Plant. <laughs> Benny, on that long-distance call last night, I've heard from Mr. Masters. Oh, yeah? Uh, what's he say, Reed? How's things down there? Well, he called the plant and told them under no consideration to cut over to the emergency power. An investigation proved that if they had thrown on the switch for the emergency power, a contact would also set off a healthy charge of TNT. It was wired to the switch. Then the Hornet was right. So it seems. And you know, the cops who smashed the alibi is the guy that killed Slade. Oh, yes. And that man Jackson down south has confessed and involved Barney, Ruth, and Jeffrey. <laughs> Mr. Reed, the Green Hornet really saved Southern Power. Well, Miss Benny, from what I can gather, it was really the phone company that saved Southern Power. The phone company and their linemen who kept the service running in spite of storm, flood, and sudden death. just heard the adventure Long Distance. These exciting dramas are sent to you each week at this same time. They are copyrighted features of the Green Hornet Incorporated. All characters, names, places, and incidents used in this drama are purely fictitious. Bob Height speaking. This program came to you from WXYZ in Detroit. This is the Blue Network. Look, Linda, I just bought a new seamless support bra that's so beautiful. I have to show you. Oh, better show you this way. It's the Playtex Support Can Be Beautiful bra, and it's seamless. Don't you love these pretty details and these smooth, seamless cups? Plus, this secret support designed for real support. And you know, it's so pretty. It makes me feel pretty. The new seamless Support Can Be Beautiful bra from Playtex. Support can be beautiful. Hi-ho, Silver! Away to those thrilling days of yesteryear with the Lone Ranger. A fiery horse for the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high old silver, the Lone Ranger.
most of the soldiers who manned the forts on the western frontier of the United States were trained in the Civil War. They knew very little about fighting Indians, and time and time again, they turned to the masked rider of the plains for help. It was he, more than any other man, who brought law and order, peace and security to the new territory. And now return with us to those thrilling days when the West was young and adventure lay at the end of every trail. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver! There's going to be trouble at Fort Gardner! Hello, Silver! How Fort Gardner was little more than a blockhouse and a barracks. There was no stockade surrounding the buildings, for they were open to attack from only one direction. Our story opens late one night as Private Keating is doing sentry duty. He mutters to himself as he paces back and forth. Gosh, it sure is lonesome standing guard. Oh, I wish I was in the barracks with Carl. What's that? Was well, a man made that noise? Who goes there? Stan! Hey, Stan! Huh? Who's there? It's me, Carl. Don't talk so loud. Carl? Keep your voice down, Stan. What in blazes are you doing here, anyhow? I thought you were sleeping. I... Well, I got something else planned. Yeah? Stan, look here. You'd do me a favor, wouldn't you? Shucks, ain't you the best friend I got? And you're my best friend. Stan, I gotta go to town tonight. To Redwood City? Uh Uh-huh. But you can't. Major Brandon give orders no one was to be allowed to leave or enter camp without his permission. Sure, I know that, but... Well, this is something special. Now, wait, I I can't... promised Amy I'd be in town for sure tonight. It's her birthday. Gosh, Carl, you could ask me anything else, and I'd be glad to do it. But if I let you through the lines and it's found out, I could be court-martialed. It won't be found out. I don't know about that. The Major's been gosh awful strict since there's been so much arms and ammunition stored of late. But I'll be back for Reveille. Honest, I would. I can't do it. I just can't. I didn't tell you all the reason for my wanting to get to town. But now I reckon I'll have to. What's that? It ain't only Amy's birthday. Her and me have got it fixed to be married tonight. I got the ring and the preacher's waiting for us. Well, I'll be doggone. You never told me nothing about that before. We was keeping it secret. Amy's a mighty nice girl, Carl. You blame right she is. And I want to marry her so she won't have to work in a cafe for Mike anymore. I, well, I, I wanted to have things a little easier for a change. You're making it awful hard to say no. Huh? And there's another thing. Yeah? I think I'm going to find out who's been stealing guns and things. Huh? Yep. Amy wrote she had a line on who the low-down skunk is. But she wouldn't put it in a letter for fear somebody else might see it. Then, by gosh, it must be some fellow in town. It's the way I got it figured. Oh, come on, Stan. Let me through, won't you? I do the same for you. You... You promise to be back at full morning? I'll give you my word. But where's your horse? You can't walk to town. I got him tethered over by them trees. I shouldn't be doing You're a real part, Stan. But go ahead. I'll take the chance. It ain't as though you was a crook. Thanks, Stan. I won't forget this. Well, I gotta hurry. Amy will be figured on hell up somewhere if I don't get there problem. This is a darn local thing for me to do. But shucks, if you can't do a friend a favor once in a while, what's a friend for? Get up. Get along there. Come on. <laughs> there he goes. He sure is in a hurry to get hitched up, all righty. Say, who are them two fellas coming this way? Halt! Who goes there? Friend. Halt, I tell you. Oh, oh that's the war scout. Oh. Your mask. We want to go inside the lines. I wish to speak to Major Brandon. You can't get by. No? Them's orders. Nobody gets in or out without the Major says so. Did the rider who just left have the Major's permission? Huh? What's that? We just now saw a man riding away. You, you didn't. You deny it? You, you must have been seeing things. There weren't nobody left camp. Well, I might have been mistaken. I'm sure you was. But I still say we want to enter camp. And I still say you can't. Very well. So you might just as well turn around and head back where you came from. Come, Tonto. Mm. All right, old fellow. Get him up, Scott. And don't try to sneak in camp either, because it won't work. on that sentry the papers we carry from Colonel Hughes. But I don't want our errand known unless it's necessary. Oh, 
When the colonel asked me to investigate the thefts from the fort here, he said it'd be best to act secretly. And him right. And I had another reason for not insisting. What, Dad? The sentry lied to us. <laughs> Tonto know that. We did see a man leaving camp. Uh. And if the sentry wanted to hide the fact, it looked suspicious. Uh. Maybe the rider was only a soldier wishing to spend a night in town. Isn't that what you think? I don't know. But he may have some connection with the thefts. We soon find out. Yes, we'll follow that rider and see where he goes. The following morning, after roll had been called, it was discovered that Private Jordan was missing. Major Brandon made a hurried investigation, then sent an orderly to summon Stan Keating to his quarters. We see Stan as he enters the room. You sent for me, sir? Yes. Come in and close the door. Yes, sir. Private Keating, you were on guard duty last night? Sure I was, sir. You know that Private Carl Jordan is missing? I, I heard some talk, sir. I'm going to ask you a question. I want an honest answer. Did you let Carl Jordan through the lines last night? I... I... Speak up. I did, sir. Oh, ah, just as I thought. You're both in on it. I... He promised he'd be back. I couldn't see the harm in it, sir. If that were all, there'd still be no excuse. But I think that this proves you two were the men getting the arms and ammunition out of the fort. You... You don't mean that. Last night, 20 rifles and a case of ammunition were taken from the fort. No. Men that would sell arms to be used against their own comrades or... Well, they're worse than murderers. But it ain't so. I'm no crook, and neither is Carl. Don't lie out of it. Carl just went to see his girl. I'll stake my life on it. Of course you'd have some such story. You, you mean you really believe what you just said? I have no direct evidence. But by heavens, I'll see that you pay for what you've done if it's the last thing I do. It ain't right. You forget yourself. I don't care who or what you are. You can't say me and Carl are rotten yellow traitors that have steal guns. Shut up. I won't shut up. You can't make I'll me. I'll teach you. Stay away from me. I'll take care of you. I warned you. you. And I'd do it again for the things you said. That's, that's enough. Perhaps I couldn't convict you for running guns, but you struck your superior officer. You'll get no less than a dishonorable discharge. I couldn't help it. You call me them things. Anybody else had done the same. You'll be confined to the guardhouse. Orderly, come here. Yes, sir. Private Keating is under arrest. At the court-martial that followed, it could not be proved that Stan was involved in the plot to steal arms for sale to hostile Indians. But for striking his superior officer, he was dismissed from the army with a dishonorable discharge. We see him now two days later, as he enters the cafe in Redwood City. Howdy, soldier. Something for you? Where's Amy, Mike? What do you want to see her for? I wanted to see if I could find out I want to you... speak to you, Stan. Huh? Who are you? Come. I'll explain that later. How'd you know my name? There's a table over here where we can talk. But I got Come along. Mm-hmm. Well, all right, but I ain't got much time. The last long horns for the best day of the raid. I guess they will. I guess Sit down. Now, see here. Just what do you want with me? We met once before. Do you remember a masked man when you were on sentry duty? Sure I do, but I got... I'm that man. And I want to ask you some questions. You're him? You did let a man through the lines that night. I reckon everybody knows about it now since I got kicked out of the army. What do you know about him? I can't see as how you got the right to interfere. You're under suspicion, Stan. I'd advise you to tell me what you know. Well, that's what I'm here for tonight. His name was Carl Jordan. He was my partner, and I want to find out what happened to him. Why did he leave camp that night? Shucks, he was stuck on a dancer they got here. Amy Martin, her name is. Yes? He, he's going to marry her that night. You are sure of that? I told you Carl was my partner, didn't I? He wouldn't tell me nothing that weren't so. I see. The major claimed him and me had something to do with the arms being stolen. But I happen to know he was going to find out about that, too, that night. He was? Uh-huh. Amy admitted him she knew who was in it. She said she'd tell him when he come to town. Then that explains it. Huh? Explains what? Why Amy isn't here. She's gone? She disappeared yesterday. It was her I wanted to ask about, Carl. 
Stan, at first I believed you might be one of the thieves. But I asked questions about you, and everybody spoke well of you. Yeah? There are several things I can't tell you yet, but I want you to remain in town until I see you again. But what have you got to do with all this, stranger? That's one of the things you'll learn later. I don't know just what to think. But I'm free to say I like the way you talk. I'm leaving now. But I expect you to keep still about what's been said and wait to hear from me. Stranger, I'll do that. Uh, now's the time to talk to Mike. Uh, Honto, do that. I think Stan Keating can be trusted. We'll find out soon. Him look like plenty good feller. Mike's standing alone now. Go over there. I'll be watching. Me want make talk with you. Huh? What do you got to say to me, Redskin? We talk in there. In my office? Uh. Well, come along. But if you want to borrow some cash or something, it ain't going to do you no good. No, that's not it. Uh, here we are. Go on in. Uh. No. You closed door. You sure act as though you got something hefty on your mind, didn't you? Me see bad thing. Yeah? Me see you kill feller. Why? You kill feller named Carl. No, loco. Me see you. That's what's your game, Redskin. Uh, you pay me cash, me keep still. <laughs> I get you. Trying to hold me up, huh? Me tell law, you will not pay me. And if I give you cash, you'll keep your mouth shut? Uh, me not talk. My cash is out to the bar. I'll have to go and get it. Uh, that's all right. Now you stay here. I won't be but a minute. Uh, me wait. You ain't looked around the room any, have you? What you mean? I'll tell you, Redskin. I don't savvy how come you seen me get that soldier. And I ain't sure just how much more you know. But the only windows in that room has got bars on them. And I'm leaving you in there till I get ready to come back and finish you off. You click, Tonto. Now try and get out. <laughs> well, that skin and try to get me to pay him off in cash, would he? <laughs> well, he'll be darn sorry you tried to stunt like that after I'm through with him. <laughs> Curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger drama. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Now to continue our story. The Lone Ranger sent Tonto to Mike, the owner of the cafe, to accuse him of murder. Mike locked the Indian in the back room. Late that same evening, we see the Lone Ranger, unmasked but disguised, as he approaches Mike. Mike. Yeah? Hello? What's on your mind? I see you're staying close to your office. What's that to you? I was wondering why. Well, you can just stop wondering and start moving along. I ain't got no hankering for talk right now. Take that key out of your pocket. What key? The key to your office. Hey, what do you Hurry, think? Hurry, I glass. you locked the door on the Indian that went in your office. All I got to do is yell and you're done for, stranger. Perhaps, but I've got you covered and you'll go before me. Now open that door. I and ought to... Hurry. I am doing it, but I'll remember you. And when I find you again, you'll be taken care of. Don't talk. Do as I tell you. Blast you. 
careful what you do, Mike. It means your life. Ah. Come out, Tonto. <laughs> Tonto, no, you come. We're getting out of here, Kimosabe. Ah. You'd better, if you sabe what's good for you. Mike, if you come after us, it'll be the last thing you'll ever do. You talk awful big. Come, Tonto. Uh -huh. Don't forget what I said, stranger. You're gonna be too careful. We'll get our horses, Tonto. Uh -huh. We'll go back to camp for the night. And tomorrow I want to talk to Stan again. Mm, got plan? I have now. What happened tonight proves things we only suspected before. Uh, uh, we play good trick on Mike. Uh. <laughs> He's watching us. He'd shoot if he dared. Uh, here, door. One thing, Tyler. This proves Mike was the man who shot Carl. Mm, that's right. So far, we're the only ones who know Carl is dead. Uh, that's right. Stan told me Carl had received a letter from Amy saying she knew the thieves. And that's why Mike killed Carl. It must have been. The trick we played proves Mike was the killer. The man we saw right away after Carl was shot the other night looked like Mike, but we'd never be able to prove it. Me tell Mike me know him killer. <laughs> he believed you, or he wouldn't have made you a prisoner. <laughs> yeah. Steady, Silver. Uh, there are plenty more work to do. There's a lot to do. Find Amy. Learn Mike's connection with the missing guns. And who in the fort is selling them. Uh -huh. But we'll know all that before we're through. Come on, Gilbert. Yeah, no. The following night, when Stan left the cafe, Tonto stepped from the shadows and touched his arm. What do you want with me, Injun? You come. Tonto's horse, wait outside town. Did you say your name was Tonto? Not right. Well, what do you want with me? Mask man, send me. The mask man? Huh? Where's he at? You come. Has he found Carl yet? No. Carl, dead. Dead? Huh? Mike, father, kill him. You know what you're talking about, Injun? Uh, you mean Mike in the cafe? Not right. Why, that low-down, ornery polecat? No. Let go of my arm, Injun. I'm going back. No. To... Let go of me, I no. say. No, you listen. Tonto's friend tell you many things. You hear his plan. Mike isn't going to get away with killing my pal. No, you wait. You kill Mike now. You hang. You listen, Tonto's friend. Mike hang. Where is he? Him not far. All right. I'll go with you and I'll listen. But I'm coming back here, Injun. Nothing's going to stop me from getting even. Tonto brought Stan to the masked man's camp where the Lone Ranger explained his plan. Then for several days, all three of them watched the movements of the cafe owner. One night, Stan reined in his horse before Mike's home, dismounted, and entered the house without knocking. What the... You rotten killer. Put down that gun. You murdered my part. You killed Carl without giving him a chance. Who told you that? I was talking to the redskin that seen it. That blasted engine. And I'm going to drill you for what you've done. Maybe the law would let you go. The word of a redskin don't count for much, but I'm taking things into my own hands. Wait, listen. I need not try to beg off. I'll give you cash. I'll do anything. You're but finished, don't... you polecat. Don't wait. Your six gun lad to teach you. Stop. I have you covered. You can't stop me from killing him. I'm going to. You won't do anything. Now drop that gun. You can't stop me. I told you to drop that gun. There it is. But I don't see why anybody would want to save the life of an ornery coyote like this fellow here. That's my business. I don't know who you are myself, but you sure got here just in time. Kept me from shooting him now, but there'll be another time. I'll have something to say about that. You think on so? your way. <laughs> and when you get out, you'd better keep right on going. There ain't the hombre alive slick enough to get a second chance to shoot me. We'll see about that. Don't stay around the house. We'll be watching for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the last we'll ever see of him. I savvy them kids all right. They get the nerve up once, but if something happens, it's gone for good. Some of that way. Well, not me curious, stranger. How'd you happen to show up just when you did? I was coming to talk to you. Then I heard that man threatening to shoot. Uh-huh. Say, there's something about you. Ain't we met up before? It's possible. I just don't seem able to place you, though. Mike, I want to make a deal with you. A deal? I happen to know you've been buying guns. Huh? Who told you that? And I have guns to sell. Oh. I can make you a good price. It seems to me you know an awful lot. I've heard things. Mask, huh? 
Well, I reckon an outlaw like you might have ways of finding things out of that. Are you interested? I might be. I ain't just saying. But I ain't got a notion you saved my life because you figured it'd be worth cash to you. Ain't that it? Right now, I want to talk business. <laughs> That's what I meant. Well, what have you got to sell? I can guess you 20 long Tom Springfields and a case of ammunition. What's that you said? I said 20 rifles and ammunition. Where'd you get them? I don't have to tell that. I want to know, do you hear me? Where'd you get them? I got my information from the fort. You did, huh? Well, I... Will you buy them? You can name your own price. I want to get rid of them. I just bet you do. I'll not make this offer again. I, uh... I, you've got to give me time to think it over. How much time? Um, uh, can you come back tomorrow? Yes, I can do that. Make it tomorrow night. Very well, I'll be here at the same time. If you decide not to deal, I'll find another buyer. I'll let you know. Good. Sell me my own guns, Willie. Twenty rifles and ammunition is just what I got. I, golly, I'm going to look into this. And if somebody's been double-crossing me, they're sure going to be sorry. The next day that four horsemen took cover behind a great boulder that concealed them from anyone passing by on the trail. Two of the horsemen were the Lone Ranger and Tonto. The others were Stan Keating and Colonel Hughes. He'll have to come this way, Colonel. We can't afford to let him escape us. You can take my word, he won't. We get him all right. We've got to. He killed my part and fixed it so the two of us was branded thieves. I've got to clear my name. You will, Stan. And I think you can promise to be back in the army with a promotion if this plan succeeds. Thank you, sir. That's what I want more than anything else in the world. Wait. You here? That must be him now. Good. Quiet. He'll soon be to the rise. He's stopping it now. Then it's safe to follow him. Come on, Silver. Get, get, him up. get up. Get up. An hour later, Major Brandon was busy at his desk in his quarters at the fort when he heard noisy footsteps coming down the corridor. The door burst open and Mike stood facing him. You're the fella I want to see, you fool. What are you doing here? You know what brought me. I told you we shouldn't be seen together. I gave you that pass through the lines only for an emergency. You're a mighty smooth talker, ain't you? If there's trouble, I'll... You sold me guns, didn't you? And you told that masked fella where they was hid so he could steal them and sell them again. You're crazy. But not so darn crazy I'm going to stand for being cheated. Now, look here. You needn't I... try to lie out of it. I want nobody but you and me knew where them guns was hid. But when I went to see if they were still there after talking to the masked fella, they was gone. Gone? Impossible. I've been playing square with you. But I should have known you're the kind of skunk that would try a stunt like this. But I didn't have... I've been taking all the risk. It's me that's been getting the guns to the Indians. You've taken no more risks than I have. Yeah? How about that soldier I had to shoot? That was safe enough. And how about the girl that wrote that letter to him? Ain't it a risk keeping her tied up over at the old Sunrise Mine? Should have got rid of her. <laughs> Not me. She and me are going to get hitched just as soon as I can talk some sense into her head. But you can't stay here. If someone should see us together... I ain't begin... leaving until I get back the cash I gave you for them guns. And what's more... I want enough cash to make up for the profit I lost on them, too. I tell you, I don't know anything about them. You won't pay me? I'll not be responsible for something that's not my fault. Why, bless you, fool. Put down that gun. I'll get you. Game is up for both of you. Ah, you smashed my head. I only hit your gun. All right, Colonel. I have them coming. Why, you? You're on arrest, Major. I've heard enough to convict both of you. It was a trap. And you were caught in it. That's the same mask fella I've seen before. I sent him here to find out about these thefts. You trapped him into admitting he killed Carl Jordan. The masked fella did that? He and the Indian saw Carl shot. But you joined the crowd in town too soon for them to make sure of your identity. Then the Indian didn't really know nothing at all. You got me into this, Mike. The masked man trailed you until he found where the guns were hidden. Then he took them away and offered to sell them to you. 
He knew as soon as you found they were gone, you'd suspect your partner here in the fort. So that's how you knew I was in it. We followed Mike here. Is everything cleared up now, sir? It is, and you'll soon be a soldier again. Thanks to the mask, fella. But first, you'll go to the Sunrise Mine with a detachment of men to rescue that girl. Yes, sir. And then we'll attend to these fellows. But who in tarnation is that mask, hombre? Him? <laughs> Why, he's the Lone Ranger. I The story you have just heard is a copyrighted feature of The Lone Ranger, Incorporated. Groucho Marx meets some of the most interesting people you could ever hope to hear on radio with In You Bet Your Life, coming up next. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is sky. S-K-Y. Really? You bet your life. <laughs> The more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America present Groucho Marx in You'll Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. And here he is, the one, the only... Groucho! That's me, Groucho Marx. again with $1,500 for one of our couples tonight. Squire, who's supposed to try for the $1,500? Well, Groucho, we invited some um, real estate brokers to the show, and just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Lorraine Armstrong. Her partner is a cab driver chosen from the audience just before we went on the air, Mr. Howard Jackson. And here they are. Folks, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome for the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. Say the secret word and you'll divide $100 in cash. It's a common word, something you see every day. Mr. Howard Jackson, you're the cab driver, eh? That's right. Must be a pretty big cab. Uh. <laughs> Where were you born, Howard? In St. Paul, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Lorraine Armstrong? Yes. You're a real estate broker? Yes, I am. 
Where are you from, Lorraine? Are you sweet, Lorraine? Or just, uh... I hope so. <laughs> Where are you from, uh, Lorraine? I'm from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Who do, you, who do you work for? Franklin Archer, 9216 Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. You could have omitted that. I'm not in the market. Uh, <laughs> how is the real estate game these days? Well, it's pretty good. I, I don't have time to hardly keep all of my appointments. How many houses have you sold this week? Well, uh, my specialty is uh, renting. Oh, well, how long have you been renting? Twelve years. Well, I must say you take very good care of your premises. <laughs> you look like you have very good weather stripping. Huh? <laughs> now, suppose I wanted to rent my house to somebody else. How, how would uh, I go about it? Or how would you go about it? Well, uh, would you rent it to dogs and children? <laughs> <laughs> if the dog had money, I'd rent it to the same thing as that. Well, Mr. Jackson, uh, you're still here, aren't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> Let's ride your cab for a minute. How long have you been piloting a hack? For seven years, off and on. Off and on what? The sidewalk? <laughs> what do you mean by off and on? Well, when I save up enough money, I go mining and treasure hunting. In your cab? No. What do you mean? You're a treasure hunter? Well, yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of vitamin pills. <laughs> How did you get interested in treasure hunting? Well, I was looking for gold most of the time. Uh-huh. Were you successful in finding it? No. You know why, don't you? You just don't have the pan for it, that's all. <laughs> what started you on the hunt for gold? Well, a Hollywood medium here told me that if I bought into a certain piece of property in Arizona, I'd become a wealthy man. I don't want to seem overly curious, but uh, did this gold mine just happen to belong to the medium's brother-in-law? <laughs> no. You think this medium was a fake? No, I don't. Why, why not? Well, everything he told me that came to pass, uh, uh -huh. except one thing. <laughs> and what was that? Well, I didn't find the gold. And you should have struck the happy medium. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened? Uh, why didn't you find any gold? Well, I don't know. I mined off and on for three years there. Finally, I met a man that was a German scientist from Patagonia, South America. What part of Patagonia? Do you remember? <laughs> no, I don't. He didn't say. Well, why did you have such confidence in him? Well, he had a set of Mexican needles that he took out of his glove compartment, and they pointed to my mine, which was then a mile away. Then what happened? Well, we went up there, and those needles dropped at our shoelaces right straight down into the ground. And you found shoe license instead of gold? <laughs> no. They... I went down a hundred feet. You did? Yes. And this fellow was down there all the time? Oh, no. He left me that same afternoon. Oh, he went back to Patagonia. <laughs> Have your needles ever located a mine that had any gold in it? Yes, it has. The Congress mine in Arizona. How come you me driving Why Well, that mine's been operating for 40 years before my, my, my needles discovered it. <laughs> Could you use some needles like that in your work, Lorraine? No, I don't think so. Oh, I forgot. You're a rental agent. You don't have to look for treasure. You can stick them without needles. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been very revealing and exciting talking about buried treasure. And if these needles really work right now, they're pointing toward the big question. Because in just one minute, you two will have a chance to win $1,500. But right now, I want you to pay attention to a matter of great importance. Groucho, tonight I'm going to be different. Every week, I've been telling about the beautiful DeSoto and all the features that are new this year. Well, tonight, let me mention a few of the features DeSoto has been famous for, not only this year, but in past years as well. For example... Take DeSoto's popular chair-high seats. Instead of low, uncomfortable seats that make you want to get out and walk, DeSoto's chair-high seats make you want to stay in and ride. They keep your body in the proper posture and give you a good view of the road and the scenery. Again this year, DeSoto has the famous tiptoe shift with fluid drive. Yes, DeSoto is the car that lets you drive without shifting. Again this year, DeSoto has big, safe 12-inch brakes. No car in America has bigger brakes. Add to these the whole host of brand new features in this year's car, 
like the amazing new Auraflow shock absorbers, and you have the greatest DeSoto ever built. See it. Drive it. It's now at your DeSoto Plymouth dealers. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth, the value jewel of the low-priced field. Let's see how well you make out in the quiz. George, uh, tell them the rules. All right. Do you bet as much of your $20 as you want on each of four questions, and the couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the $1,500 DeSoto Plymouth question at the end of the show. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected famous ships. How much are you going to bet? $15. Here's your first question. You're going to bet $15. What was the name of the ship that battled the Monitor? The Merrimack. The Merrimack is right. <laughs> Well, going your way, you have $35. Remember, you're going for $1,500 tonight. How much of the 35 are you going to bet on your second question? 30 What explorer commanded the half moon? I don't know. Q? The half moon. No, well, it was Henry Hudson. You've dropped down to $5, $5. now. $5. Here's your third question. How much of the five are you going to go for? Half of it. Two and a half. All right. <laughs> what was the name of the French liner that burned and capsized in the New York Harbor? Normandy. Normandy is right. <laughs> well, you're on your way again. You have seven fifty. Seven fifty is your last chance to be the other couples. How much of the seven fifty are you gonna try? Five dollars. Okay, mutineers mm -hmm. led by Fletcher Christian rebelled against the cruel treatment of Captain Bly. On what ship did this mutiny take place? On the bounty. That's right. The bounty is right. And you wind up with twelve dollars and fifty cents. Thanks. And, <laughs> thanks and good luck from the Desoto Plymouth dealers. Here's our next couple, Groucho. A girl from a supermarket and a married man selected from our audience just before we went on the air. Well, drag him in. All right, I'll do that. <laughs> Pauline Hill and Mr. Lewis Rich, come in here and meet Groucho Marx. Well, welcome, folks, to You Bet Your Life. Say the secret word and you'll divide $100. It's a common word, something you see every day. Miss uh, Pauline Hill, is that right? That's right. Uh, where are you from, Pauline? From Bakersfield, California. Uh-huh. And Mr. Lewis Rich, eh? Uh, how, how rich uh, are you, uh, Lewis? Oh, rich in name only. Well, that's, that's quite something. Where are you from, Mr. Rich? I am from that historical old state of Virginia, the mother of presidents. There aren't any fathers in that state? Oh, a few. I'm one. How old are you, Mr. Rich? I'm in my 87th year. Oh. Well, I would take you for about 60, Mr. Rich. You're a very young-looking man. The mother of all those presidents must have taken good care of you. <laughs> and How long have you been a husband? 55 happy years. You're really happy, huh? Fifty-five years. Do you have any children, Lewis? One daughter. Any grandchildren? Two. Great-grandchildren? Four. <laughs> well, you're improving with age. <laughs> any great-great-grandchildren? Not yet. <laughs> well, don't despair. Rome wasn't built in a day. You know. <laughs> what sort of work do you do? Well, I'm semi-retired. You mean you're half asleep? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, what kind of work do you do? Well, I uh, publish a, a little uh, pamphlet with about several hundred of Benjamin Franklin's sayings called Poor Richard Almanac, which he uh, published about 250 years ago and still has a large sale throughout the world today. Well, he was a great philosopher. I remember when he walked down Chestnut Street with a bun on. Or he was... <laughs> <laughs> Can you slip us an appropriate quotation from the wise old philosopher? Oh, I know hundreds of them, but... Uh, the, uh, let me see. The old man speaks his nonsense with a glib tongue, but still it's nonsense. <laughs> Well, are you referring to me, you, or Benjamin Franklin? <laughs> I don't know why that old busybody didn't mind his own business. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever been insulted by a man who's dead 200 years. <laughs> now, 
Well, let's see now. I, I've forgotten where, uh, where are you from? I'm from the market. Oh, well, I'll take a pound of cottage cheese, then. <laughs> what market are you from? Uh... Vaughn Supermarket, Santa Barbara and Crenshaw. Oh, and what do you do at this market? I'm a checker. A checker? Yes. What do you mean? What is a checker? Oh, a checker. checker is... is something you move around on a board, isn't it? Oh, no. I'm someone that checks out your groceries and your produce, takes your money. Why is the prices are so high, Pauline? Well, I think if I knew that answer, I'd be in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to know any of the right answers to be in Washington, Pauline. <laughs> Well, the other day, I paid 30 cents for a little can of black pepper. It used to cost a nickel. Mr. Rich, what would your pal, Ben Franklin, have to say about that? Oh, a fool and his money is soon parted. <laughs> well, if you see, Franklin, time to go fly his kite. You know? <laughs> Maybe lightning will strike twice in the same place. <laughs> Speaking of reading, have you read The Ordeal of Willie Brown? No, I haven't. You haven't read The Ordeal of Willie Brown? Well, I happen to think it's the greatest novel ever written. Of course, it was written by Arthur Marks, who, by a strange coincidence, happens to be my son. Anyway, it'll be on the book stands next week, and I trust you'll go out and buy three or four copies. <laughs> now, in your 87 years, I imagine you've had a number of different jobs, Louis. What all have you done to scratch out a living? Oh, sold papers, peanut butcher on the railroad, sold books, sold stocks in Wall Street, Ran a hotel, traveled at selling uh, little savings banks to banking institutions. And, uh, you didn't get around very much, did you? Oh, well, I've been in another state in the Union. Canada. What's been your most unusual business experience? Running a hotel in Chicago. Well, I can understand that. <laughs> what happened there? Did anything happen there? Oh, that you could, uh... plenty happened. <laughs> well, uh, during the World's Fair in 93... Three of us came from Richmond and bought a hotel there with 197 rooms, bought the leasehold and the furniture, and so we, all our money was put up, and uh, we had 208 school teachers come from North Carolina, and we had to make a deal with them for $2 a day for meals and lodging, and the fellow that brought them there wanted to pay us with a check, and in 93 there was a bank panic on, and the checks were no good, so he went back to North Carolina to get the money and left the 208 girls on our hand. And What's we... the matter with that? <laughs> In the meantime, the creditors threw us out. We got out and we left the girls there, and I don't know whether they're yet if they ever got back to North Carolina. <laughs> well, I wish you'd find out if they're still there, will you, Louie? Because <laughs> I'm planning on going to Chicago pretty soon. <laughs> well, I've learned a lot talking to you two. A stitch in time saves nine, a two for 17. <laughs> now you're going to play your bet your life. Beat our other two couples, you'll get a chance at the $1,500 question. I can't tell you how much the first couple won, but George Feniman is going to remind our listeners. The real estate broker and the cab driver won $12.50. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected famous husbands and wives. Here's your first question. How much of the 20 are you going to bet? $15. $15. Who is married to band leader Desi Arnaz? Oh, Lucille Ball. Lucille Ball is right. <laughs> Well, you're off to a good start. You have thirty-five dollars. How much of the thirty-five are you going to bet? Twenty-five. 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 Who is married to actor George Montgomery? Dinah Shore. Dinah Shore is right. Climbing, <laughs> you have sixty dollars. That's a prehistoric animal, a dinosaur. I remember I saw one. <laughs> you have sixty dollars. Here's your third question. How much 50. of the sixty are you going to bet? Fifty dollars. Who is married to musician Andre Castellanos? Lily Pond. Lily Pond is right. We now have one hundred and ten dollars. You've almost got enough money to buy that market, Pauline. Here's your last chance to be the other couples. You have one hundred and ten dollars. What are you going to go for? Shall we? One hundred dollars. A hundred dollars. Who is married to actress Elsa Lanchester? Charles Lawton. Charles Lawton is right. And you wind up with $210. Thanks, from them. Good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Thank you. We asked for couples with unusual romances to volunteer tonight. And just before we went on the air, we selected Mr. and Mrs. Charles Koenigsberg from our studio audience. And here they are. 
Folks, come in here and meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, youngsters, for the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Say the secret word and you win $100. It's a common word, something you see every day. Mr. and Mrs. Charles Koenigsberg, eh? Uh, Charlie, my boy, where are you from? Cleveland, Ohio, on the east side. Mrs. Koenigsberg? I can't keep calling you Mrs. Koenigsberg, a beautiful girl like you. What shall I call you? Call me Francis. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call you Francis to begin with. Are there any more at home like you, Francie? Uh, I have six sisters. Your sisters are sick? No, they're not sick. What's the, what's the matter with them? I have... I, they're not sick. They have six sisters. You have six sisters, but they're not sick, huh? <laughs> what's the phone number of these six, six sisters? Huh? Uh, it's A nine two. Two, two. Is that a five cent call? <laughs> I don't want to throw my money away, you know. No, they live in Casablanca, in North Africa, French Morocco. Oh. <laughs> well, cancel the phone call. Right? <laughs> you say Casablanca? Is that where you're from, too, Francis? Yes, I was born in Casablanca. Well, what do you know? I'm an old Casablanca myself. <laughs> Did you happen to admire me in a night in Casablanca? I couldn't go out at night then when I was home. <laughs> I was referring to the Marx Brothers movie, A Night in Casablanca. Didn't you ever see that? Oh, the movie? The movies, yes. <laughs> I, I used to be in the movies years ago until they saw some of the film. <laughs> well, tell us something about Casablanca. What's it like? Do they all have teeth as pretty as you have, uh, Francis, yeah. in Casablanca? Francis, do they all have teeth? <laughs> well, they, it's very cosmopolitan. The, the life in Casablanca is very cosmopolitan. You don't wear a veil when you walk down the street? Do you? No, but uh, the Arab people, some of them... You wear something, don't you, eh, when you walk down the street? What do you wear, Francis? Huh? I wear clothes. <laughs> well, that kills the whole trip now. <laughs> Do, do, do they have the Casbah there? Yes, they have the Casbah there, but Did I Did you never... ever see Humphrey Bogart over there? <laughs> no, I never went there. <laughs> Charlie, how did you meet this queen of the Casbah? Well, I stopped in Casablanca on my way home from India where I'd been flying the hump during the war. Uh -huh. Oh, you were a pilot in the... Yes, yes. American and... Army and <laughs> Air Force, Air. Uh... And uh, what happened? One of my friends uh, told me I should go down to PX in a hurry and see that beautiful blonde. And I did. And I saw her, and, well, I guess for love at first sight. But wait a minute. You say you fell in love with a blonde. How did you meet Frances? She's a brunette. Oh, she was a blonde then. <laughs> <laughs> Frances, is this true? Did you use chemical warfare on Charlie, my boy? <laughs> well, Groucho, when I was 14, my sister wanted to to be a blonde, but she wanted to see how it looked on me first before taking any chances. And I kept on being blonde after that, and she never did. You say your sister felt like dyeing her hair, so she dyed yours instead? That's right. You're very fortunate your sister never felt like jumping off a building. <laughs> Francis, did Charlie tell us the whole story of how you met him? What did you do the first time you saw him? Did you like him? Oh, yes, I like him very much. Why? What was his approach? Well, I, I liked him, and I, <laughs> I remember I said, uh, Hi, baby, and I punched his cheek. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't things like that happen to me? <laughs> now, what were Charlie's reactions to this innocent little pinch on the cheek? Well, I married him, and I came to the America, and I have two wonderful boys. <laughs> Francis, you say you have two children? Well, when you sing them to sleep, do you sing in English or Arabic? In French, I sing you to sing sleep. You sing them uh, yes. lullaby? Could you uh, give us a French lullaby? Right now? Well, listen, it's my bedtime. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm usually knocked off long before this. Huh? <laughs> Les chiffons font font, les petits des marionnettes, les chiffons font font, trois petits tours et puis s'en vont. And now we go to sleep. <laughs> Just make believe I'm your brother, that's all. <laughs> My brother? 
Yeah. <laughs> now, where are the kids right now? Are they sleeping? Yes, they are. Are they in good shape? No. <laughs> what, what's the trouble with them? They're sick. What's the matter with them? They have the flu. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, I had a kisser yet. Huh? <laughs> well, I'll see you at the clinic in the morning, friend. <laughs> well, it's been very medical talking to you, too. <laughs> Charlie, I'm sure that with Francis helping you, you'll achieve any ambition that you're after. Thank you. I wish you the best of luck to Thank both you. of you. Thank you're a wonderful couple. Thank and you. beautiful besides. Now, let's see how you're going to make out in the battle for the $1,500. You run your $20 and the more than our other couple. I can't tell you how much they won, but George is going to remind our listeners. The girl from the supermarket and the married man are leading with $210. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build your $20. You selected United States war heroes. How much are you going to bet? Fifteen. Fifteen, huh? <laughs> One of the heroes of World War I was a sergeant who captured practically an entire company of Germans single-handed. What is his name? Sergeant York. Alvin York is right. Well, you're off to a good start. You have $35. Remember, you are going for $1,500. Now, how much of your... Back at the Casbah. How much of your uh, $35 are you going to try? $34. Yes. $34? On April 18, 1942, a squadron of medium bombers raided the Japanese mainland. Who led this historic attack? Lieutenant General Doolittle. Doolittle is right. <laughs> You're really climbing. Same thing for a man who did so much, isn't it? <laughs> you folks are really climbing. You have $69 now. Here's your third question. <laughs> you have $69. How much are you going to bet? 68 uh, 68 and a half. 68 and a half. We'll see. You know who's where? <laughs> <laughs> You know who wears the veil in that family. <laughs> One of our generals in World War II was captured by the Japanese on Corregidor. What is his name? Uh, Lieutenant General Wainwright. Wainwright is right. <laughs> well, you have $137.50. <laughs> man must have been going to school the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much are you going to go for? The whole thing. Shoot the wife. <laughs> what was the name of the Baltimore lawyer who was being held aboard a British man of war when he wrote the Star Spangled Banner? Talk it over. I don't know much about it. Francis got keys. That's right, Francis got keys. He's a good kid. <laughs> Ah, uh, you wind up with $275, and that means that you get the chance at the $1,500 DeSoto Plymouth question. Thanks, and good luck to the DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Thanks, and good luck to the DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Now, in just one minute, I'll ask the big question, but first, here's something of interest to everyone. If you haven't had your car put in shape for warm weather driving, don't let another day go by. Take it to a DeSoto Plymouth dealer for that spring checkup. Here, factory trained mechanics will check the complete electrical system of your car. They'll check the chassis, including the steering and brakes. They'll do whatever is necessary to get your car ready for summer driving. They'll tune the engine and see to it that your car gets the proper oil and lubrication and that the radiator is drained and flushed. These DeSoto Plymouth mechanics will do all the things that should be done to give you thousands of miles of enjoyable, trouble-free driving. You'll like the job you get. You'll like the fair price, the prompt service, the courteous treatment, the friendly smile. All these things are part of a DeSoto Plymouth dealer's service. So don't delay another day. Get your car ready for warm weather driving right away. Do like Groucho says. Friends, take your car to a DeSoto Plymouth dealer. And when you do, tell them Groucho sent you. And here's the winning couple, Groucho, the uh, married couple, all set for the $1,500 DeSoto Plymouth question. 
Here's where French Morocco gets a chance at $1,500. Here we go for $1,500. I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you. Think carefully and please no help from the audience. The last European army to invade the United States was badly defeated a few days after it landed. In what city did this historic battle occur? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm sorry. It was New Orleans in 1815 when Andrew Jackson's men defeated the British. Okay. I'm sorry, that's the correct answer. <laughs> so that means the big question next week will be worth $2,000. Well, you lost the big money, but uh, how much did they win? $275. Uh, well, well, that's not hay. Uh, $275. Congratulations and thanks to both of you and to all of our contestants on the show tonight. Sorry for the big one. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for the Groucho Marx Show, when the big question will be worth $2,000. And don't miss Groucho's television show, also presented by the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And when you drive in, tell them Groucho sent you. Good night, folks, and remember... Just be sure to visit your DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Folks, here's a reminder from the National Safety Council. Good drivers drive safe cars. Check your car. Check accidents. You Bet Your Life, transcribed from Hollywood, is produced by John Goodell. Directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith. Music by Jerry Fielding. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. He's gone yet. I don't think he's uh, kept looking for us this long. Bud, let's get out of here. This house is starting to creep me out. Oh, that's just your imagination, you silly seal. Uh, my imagination has a pretty loud voice, then. Let's just get out of here. Fine. Uh, let's just, uh... Where's the door? What? The door. It was right there at the front of the house, wasn't it? Oh, no. I don't like this one bit. It's a house with a disappearing door and... No, I didn't like that either. Oh, oh great. I vote. Is this a haunted house? Don't be silly. Haunted houses don't exist. Oh, oh, oh I'm not too sure. See you next time, folks.